everybody. It's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautifully congressional district. Calling out to all my friends and progressive uh, Democrats of America. Uh, I'm wishing everybody a fantastic and successful and productive convention as we come together to nominate uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Wallace as our next president and next vice president of the United States. Um, we are here as true blue progressive Democrats, but I thought I'd begin on a bipartisan note by invoking our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, who spoke of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This has been the tantalizing, beautiful ideal of American history, but we know that it's been honored mostly in the breach. We didn't start that way. We started as a slave republic of white male property owners over the age of 21. But it has been through successive waves of social struggle, political organizing, and constitutional change that we've opened America up to something a lot more like Lincoln's ideal as we move to an ever more perfect union. So um, the progressives have a critical role to play. But I want to start by saying that our anti mega coalition is a very big tent. And right now, we pretty much are everything. We are the liberals because we're standing and we're strong and we're defending liberty in America. We are the conservatives because we want to conserve the land, the air, the water, the climate system, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Affordable Care Act, everything that the party of nihilists and authoritarians um, want to tear down is everything that we're going to conserve and defend in America. But we are also the progressives because we are fighting for progress to move us forward. The progressives are just the people who get there first because what is considered progressive today and in the forefront avant-garde is considered absolutely commonplace and uh, mainstream and conservative tomorrow, like Social Security, like Medicare, like uh, Medicaid, like public education, like the Voting Rights Act, like the Civil Rights Act. And it is the progressives who are fighting for universal health care for everybody in America as a matter of right. It is the progressives who are fighting for a universal violent criminal background check to close all of the loopholes in the Brady law so we don't uh, live like um, an uncivilized and um, wild west uh, society, but we actually have security for kids in school and for people in churches and shoppers at Walmart and people walking down the street. Um, the progressives are the ones fighting for strong gun safety legislation like an assault weapon ban. So um, we need to keep moving forward on all fronts to build a society with greater equity and greater freedom for everybody, greater social justice, greater solidarity. Um, Health care is a human right and housing is a human right. Human rights and democracy is the centerpiece of our foreign policy. It's the progressives that are doing that. So um, in the party of conservatives, liberals and progressives, it's the progressives who are making sure that we're moving forward all of the time and not slipping back into some other form of autocratic, theocratic, plutocratic, or kleptocratic government, which is what uh, the mega right wing offers us. This election is our opportunity to defeat once and for all the autocrats in Moscow and the plutocrats and the kleptocrats in Mar-a-Lago and the theocrats fighting for white Christian nationalism with Mike Johnson. We're going to beat all of them. The Democrats are going to do that. And the progressives are going to be in the forefront of moving us forward. I'll leave you with the words of the great Frederick Douglass, a uh, Marylander from the 19th century who said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And the struggle may be moral, it may be physical, it may be moral and physical, but there must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And finally, I'll leave you the words of the great Tom Paine, my son Tommy was named after, 
And Tom Paine got over to America in 1774, two years before the revolution. He fell in love with the promise of our country. He said, if this nation lives up to its principles, it will become an asylum to humanity. Not an insane asylum, mind you, but a place of refuge for people seeking freedom from political, religious, and economic oppression from all over the world. And he wrote Common Sense, the pamphlet that ignited the American Revolution. And by common sense, he meant both the sense that we have, even if you didn't get to go to the Princeton Theological Seminary, but also the sense we have in common if we're willing to speak and listen and reason together against all the superstition and dogma and what we would call today the propaganda and the disinformation. But anyway, the revolution started and it was a very tough year in 1776. And he wrote this pamphlet to give people hope, to give people courage. And I'm going to update the language pursuant to instructions from Nancy Pelosi, who said that, um, you know, Tom Paine was a feminist and that he was and he wouldn't mind. And he was fighting for women's suffrage even back in the 18th century, just like he was fighting for abolitionism, too. But anyway, Paine in his pamphlet had this passage. He said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. And let's make that victory ours as we defeat all the authoritarians and the autocrats we move forward to save our species from the cataclysm of climate change we work forward for a green and just and equal and free america thank you progressive democrats of america for everything you do and i look forward to seeing everybody at the convention and out on the campaign trail until the population expressed their discontent with the response to the crash of the markets and of the global economy and the way that it was responded to in the country. And we saw a rebellion against neoliberalism from the far right and the left. And when PDA, the sole national organization to draft Bernie Sanders to run for president, we launched the Run Bernie Run campaign one year before any other, any other significant organization in the country joined us. So we changed American political history, progressive Democrats of America. By the way, for those who haven't heard that much about us, we were the large fish in the relatively tiny pool of left progressive electoral politics before we changed that through our actions in drafting Sanders. And of course, the lion's share of the praise is for the Sanders campaign and Bernie Sanders. Yes, to be honest, we did not expect the response to be as great as it was. But it was, and it transformed American politics. And as the historian Gary Gerstle says, unfortunately, the wrong uh, rebellious candidate won in 2016. The right one was Bernie Sanders. And I think that we, we need the transformations that Sanders puts forward. Absent that level of structural engagement will not move us past, again, as a latent revolutionary society to where we have to go. The other way in which I think we're significantly a revolutionary society is we are, who, who here in the room does not think that the United States is now already and fast becoming more so the most diverse country in the history of humanity? One or two people think they do, it's not the case. Who thinks it isn't? Okay, one of the things that's said as people look upon you know, post-Columbian history is that there has not yet been, because the United States was not even close to being an honest democracy before 1965, okay? Uh, ever a multiracial democracy that really settled into practice forward, because as we know, vote suppression concentrated in communities of color is a reality through to this day, okay? So we are struggling, to paraphrase Leonard Cohn, into becoming a democratic society. Right now, there is an international reactionary ethno uh, uh, ethno-nationalist proto-fascist react, proto reaction spreading from India across Western Europe and in much of the world. And the United States is the society that breaks that and becomes a beacon when we win over the reactionary forces there. And again, I do think to achieve that, we simultaneously have to shift away from the logic of neoliberal economics, neoliberal politics, because the public will follow us when we answer to their needs, and the answer to their needs are not going to be provided by neoliberal incrementalist band-aids, didn't work for Brown and Blair, 
didn't work for Obama in terms of you know, satisfying the public in terms of the direction of society. By the way, we are in a little bubble where people are feeling a little better right now, especially among Democrats. And yes, let me say too, unequivocally, PDA has officially endorsed Kamala Harris for president. That was through the vote of our base. And we will work nonstop to elect her because there's no path forward, none. I do believe that Trump represents an existential threat to our democracy, that the Bannonite forces are real, and that Kamala Harris, I think, has shown that one thing where she is pretty fully in harmony with the progressive left from watching her over the past few weeks is a deep commitment to say passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is going to take a filibuster carve out probably if you win both the Senate and the House. That's essential legislation. I think that's happening under her presidency. And I think it's clear, again, just my very subjective reading is that this is a battle that she is litigating from her heart and that she believes in the preservation of the Democratic Republic. So with that, I am absolutely honored, a little longer, and, I'm, and we have to condense, but not from the next person we're going to hear, who I'll uh, welcome to the stage. And as he walks up, we will then hear from Donna Smith, and then we will hear from Jonah Minkoff and um, John Bonifaz, as a constitutional lawyer. And all of them are talking about themes related to the uh, left progressive politics as the solution to the crisis of democracy. And I do think one thing that we will bring in, too, is negating the mythology around the progressive left that's propagated by people like Bill Maher, Joe Rogan, even Dave Chappelle, that we are a bunch of humorless people who are the Stalinist thought police ready to cancel anybody if someone glances at us in a way that we don't like. It's absolute crap. We have great sense of humor on the left. And one person I know who, has, who shares that is Bhaskar Sankara. And Bhaskar Sankara, I have to say, is one of the most important people in recent American history in terms of the American media. And Bhaskar Sankara founded Jacobin Magazine, which opened up the space for uh, socialist democratic discourse in our society tremendously. S a discourse so needed today and going forward in the society. And he currently has a great title that I wish applied to other positions in the country. He is the president of the nation. Welcome, Bhaskar. And that's, that's the Nation Magazine. All right. Um, I'm not sure how much humor I have this early in the morning, but uh, uh, thanks to uh, PDA and to, to Alan in particular for the invitation. We hear a lot about the crisis of democracy in America, and for a good reason. Voting rights are under threat. A anti-democratic Supreme Court wields tremendous power, people don't feel represented by Congress, systems like the filibuster encourage gridlock in our democracy, and it seems almost impossible to get anything done. It seems almost impossible to bypass the enormous number of veto points in our political system. These veto points, in turn, seem to encourage expansive uses of executive power, even from the, the, the well-intentioned. So if we zoom in, though, from this grand political level, this grand political crisis of democracy to the daily lives of American workers, we see the same crisis play out in a different way, a crisis of community, a crisis of associational democracy. Some people have taken to calling it the friendship recession. That might be a little bit too dramatic for my, uh, my, my, my taste, but 12% of Americans say they don't have any close friends at all. Uh, that number, by comparison, was just 3% in 1990. Um, and we might remember this line from Hannah Arendt, and it goes something like, friendship is the best anecdote for authoritarianism. Um, beyond s more self-reported loneliness, we've seen in the last years uh, since the 1980s, since the neoliberal revolution or counter-revolution. We've seen massive drop-offs and in involvement in unions and political parties and, and clubs of asso and associations of any sort. Um, we live in a society with a diminishing sense of civil virtue, with diminishing civil and social engagement, with the, I think we could say, anti-social blight of smartphones, of a certain type of individualism, 
of a certain type of moral relativism. See, even there, I, I, I couch my critique of moral relativism with a certain. But it would be a mistake to view this crisis of democracy, political and associational, in apolitical terms, because it's primarily a crisis that affects the political left. A basic premise of progressive politics is that our power comes in numbers. Many of the corporate forces arrayed against us might have enormous reserves of cash, but as the old slogan goes, we have the numbers, you know, we have the people. But without strong trade unions and public life, without the dense networks of association that once characterized working class life, where are the people? In the case of young men in particular, they're more prone to resentment, uh, to a loss of purpose, to getting politicized in a very different way alone on the internet where the appeals of the Trumpist right gives them a sense of purpose in a very different, in a very reactionary way. And I think that as progressives, we do need to do a few concrete things to, to address this crisis. For one thing, I think we need to present our uh, present not just individual policy, pr uh, present our ideas as not just individual policy preferences that address the, 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 the structural problems of American democracy. We can't just say, we want to uh, pack the Supreme Court. We want to abolish the filibuster. We need to connect these demands, these democratic reforms, to everyday material issues. For example, we want to win guaranteed health care for every American, and we'll fight both corporate interest and the filibuster if that's what we need to do to accomplish our goal that will improve your lives. Uh, that way, democratic reform isn't an abstract issue or a theoretical issue, but it's talked about as a bread and butter issue. We also need to connect our individual material demands with a protagonist, the American worker. Now, there's a reason why the right has been, even as it continues to peddle tax cuts for the rich and pro-corporate policies, talking more and more about American workers. It gives them a subject to valorize, a way to talk about the left behind, and a way to connect to fundamental and widely shared social values like the respect for hard work and community responsibility. But they do so in their own gloss with a very narrative, a, a narrow vision of who gets to be a worker or who gets to be an American. But we can't cede this ground. Progressive policies can't just be about freeing us as individuals to make our own choices. It can't be, in other words, liberal. It has to be about creating the conditions for greater community and democracy and collective material being. This requires a value system and it requires a subject for our politics. We are part of a collective. We want this collective to be more democratic, more inclusive, and so on. But fundamentally, our vision of American political life must be an affirmative one. It must be about supporting the values of dignified labor, about social guarantees to healthcare, education, affordable housing. It has to be about creating the conditions in which families and civil and political democracy can flourish. Right and wrong and the language of morality are important tools here. It's not right for someone to be unable to find decent work. It's not right for the mighty to control the lives of the weak. And as for Trump, he's not just coming for our freedoms as individuals. He's not just an abstract threat to our democracy. He's a profoundly immoral man rotting away at our values, at our civic virtue. Like I said before, the crisis of democracy that we've been discussing isn't an apolitical crisis. It's a crisis of the left. We need numbers to enact change. And as we've seen in recent years, the social conservative agenda of the right can be won as a minority through the courts. Or, and the economic agenda of the right can be run as a minority by simply letting the state, letting the government step aside and run, let corporations run amok. But the left needs unions. We need mass parties and organizations. We need what's often been derided as quote unquote 
party machines. We need civic trust. We need a working class protagonist that creates and therefore deserves the fruits of their labor. We need all these things to govern. This isn't a vision of working class politics as just a coalition of oppressed people, but this is a vision of working class politics as something that unites us in the same unit, into the same fighting force, while maintaining the classic ethos of, of this building, of the Chicago Teachers Union, of the entire trade union movement, which is an injury to one is an injury to all. A hollowed out civil society, a world with the war of all against all, this is a world where the far right wins and where there are narratives of social redemption through attacking minorities and immigrants and those they can exclude can take over. This is the challenge of democracy in the 21st century. Working class solidarity and the virtue that is rooted in our labor or working class resentment, alienation and the politics of exclusion. This is the mission of not just this year and this election, this is the mission of the rest of our political lives, to fight, to restore these narratives, to save democracy in not just America, but across the world, and to challenge the rise of the far right. Thank you. And coming up in one second, and John Bonifaz is just a brilliant constitutional lawyer. He's worked very much in around the issues of impeachment post in terms of the, um, the Bush-Cheney era with John Nichols partnering, done incredible work across the years. The United States Supreme Court today is a direct threat to our democracy. It is part of the crisis in democracy that we face today. There is unprecedented corruption at the court where, with certain justices taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from billionaire benefactors who have interest, direct interest in cases before the court. Justice Thomas, uh, we know, has reportedly taken hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of gifts from Harlan Crow, among other billionaire uh, benefactors. And Justice Alito has similarly taken hundreds of thousands of dollars of gifts from billionaire benefactors. Yet neither of these justices have recused themselves from the cases in which these benefactors wish to have influence. A, a huge conflict of interests and a direct uh, corruption at, at the court with these justices. Everything that they are deciding on involving these billionaire benefactors results in a cloud of corruption over those decisions. Uh, and then of course you have the fraudulent use of the originalism theory, another form of corruption uh, with this court where the majority decides to apply the originalism theory when it matches their ideological interests and decides not to when it doesn't match their ideological interests. For example, uh, you know, the Trump v. Anderson case was the case of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the insurrectionist disqualification clause, and whether or not it applied to Donald Trump and his candidacy for the presidency. Uh, and of course, the Colorado Supreme Court found that he was disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment as did a judge in Illinois, as did the main secretary of state. But once the Colorado case reached the Supreme Court, uh, five of these justices found, you know, that somehow Section 3 of the 14th Amendment should not be read via the text alone, which would be the originalism argument, but rather they invented out of whole cloth a requirement that Congress must first pass an enforcement statute with respect to applying Section 3 of the 14th Amendment for federal elections. Even Justice Barrett uh, and the other three justices, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson, uh, refused to go along with that claim. And so really, even though people think of it as a 9-0 decision, it was 5-4 on that critical question. Uh, the other four would have left the door open for federal court enforcement of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against Donald Trump. And so you have five justices deciding Trump v. Anderson with the cloud of corruption of Justices Alito and Thomas and the link they have to the efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Justice Alito famously flying insurrectionist flags outside his homes 
Justice Thomas's wife being directly involved, Jenny Thomas, in the efforts to stop the steel movement to overturn the 2020 presidential election. And beyond that cloud of corruption is the corruption in which they, you know, somehow decide they're not applying their originalism theory in this instance because they don't want the outcome to be that Donald Trump is disqualified. Then you turn to the Dobbs decision where they effectively do, do try to apply that theory and wipe out a 50-year precedent establishing the right to reproductive rights. You know, this is an outrage. It's, it's, it's corrupt for the court to act in this way. And it means that we, the people, need to respond uh, through our representatives and our senators in Congress. There are actions that we can take to end this corruption at the Supreme Court. Number one, we need to call on the Senate Judiciary Committee and principally Senator Dick Durbin, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, to do their job to, to enforce a full-scale investigation of the corruption at the at the Supreme Court to enforce the subpoenas that they should be issuing against Harlan Crow, against uh, the billionaire benefactor for Justice Thomas, against Justice Thomas, Ginny Thomas, Justice Alito, Martha Ann Alito, and Justice Roberts. All, all of these individuals need to be called before the Senate Judiciary Committee with respect to this corrupt scandal at the court. Um, and just and Leonard Leo, the architect, of course of packing the court the way it is today has already been issued a subpoena by the Senate Judiciary Committee. And yet the, the, he said he's not going to comply with it. We know that Steve Bannon is in federal prison today because he didn't comply with a congressional subpoena. But Leonard Leo somehow thinks he doesn't need to comply with it. And so far, the Senate Judiciary Committee has done nothing to make sure that subpoena is enforced. They ought to do that as well. So that's all point one and what we can do in calling for congressional action. Second point is to support the articles of impeachment that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has introduced against Justice Thomas and against Justice Alito for the abuses of power they've committed with respect to failing to disclose these hundreds of thousands of dollars of gifts they've received from billionaire benefactors and then failing to recuse themselves from cases involving those billionaires and then in Justice Alito's case, flying those insurrectionist flags and creating disrepute up, upon the court. Uh, the third area that, that we can take action on is around calling for expanding the court and calling for term limits. There are bills pending in Congress to do this, and we need to urge representatives and senators to take those actions. And then finally, the Supreme Court must have an enforceable code of ethics. Congress must pass that and ensure that this kind of scandal does not continue before the court. Every other federal judge in the U.S. judiciary must abide by a code of ethics that's enforceable. And yet Supreme Court justices think they're above the law and that has to end. So we the people have actions that we can take here in demanding the Congress step up and stop this threat from the Supreme Court to our democracy. Do you think that applies to, I think it does, his theory of the relationship of the left in England in the 1950s and 60s to the Labor Party that we now face as a movement to, this is a good Bhaskar Sankara question, by the way, and it's, it's he's brilliant on these type of things. What's your thoughts on that? So I'm trying to become more socially adjusted and less esoteric, so I'll decline to answer that. But I do think that, that I mean, the, the interesting position is, uh, since, since I'm the uh, panelist here and since we're, we're waiting to resolve our technical difficulties, I feel like I'm doing uh, a criticism session on all my poor panelists who have no chance to, to, um, to respond. But obviously all those things are really important, but again, the question comes down to who's the agent? Who's going to be the force that is um, bringing about these, um, these changes? Um, who's going to be pushing Supreme Court reform and also, where does it land in the orders of priority for working class Americans who are struggling with their rent, who are living paycheck to paycheck, who are worried about their jobs, worried about inflation, worried about um, a million normal non-economic things that, 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 that haunt us? 
And again, it's not that this agenda isn't important and also potentially necessary to actually getting legislation passed, but it's how do we build this into a coalition? And, and I think this, this gets to what I mentioned before, which is even if it means packing the Supreme Court, we're gonna make sure that every American has access to, um, you know, X, Y, Z popular demand. Um, if the courts say we can't regulate corporations in this way, then we'll have to change um, the courts in a, in a, you know, fr framing in that sort of sort of way. I, I think is 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 important. And, and again, I think that as progressives, sometimes we come to view our movement as the kind of um, a bunch of different disaggregated demands that are all good and important. And it's a movement only because we're all doing it at the same time. And, and I think one of the real values that I found personally in the Sanders campaign was that uh, almost the message repetition. Uh, you knew exactly what Bernie Sanders was going to say before he got to the stage. And you could even repeat along. It was like going and seeing some, some old time band and they were just going to play the hits. And it was great. And also because it meant that we were associated with some core demands. Like, when's the last time you heard a Democrat running for anything lead with Medicare for all? And then it becomes a cycle, because once Medicare for all is not on the top of the agenda, it becomes less of a thing you could, you could run on. But isn't our need for Medicare for all just as acute, probably more acute since the pandemic than it was in 2016? So again, it's kind of connecting these individual demands with some unifying broad-based demands that actually build the movement, build the coalition that can then fix everything in American democracy. I want to ask, I want to, I want to see if the audience thinks this is funny. I want to ask a follow-up question on what you think about um, the fact that Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris, and, and the other Miliband all had such great theoretical um, and I'm like, my wife and I are thinking about maybe having kids soon. I was like, you know, I would, Ed Miliband is probably not the worst of all worlds. If I have a nice, Ed Miliband was, uh, is the, um, was a leader briefly of the Labor Party, and he was the son of um, this Marxist intellectual, Ralph Miliband, uh, a figure that Al and I draw a lot of inspiration from. Uh, someone who was intellectually a Marxist, but deeply committed to democracy, was, was a true democratic socialist. And his son was kind of a wishy-washy um, social democrat, would be a, a liberal in American contexts. But all things considered, it could get a lot worse, right? So um, well, I don't and, know. And, and, if and it, for people who don't yeah. know, Buttigieg is, this is a wonky mic, actually. So I'm going to walk over here and get a better mic. This one work. Whoa. Hello. Uh, yeah. It's maybe needs a little be lowered, and now turned back on. Thank you. So the yeah, Pete. Does anybody know Pete Buttigieg's dad was a great Gramscian scholar? If, if anybody knows who Gramsci was, that, that's homework for tonight. And then Kamala Harris's dad was a brilliant de developmental uh, Jamaican American economist who's still alive. It was at Stanford University, and um, so yeah, it's, it's a trend in uh, high electoral politics and English language democracies to have the kids of. Uh, Great radical theorists ascend to the top of their party, and Ed Miliband was the labor that was the labor head when they lost to Cameron the last time he won, and then Jeremy Corbyn followed, and all of yeah, that. Yeah, and I just want to say, John, I do concur entirely, and I also love the differences in the debate. But of course, the nature of the panel and the organization of the panel was to concur with your point. I absolutely think all these things can be can be fought on, and I think, by the way, going back to Jamie Raskins as we wrap this panel, whatever we think of the founding fathers and the people who debated the Federalist Papers, and Thomas Paine, who was a beacon among the crowd, and of course not in the clique that eventually uh, brought the country forward. They took everything on, right, John? They didn't shy away from any component of this. And in that sense, I think there's a model there. And I also think the American public has a huge, huge appetite for this level of engagement, especially once they feel empowered and engaged. And I think there's more than enough appetite on the left and the progressive left. And I think one thing that I haven't said enough across this panel, or any of us, and I think we all would agree with, if you're not familiar with it, the left political agenda, and uh, again, hello Fox News, has majority support. Bernie Sanders just ran polls in an article he ran in The Guardian. 
for our 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights, Data for Progress, RAM polls, issue after issue that we foreground and that Bernie foregrounds, majority support among the public. Huge majority support, by the way, and just in case you're wondering who the Republican Party are in the Democratic Party, sorry this idea of a progressive working class somehow being latent inside the, inside the Republican Party. No, Democrats overwhelmingly support a basically social democratic FDR plus agenda, okay? And the, um, yes, and the, um, um, and independents majority, and Republicans a significant portion. And it adds up on all issues between 55 and 70% national support. And of course, I'll leave it with this. There's a very famous political study that was done in the United States, which showed that progressive change can happen in the country through the legislative process, but only when it is agreed to as well by wealthy Americans. And that was done about 20 years ago. And so, yes, money in politics, taking our democracy away from our elites and into the hands of the people in all the ways that, that you've outlined, um, essential as well, fully essential. John Bonifat. Hi. Hi. <laughs> good morning, everybody. It's so good to hear some enthusiasm. I, it's Sunday, but I just drove through Wisconsin to get here, and there were a lot of Trump signs, and I am thrilled to be surrounded by you people. Oh, you are my people. <laughs> my name is Dr. Kristen Lyerly. I'm a sixth-generation Wisconsinite. My family are dairy farmers and paper mill workers. I'm a first-generation college student, actually. I'm also the mom of four sons, all reproductive age, something I think about, because I'm an OBGYN doctor. And I just happen to be the OBGYN doctor whose name is on the judgment that brought abortion care back to Wisconsin. Hey, after the Dobbs decision, Wisconsin lost all access to abortion care, with the exception of the life of the mother. And that's poorly defined. So that created a huge problem for those of us who committed to taking care of our patients, because you can't take abortion out of health care. There are components of abortion in miscarriage management, in infertility treatment, IVF, in managing complicated pregnancies. So doctors didn't know how to take care of our patients, and our patients didn't know what kind of care they could receive, or if they were going to get in trouble for seeking care. It created a ridiculous chilling effect. It meant that people were not getting fundamental health care, and it's still a problem in Wisconsin. Abortion is back. We have clinics now in Milwaukee and Madison and Sheboygan, if you're familiar with the geography. It's the southern and southeastern part of the state, but the whole rest of the state, like where my friend Eric Wilson is from, that area, no abortion services, and in fact, the hospitals that typically would be taking care of these families that have devastating pregnancy complications, they're still not providing care because that case has been appealed and is making its way up to the Supreme Court. And this is just Wisconsin. I mean, look at what's happening in Idaho. It's been in the news a lot. In Idaho, same restrictions, no abortion care for any reason except the life of the mother. They've lost 25% of their OBGYN doctors. There are no high-risk OBGYN doctors in Idaho right now. And the attorney general has come after the doctors, the physicians, and said they're lying about the statistics. They're lying that they're having to send patients out of town. Really? We're the ones who are taking care of the patients. In Texas, SB8 preceded Dobbs. So Texas is a state that we watch to see what is going to happen in the rest of the country. And here are some things that you may have seen in the news lately about Texas. Infant mortality. Babies are dying at a rate 20% greater than before SB8. 20% more babies, babies, are dying in Texas. It, there have been an estimated greater than 25,000 pregnancies due to rape in the 16 months after SB8 was enacted. 
greater than 25,000 pregnancies due to rape. And m pregnant people are three times more likely to die in states like Texas, in states with abortion bans, three times more likely to die. That's what's happening in this country right now. But abortion care is not accessible in other states as well, and I can tell you that it, from my personal experience, I live in Wisconsin, but I work in Minnesota because of my involvement with the lawsuit. I work in rural Minnesota, and there's no abortion care there either. And Minnesota got better after Dobbs, because if you've been paying attention, Minnesota has a trifecta. So they've been able to codify Roe. They were able to pass a shield law to protect patients and doctors coming to the state to provide and receive care. They just happen to have this amazing progressive governor who's been able to get things done. Have you heard of him, Tim Walls? Fantastic. Oh, I'm so excited for my friend Tim Walls and for all of us. Yes, the coach, and he is. Oh, he's fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about what happens in rural parts of this country because I've been doing a lot of door knocking. Did I mention that I'm running for US Congress for the open seat in Northeastern Wisconsin as the Democratic candidate? In the district that will likely become the national referendum on abortion because it's me against an anti-abortion extremist a person who puts Trump's name before his own name on his campaign signs, no joke. This district, this open seat, these voters, this Catholic region, Catholics use contraception and get abortion services at the same rate as everybody else. So nobody's watching this seat, well they're starting to, but watch it, because as I said, this district will be the national referendum on abortion. Yay. Yeah. It's my pleasure, it truly is. And we're working together. We're working with all of the state candidates, the Senate candidates, the assembly candidates, because we know that due to Wisconsin's gross gerrymandering over the past decade, people's voices, especially in these rural areas, have not been heard. And they're desperate for contact. It's not that rural people are dumb. It's not that they don't get it, they just haven't been heard. The economy's not working for them. They're tired of politics as usual. They're disgusted with what's happening in the world, they're looking for something different, and those are the conversations that we're having at the doors. And that's how we know that we can make a difference there. We can make a difference everywhere. It is truly my privilege to be a candidate in Wisconsin, it is my privilege to be a doctor in a rural area taking care of people. And you know, there are just two other things I wanna mention before I turn the mic over to my friend. Um, it, reproductive health always comes up at the doors, always. They say the economy, they say the border, because they've been programmed to say the border, which you know, it's a problem, but in Wisconsin there's a big lake between us and the border. But that's not the border they're talking about, right? <laughs> Yeah, but it always comes up in kind of a subtle way because reproductive health care affects everybody. One in four women in this country will have an abortion in her lifetime. One in four. That's not a small number. 99% of people who are sexually active will use some form of contraception at some point in their lives. There's an estimate that up to 50% of pregnancies will end in miscarriage. And a miscarriage is a spontaneous abortion. And 2% of babies are born because of IVF, including Mike Pence's own kids. Did you know that? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, also Ron Johnson's grandkids. It's public knowledge, these are no secrets. So reproductive health issues are fundamental to our lives. And the last thing I'll leave you with is a story, and it's a patient story, it, it, who also happens to be a friend of mine. When I was working at the abortion clinic in Sheboygan, my friend and her husband came to see me. 
she was very successful, is very successful. She's a community leader. And as we were talking, she said, I have been able to achieve this success because I had an abortion. And it allowed me to get an education, to start my career, and to flourish. And there they were together, facing an unplanned pregnancy, and making a decision about what they were gonna do next. And as we talked through what their future looked like, we talked through options, I could see the wheels were really turning. She didn't come back for her follow-up visit. In Wisconsin, you have to have two. But I've bumped into her a number of times, her and her husband and their daughter, in the community. And she never fails to remind me how important it is for all of us to be able to make our own most personal healthcare decisions. So with that, I'll turn it over to my new friend, Norbese. Hello, hello, can you all hear me? Yes, maybe a little bit. Am I on? Am I speaking really loudly? How are y'all doing today? Good. All right, I have a couple of remarks. Um, I'm gonna stay to them, I won't. Oh, is this better? Yes, okay. I said I had a couple of remarks. I'm gonna stick to them for I won't spend all day talking about abortion access, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. But good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Nurbase Flint, and I'm the president of All In Action Fund and all, our new All Action Pack. We are an abortion justice political organization committed to the building, to building pow the political power of people of color. I don't need to tell anyone in this room or um, remind anybody in this room that we are at a crossroads where our bodies, our freedoms, and our democracy are on the line. There is an opportunity to continue towards a bright, joyous future um, that we have full autonomy and a future that is trying to be a dystopian nightmare. But there's also an opportunity because we know that Roe was the floor and there's an opportunity to rebuild for abortion access that centers folks of color, centers folks on the margins. Since 1976, the Hyde Amendment has disproportionately impacted communities of color and people working really hard to make ends meet for their families. The Hyde Amendment affects uh, several groups of folks, but really it's uh, anybody who has federal coverage. So we're looking at 15.6 million women. Those are folks who are in our military that work in um, the federal office, who are a part of the Indian Health Service, uh, as well as other groups who are not able to get abortion access because of the Hyde Amendment. I know as a mom, that decision to become a parent is one of the most important life decisions one can make. I am a mom to a toddler who very much keeps me up um, all the time. And so that's something that we wanna think about. And when someone can make decisions about their own reproductive health care, including whether and when to have children, they have more control over their economic security. Fair wages, decent working conditions, and access to reproductive health care, including abortion, help ensure that families can be healthy and live in dignity. Each of us should have access to a full range of reproductive health care, including birth control, abortion, prenatal, and childbirth. Being able to control your own decision is the foundation of freedom and essential to economic opportunity. Similarly, the ability to make our own decisions to have the freedom to define our own life paths is essential in a functioning democracy. When it comes to setting the rules for our lives, you want the freedom to vote in a transparent process we trust. It is the foundation of democracy in our country. We know that elected officials, um, Republicans, who want to take charge and change the rules of democracy instead of making, making it harder to vote, are the same ones who are pushing anti-abortion uh, rules and tactics. We know we will not achieve true abortion justice without continuing to build the political power to pass the boldest policies. We need candidates that can champion solutions to meet the urgency of now that include all of us. 
And that's why we are working to galvanize voters and organize communities in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Nevada, and Michigan to reach 300,000 voters of color. We know that our freedom to have an equal say and frequently cast our votes to protect the freedoms that America favor and our families need. And so we are incredibly excited to be pushing and thinking about how we do this and that abortion access we know is something that people are incredibly excited about and voting on. We did some polling not too long ago looking at men of color and just asking them, hey, what's going on around abortion access? What are you thinking about abortion access? And unsurprisingly, they were right there with us on abortion access, was saying that's one of their top issues. And so all is really working to making sure that we are reaching out to folks, but also inviting them in, because one of the things that we did hear from that polling was that they didn't know how to come into the conversation. And so it is important for us, all of us in this room, to really also think about how do we bring folks into the conversation around abortion access? How do we meet folks at kitchen tables? How we talk about those issues? And also push our elected officials for bold and courageous um, policies. Roe wasn't the floor. I wanna say that again, because we left so many people out with Roe. We had trap laws, our laws that um, really made it hard for clinics to operate. We had criminalization that still for pregnancy outcomes that still exist under Roe. And so we have an opportunity to rebuild abortion access in the way that was helpful, that leaves, that makes sure that we are gathering the folks that were left behind and that we need to be pushing folks right now about what that is. And we know that our communities are on board with this. It is just making sure that we are making, to tell our elected officials that they need to be on board with this. So with that, I will pass it back, or we? I have some questions. Oh, and then we're going to questions and answers. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. And so, so spectacularly eloquent, and, and on, the, on, the, on a very tricky point, which is, again, you know, it's difficult to, to express that Roe wasn't all that it needed to be. And that, that can be a difficult thing right now at this moment, to be clear, but that was very clearly stated. And now in Congress, and then back to you with the second question, in Congress, there's gonna be a moment where the Democratic Party, I'm a progressive Democrat, I have great dissatisfaction with the people I'm unifying now to win this election with, but there was an opportunity to codify Roe v. Wade, even though it could have been better, right? Um, and they failed to do it. And a lot of people think that had a lot to do with the sort of Democratic Party consultancy class and the way to keep winning elections was the Republicans would never do it. And so we don't need to codify. So you could be in Congress, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. There's a commitment by the Democratic Party establishment, a necessary commitment to have a filibuster carve out, if that's all they are going to go for, for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And then it's for Roe v. Wade, two things. How fiercely will you push for that when you're in Congress in January? And how, how much can you think you can bring in what was just articulated in terms of how to strengthen true reproductive rights, full reproductive rights for all American citizens into that legislation? Mm -hmm. Boy, this is a tough question. As we mentioned in the last panel, we also know we have a fierce right wing that is gonna to try to undermine what Congress passes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all your thoughts on all that, because I know you are gonna be front and center when you're in Congress. Yeah. Where to start? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, first of all, the Women's Health Protection Act is something that has been introduced and reintroduced and reintroduced, and that is that codifies Roe. It ensures that contraception remains available. It ensures that IVF remains available, and it is in play. And that is something that I have told my friend, Senator Tammy Baldwin. I would be pleased, I would be honored to be her house companion on that bill. So I think that's part one. Part two, everything that Norbesa said about how Roe is the floor, that is my practice. I mean, in Wisconsin, having practiced since the early 2000s, there have been so many barriers, even legal abortion now in Wisconsin, to get a pill 
to get the abortion pill that people are now ordering online without any medical intervention at all, you need a visit with a doctor. There's a 24-hour waiting period. And then you have to come back and see the same doctor to hand you the pill. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you can order that online now with no, no health care providers involved at all. And these are all arbitrary laws. Our abortion limit in Wisconsin is not based on science. It's based on post-fertilization age. That's not a thing. We don't know when fertilization happens. We have to make sure that our laws are based in science, that they're real. So there's so much room, Alan. There's so much room to make a difference. No, indeed. Thank you. And again, look, Kristen Lyerly for Congress, um, endorsed by Progressive Democrats of America. Um, an almost even tougher question, which is um, for yourself. Um, how can, how do you see yourself and your work and your allies at that moment? Let's say that the momentum continues and we do hold on to the Senate and we win the House and Kamala Harris is president. So this is in the near, very near future. How do you see mobilizing us, because we're, we're certainly here to be mobilized around exactly what you said, and also to reach into Congress and to make sure what does get codified matches uh, the very sensible proposals you made. Now, we need to be talking to folks having conversations and pushing folks on the left flank. Our organization very much sees itself as the left flank of possibilities, and so we're not asking for the floor. But we also know that organizing and going and making sure that we're doing the work in the streets with our community is the, where the rubber meets the road. And so it is us talking and actually demanding to our elected officials right now about what we need. Yes, codification in Roe is an important step, but like we say in our, in our org, the solutions for 2024 are not in 1973. So how do we also make sure that we are pushing, um, that we are making sure that the folks who are at the margins are the folks that we are thinking about when we are rebuilding. The other piece I think is important is that we know that abortion is a top issue for voters, that a lot of people are coming out because they care about abortion access. And so if that's the case, then we need to actually cash in that political yeah. power, right? Yeah. So if we know that folks are turning out because we want to see bold and courageous leadership on abortion access, then on the other side, I think it's imperative for our elected officials to deliver on that because we delivered for them. Um, I, have, uh, I have simpler questions in a second, but I'm also going to bring everybody into the flow of the show. Um, what time is it right now, folks? Is it about 15? It's 1014. We only have a couple more minutes. And one of the problems we have right now, 1048. Okay, so we're already behind schedule. We've got about a minute left. I just want to welcome you onto a PDA town hall for both of you. We'll, of course, have you to, to Congress and, and, um, and thank you. And then for yourself, the minute those victories happen, I'd love to invite you onto a PDA town hall. Please. Yes, exactly. And just give your organizational information out again. And thank you. And I apologize, by the way, as I was about to say, every one of these panels should be two, three hours. That's the nature of what we're pulling off here. We're hitting our marks, we're getting our technology together, so it's gonna flow now, it's gonna be fast, so pay attention, and please, uh, your organizational information. Yeah, so you can find us at allinactionfund.org. Um, we are on IG, Twitter, and whatever its new name is, um, and all the social media, and you can always just email me. We're very easy to, to find, but please, please, we are organizing right now to make sure that we're having bold policies and bold policies that are intersectional so that we're looking at race, class, economics. We cannot really achieve abortion justice without also solving the issues around gender, race, and class. And so that is something that we're centering and we're organizing around right now. I so look forward to that town hall and to really go deeper in the dialogue with you. And similarly with yourself when we have you on the next few weeks as we approach November. And how can people find out more information about your campaign? 
But first, I just want to say everything she said, yes, yes. Uh, Kristen for Wisconsin.com and all of the socials. Please come and follow me. And I'll be in the back if you have any questions or you want to chat when we're done here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're now going to go appropriately to the brilliant visionary leader, a president of now the National Organization of Women, who is joining us remotely. And um, thank you so much. Thank you both. And yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. Do you want to say one final thought? Oh, no, I was just saying thank you. Thank you for having us. And we think of us as partners. So we're really excited to be here. Oh, so, so much so. I actually want to give a big shout out to Rachel Rybacek. And they're standing together, and William, um, William Walter, who brought us these two fantastic guests. Thank you so much. So now um, we test um, the veracity of my words live in person with all of you and on an international stream as to whether we can get Christian Nunez up to join us. She left the Zoom. She did. And what about um, our next guest is also by a remote. And um, that person is, of course, Donica Rome from Virginia. Has she signed into the Zoom? Oh, boy, oh, boy. OK. I don't really want to monologue much here. Um, but we can get audience participation at this hour. And so maybe if we could have a runner with a live mic, and if somebody can please contact Christian. Mike Hirsch, please contact Christian Nunez and get her back on. And I know that she was here. I think she, there might have been a little, a little old school confusion about time zones. Christian Nunez is the head of the National Organization Women for Women, an absolutely legendary organization, of course. And we are going to have a next panel about guaranteeing civil health uh, and economic rights for all, with a focus on the necessity of passing the Equal Rights Amendment, which uh, the National Organization for Women and Progressive Democrats of America continues to push for. It has not been passed. And I don't know if you've looked at that very lovely piece of legislation, but hint, it guarantees civil rights for all people in a way that is not codified fully in our Constitution yet. And it's necessary for the majority po of the population who identify as women to have the passage. And she is so much more eloquent on the subject than myself. And I have been the hugest Christian Nunez fan since I, we, we started, we became the heads of these organizations almost at a parallel time. And right off the bat, I just thought now, um, just again, the legendary organization was exactly right on track to elevate Christian Nunez to the head of the organization. Welcome and your thoughts on, again, guaranteeing civil health and economic rights for all with an inflection point of that Equal Rights Amendment, where does that battle stand, and why it's necessary that we get it passed. Welcome, Christian. Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, yes. Hi. Yes. How are you doing? You're doing well. Can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Oh, there we go. And uh, well, welcome, and take it away. Having me today, I'm excited to be joining everyone. Um, and I'm sorry I was not here in person, but I'll be here tomorrow. And it's great to be with Progressive Democrats of America and for this conference. Um, as you all may know, the National Organization of Women has been around since 1966, and we are a large grassroots membership organization, multi issue, multi strategy approach to defending women's equality and women's rights. And we have been doing this through an intersectional feminist perspective and ways, especially um, focusing on that really truly in the last, I would say, seven years has been a major year we've been really focusing on intersectional feminist rights. But for the Equal Rights Amendment, that has always been a focus that now has positioned itself on since we basically the founding of our organization. As we have seen, we you know that the Equal Rights Amendment, this is going into a little bit over 100 years that we've been fighting for equal rights, the Equal Rights Amendment for women. And it's such an important time more than ever that we are fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. And I think right now, as we're going into the Democratic National Convention, and we are about to you know, fully recognize the nomination of our first historic uh, President Jami, uh, Kamala Harris, a woman, a woman of color in this role, how important and, and crucial it is that we finally recognize and, and enshrine the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution, what that really says. 
Um, I think when I think about this, I think that here we are about to elect, you know, the first woman president of the United States into office, a woman that represents many of our identities, uh, understand the intersections that we all experience. But yet, if she were to step outside the White House, she still has some of the least protections in this world, right? And in this country. And so this is why it's so important more than ever that we fight for this. We have to understand that when we look at the Supreme Court building and we look at the new buildings, we talk about equal rights under the law. But for women, we still to this day don't have equal rights under the law. We still are fighting to be fully protected in our schools, in our homes, in our workplaces, and, you know, in so many ways. And the Equal Rights Amendment is really designed to make sure we have those full protections. Um, but we still have so many people that are trying to prevent that from happening by not setting out guaranteed women their rights, by simply just making sure or helping Congress recognize the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, because it's met all its criteria, it's been ratified, it's met all the criteria, it, everything's been done, all it is is making sure it's recognized so that it can fully be enshrined to the Constitution. And I've always questioned to say, why are people afraid to recognize women? You know, why are we afraid to give women their full rights? We have done so much, we clearly see we're able to leave the country. We clearly see that we're able to take care of handle business and lead leaders and run uh, corporations, handle families, um, do so many things. So what is the reason why we forget and or hesitant to give us our full protections? Um, you know, we have to really question that. We have to question that fear that we see when we have individuals who just will not, who can soon as we can become barriers in women's protections. Um, and we, we clearly see that it comes down the line to sexism and racism and many times that continues to show. And we're seeing this every day in the media. We're seeing this in this presidential election. We're seeing this in, um, in you know, really truly our elections every single day. So I think that what we have to do is that we have to do as, you know, voters, we have to do as advocates and activists, is that we really have to send forward and start holding people accountable. Um, and step up, and we have to make sure that we are doing everything in our part to hold those accountable that will not vote for the Equal Rights Amendment, we will not vote for the enshrinement and the Constitution for the ERA to be put into the Constitution for a and giving them their full rights. Um, that's what really has to happen. We can no longer keep electing lawmakers into office who refuse to vote in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. We can't just vote because we voted for them last the last term. We can't just vote because, you know, someone, our friends voted for them. We have to really start really stop holding people accountable. I think about the word progressive. I, the word progressive says that it's, you know, moving forward, it's making progress. Um, and when I think about being a progressive, I think about that's part of my duty, my role, um, is to move forward. And the Equal Rights Movement has been trying to move women forward for over 100 years, but yet we still continue to see individuals who are trying to keep us stagnant. And because of that, what we're seeing happen and is a lot of things, like the Detroit panel talk about, you know, um, the Dobbs decision and the impact that's had with abortion access and reproductive freedom access. Many of those decisions, a lot of those things have happened, the, uh, the increased abortion bans, the attack on contraception, the attack on IVF, the attack on the different reproductive rights have happened because the, the lack of equal rights in the lack of that enshrinement into the Constitution was used as a reason to roll back our rights. And it continues to use for lots of reasons because of why they don't do women's rights and lots of things. So we have to really truly look at how it's being manipulated um, legally um, in legal context for why we do not give women their rights. And then all the times why it's used to you know, work for us or work against us. And so I mean, a lot of times it's used to work against us. Um, and it's our job to look at those individuals, you know, the judicial system, the congressional members, um, state, 
the federal, everyone who is trying to work against us to continually oppress women, um, who are trying to oppress our legacy, our daughters, um, our non anyone who non-binary, um, everyone who's trying to look for ways to oppress those who are trying to make them claiming. I think we have to look at this one, how it's affecting everyone. I mean, I think about my nieces who have less rights than I have, and decisions they're facing as they're going to school and how they have to choose where they're going to go to college um, because of the laws in the states. Um, and we are now originally from Texas, and I think about the fact that I encourage them not to stay in our home states because of the laws that are happening in our state and how they're, you know, intersecting abortion access with racial profiling and, you know, and bouncing hunting and the impact of economic justice and how all these injustices, systematic injustices, are intersecting in terms of the freedom, but also so intersected with the fact that we do not have equal protection under the law and we do not have equal rights amendments. And many people say you don't need it. And they say you don't need it because you can achieve this. And you don't need it because you can achieve that. But that is so not true. It is not true and it will, it will never be true. Because as long as people, the world, the law, can use manipulation of the, of the law to hold back on protecting us, on providing for us, on creating safety for us, then we need the Equal Rights Amendment. And this is what we have seen consistently over and over again. This is what we're facing. We're facing attacks on, you know, marriage, equal marriage. We're seeing attacks on reproductive rights. We're seeing attacks on education. We're seeing attacks on voting. We're seeing attacks on all of our right, civil rights and, and human rights and civil rights. And all of these things can really, truly help those of the most marginalized communities. One of the most important things to understand is although the Equal Rights Amendment was guaranteed for women, it not only protects women, it protects the most marginalized communities. Because we really think about it, the, the Constitution was not writ written but for anybody but white men. So what this Equal Rights Amendment does is it really make sure to protect women and genders, and all genders, which is some of the most marginalized communities. So we're going to be protecting many people, but also protect women, mostly women of color, because we have been so marginalized for so long that it's going to make room for us. So I think it's so crucially important that we start making sure that we're standing up and we're holding accountable our legislators, from the state level all the way up, to make sure they're standing up for the equal rights amendment. And I just encourage everyone to do that going forth and in this election, because we don't, we see what the other side is trying to do, and we cannot let that happen. So this is time to stand up, and it's time to hold everybody accountable. I'll leave it there. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, but. But unfortunately, uh, I, I can't let you go. Now, it does seem we are missing a guest. Is that correct? And we do apologize. And we'll try to find a way to bring our voice into the next two days. And that is Senator Danica Rome, if people are unfamiliar with her. She is a uh, elected member of the Virginia State Senate. And she's a brilliant public servant and a progressive public servant across the board. And one of the, well, actually one of the um, trans members of our society who has reached the highest level of elected office. And so um, I know that she was confirmed, but um, we have been having technical difficulties, and so we can't really deduce why the, what the problem is there. But Christian Nunez, I do have to ask you this question, because I'd just be remiss. Actually, I do want to say this, too, about, about Kamala Harris's presidency and um, how things have gone the last month. If it's been that long, I don't think it's quite been that long. You know, there's a lot in American politics that's about analysis of performance. And, and I think you can all see I'm not ready for prime time. I might be able to step up half to what she has to do. And I don't think it can be understated how intense that kind of pressure is. 
And I think it's safe to say, um, you know, there are many ways in which um, how she has responded to the geopolitical situation at the moment has been something that has been applauded by progressives, very understandably so, certainly in some very major decisions, and perhaps the largest one to date along her selection of her vice president. But boy, the performance level. And I have, I have, I have personal reasons for tracking Kamala Harris's uh, career closely because my father was uh, her father's professor at the University of California, Berkeley. So I've paid attention to her, and I am just gobsmacked at how well she is doing in the circumstances. I can only imagine the enthusiasm in the now offices right now. How is it over there? What's it like over there? Oh, we, are, we are thrilled. We are so excited. I would say that, you know, when we look back and now it's history, you know, we, part of the, the, the story of now is to challenge the segregation of and the gender gap of women versus men, you know, from the class, you know, classified job ads to the, um, the, the gender gap in politics and things like that. And to, to, so to see um, the brilliance of uh, Kamala and how she is handling everything and how she's rising, but she's always been brilliant in my perspective, you know, so this is not surprising to me at all. And you know, and actually now endorsed Shirley Chisholm when she ran for president. Oh yeah. So we, have, we have endorsed every woman um, that has ran for presidential office um, because we believe in the power of women to handle and to be able to run just as much as we believe qualified women to run and do the work of any position. And that's what we stand for is that if you're qualified and you can handle it, we believe you and we endorse you. So we are so proud of um, Kamala Harris yeah. and where she's standing, and we know that she's qualified. And it's important that she is showing everyone that. And what we need people to do is start supporting her and stop endorsing into disinformation and misinformation and stop buying into patriarchy and toxic masculinity and misogyny and just um, what's just so embedded in us. There's nothing that people stop doing. <laughs> <laughs> Though I do want to say for any live human being in the world, the amount of pressure that the people are put under, it is just, I can't even imagine. And yeah, wow, it's astonishing. Um, and yeah, well, just final thoughts and information about now and how to tie in, how do people, yeah, your, your, your best shorthand for how people can get involved. And what, by the way, since its foundation, PDA has been in partnership with now, pushing for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Our Virginia State coordinators did just beyond the call of duty throw down 24 hour day after 24 hour day as that process pushed through the Virginia State process to approve it as it was one of the states that was ch needed to be checklist to get over the barrier in recent years. So yeah, the best way to tie in with now and the best way to you know get on board and push forward the uh, and, and push forward through an incoming. Uh, you know, the House, the Senate controlled by the Democrats, President Kamala Harris. How do we have President Kamala Harris be the president who signs into law a new amendment to the Constitution, the Equal Rights Amendment? How can people get involved in that struggle? Yes, join us, www.now.org. You can sign up at the national level or for a chapter in your neighborhood or your which is local chapter or state chapter, which is a chapter at large. And we are organizing locally, statewide, and nationally. So please join us, and we're going to help get her elected. Christian Nunez, thank you. you. You are a gift to our country and the world, as is the National Organization of Women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so moving right along. Hey, Progressive Democrats of America. Keith Ellison here. Attorney General for the state of Minnesota and the people's lawyer. At least that's what they call me around here. Let me tell you, it is so important the organizing that you're doing, particularly now at this moment. We live in an interesting time. We live in a time when we have seen a tremendous outgrowth in rights and inclusion and all those things since the 1950s. In 1954, we had Brown versus Board of Education. 1955, Little Rock and the students at, uh, at the Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. We had people 
pour out and protest the murder of Emmett Till. And by the late 1950s and 60s, we start to see civil rights laws that aren't effective yet. But then we see the big uh, civil rights law of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing of 1968, Roe versus Wade 1973, we see an increase in the uh, inclusion of America. For the first time in our history, we're seeing a country that has multi-racial America. We see people's rights flowering forth, women's rights, gay rights. We see the environmental movement taking wing. All these things, and yet, what we saw in 1980 is the beginning of what I would call retrenchment. We see the rise of the business class asserting their authority, spending literally millions and millions on lobbying for their interest against consumers, against the environmental movement, against civil rights, and we began to see a retrenchment. By, night, by 2013, a lot of things happened, but we see the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. We see the recent, in recent decisions, the Dobbs decision uh, destroying Roe v. Wade, taking away a national guarantee for the rights of women to make reproductive choices. And we see the attack on uh, affirmative action and what I believe to be one of the most dangerous decisions in American legal history, the 303 creative case, which essentially green lights discrimination, Jim Crow discrimination, against gay people. So you ask me, what's the state of civil rights and free speech in America? I would put it like this. It's the time for people who believe in liberty and justice for all to get busy, to start organizing, to start working. The right wing does not want to see a multicultural America. It doesn't want to see multiracial democracy. It doesn't want to see people have freedoms to read what they want, to love who they want, to go check out a book in the library of interest to them if it doesn't meet with somebody else's uh, concept, and even curtailing the right to, to publicly demonstrate, which is enshrined in the First Amendment. So what is the state of civil rights in America today? Uh, it's at a state where we have got to protect and expand. We can experience a new birth of freedom for uh, civil rights and our First Amendment rights, but it's going to take dogged determination, lots of organizing, and we're going to have to have a multifaceted uh, surge in the area of uh, civil rights. And it's going to include people in the streets. It's going to have to include our artists and people who do entertainment and make and make inspiring artistic creations. It's going to have uh, our legal uh, friends have got to make uh, fight and defend and expand. It's going to have to be multifaceted. Right now, uh, we've got to organize. We need people to run for office. Never before have as many people belie believed in the rights of everyone to participate in society, and yet we have a very determined, energetic, reactionary movement uh, in the form of uh, 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 Donald Trump, but it's not just Donald Trump. Uh, DJ Vance is the uh, younger version of this same movement. And if you ever remember Charlottesville, you saw a lot of young faces saying Jews will not replace us. So this is not just Donald Trump. Trumpism has tapped into a deep strain in American history, and we have got to meet the moment. And we've got to win the case. We can't just defeat Trump in November. We've got to defeat Trumpism all over the place, and that and that will last far beyond him. Remember, before there was MAGA, there was the Tea Party movement. The hate movements that in our country have never really gone away, uh, and these movements and the leaders in these movements are always going to try to appeal to the worst nature of people, and we have got to remember that together uh, is how we move forward. We need unity, we need organizing, we need activism, and we need all types of struggle, artistic, legal, street organizing, people running for office, all asking for one thing, fair economy, fair and inclusive society. And I can tell you that as an attorney general, that there are a bunch of Republican attorneys general 
who've written to the Fortune 500 companies telling them that they're going to get sued if they have a DEI program. So we now are, we used to think the DEI was the least a company could do. Well, for the conservative right-wingers, it's too much. Now, I believe these people, if you put together 303 Creative, which greenlit discrimination against gay people, the end of affirmative action, plus this aggressive behavior uh, from these AGs, these people want to restore Jim Crow. They really do. We can't go back, but that's where they want to take us. We've got to convince Americans of all colors, all colors, all uh, faiths and all creeds and all backgrounds that we're better off as an inclusive, multicultural society. We've got to go to our white brothers and sisters and say, look, re replacement theory is a lie. It is a lie. Nobody is replacing you. Americans are coming together to stand with each other in solidarity with each other, and nobody is outside the circle of our compassion. And we believe in human solidarity, and that's where we're at. So I just want to say that, um, look, uh, at the post of Attorney General, I will do all I can to continue to fight these ugly structures. But it's important for you to understand that the time to step up is now, and action is more important than talk, quite frankly. And as I close, I'll just wrap up this way. You know, there was another great flowering of rights followed by backlash, and that was in 1865. 1865, when slavery ended, the great jubilee. People for 250 years had only known slavery, had never known freedom, and had been an article of merchandise to be bought and sold like a pig or a cow or a chicken or anything. It was illegal for them to learn how to read or for a white person to teach them. Both could get flogged for literacy. It was incredible. And yet, after we, it did, we did have freedom. To, uh, we had 600,000 plus people die in the Civil War from my state of Minnesota. The first Minnesota fought at Gettysburg, took heavy casualties, and yet they all fought and died to help end the slaveocracy. 180,000 black people fought in the Civil War, uh, including Harriet Tubman who was a spy and a Union soldier helping to lead uh, uh, the fight against the slaveocracy. They won it, and in 1865, we saw not just the Emancipation uh, Proclamation two years before in 1863, but in 1865, we saw the end of the war, Appomattox, we saw the 13th Amendment outlawing forevermore slavery, we saw the 14th Amendment a few years later, the 15th Amendment guaranteeing universal male suffrage, not too long after that by 1870. But let me tell you folks, by 1873, there were already murderous mobs fighting against this flowering of freedom. By 1896, there's Plessy versus Ferguson, and there was the end, by, and there was the end of, of Reconstruction, and you begin to see black people getting lynched in America on nearly a daily basis. My state of Minnesota, uh, 1920. Three black men lynched in Duluth, Minnesota. And if you look at Brian Stevenson's uh, work at the Equal Justice Institute, uh, you know, there were lynchings all over the place in every state, all over the South, and certainly much of the North. And that really didn't stop. That tragedy did not abate until about the 1950s, 60s. And so what I'm saying is, if we allow this this, this hate movement, this right-wing reaction to really take root in the form of Project 2025, it's not going to be just a day or a night or a weekend of, of un injustice. It could be 80 years of injustice. It could have a domino effect on other countries that are democratic now. We see in France, democracy is tenuous, Hungary, tenuous. And we see in a lot of countries where right-wing reactionism, xenophobia, anti-immigrant philosophy, depriving women of their rights is popular in some countries. We've got to say not here, not now, not anywhere, and bring that new birth of freedom that I was talking about. That's what we got to do, friends, and it's going to take all of us, and it's going to take the intellectual, the activist, the street organizer, it's going to take the artist, it's going to take the politician, it's going to take the lawyer, it's going to take the medical person, it's going to take the union member, it's going to take everybody. 
let's rededicate ourselves to multiracial constitutional democracy, liberty, and justice for all we can do it. Let's do it now. And PDA can lead the way. Make some noise, everybody. Chicago, make some noise. The Attorney General of the great state of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. All right, y'all. Y'all wait. We ain't going back. Chicago, are we going back? No. We ain't going back. Chicago, are we going back? No. I'm going to ask you this one more time. Chicago, are we going back? No. All right. This is my crew right here. This is the crew. All right, again, my name is Hartzell Gray. I'm the steering committee for YPDA, Young Progressive Democrats of America. Real quick, though, will you all be here tomorrow? Show of hands. Who's going to be here tomorrow? Ooh, look at that, all right. So will you be doing any other events this week during the DNC? Rachel, show of hands. Okay, so I asked that on, on purpose. So what we need you to do after you leave here today is to tell all your friends, okay? So bring at least one person with you because we got a pretty big day tomorrow. We got a big day today, but we want to make sure we fill this thing up tomorrow. Does that work? Thumbs up. Chicago, does that work? Chicago! I like it here, I like it here. We're going forward, Chicago. Our next topic and is a very uh, light one, very and easy to solve. Um, structural racism. Right, right now, everybody, we're all, we're all good. That Los Angeles law enforcement institutions um, have had a serious it's a thing that problem we can't escape in this with racism. There's not a system that has been created in this country that has not history. been directly the as a result to the others. Is that power. possible? I mean. Here in this country, I mean, not to the like black America or, or kept your eyes open in Kansas the, City. I'm not okay. sure if you all are familiar with the term yeah. redlining. You guys know what redlining is? Your victory in this all right, election. gentrification, all that. So focus on yeah. that. So How is it? we have a Kansas City called the Truce Trump, Divide. Just it's actually the LAPD, nationally known, internationally the known. We were the epicenter the trajectory of redlining. J.C. Nichols, we have the Nichols Plaza. Yes, modeled Angeles, after Spain. That fraught history. My we grandfather, Hartzell so, Sr., was one of the first black men ever allowed on the plaza, and, and that's, that's because he cleaned the house just of Jesse your sense of the importance of your election. And I think every day about what that was like, having to go to work. In some cases, my grandmother as well, they would take care of these kids. And not a single thing that they did deserved a legacy of being forced out to pay for their own displacement. That is what the structural racism is. Frederick Douglass went to the slave as the 4th of July. At the beginning of it, it's a scathing indictment, right? Do you, do you have me here to mock me? But what people forget is at the end of that speech, it's actually a rousing call to arms. It's like, while, while what y'all wrote Angeles down on that Los paper Angeles wasn't for me, like y'all made the Thank mistakes so of putting that issue down, because now I'm going to take it. He believed in the Thank promise you, of America. You, that is not colorblind, but it embraces the color. I don't want you to not see my color or not see my experiences. I want you to see it. I want you to ask questions. I want you to come to the barbecue. All the above. And so we're going to break down a little bit of this, this idea of structural racism and here to it's so good to folks. be with you. Yes, Alan I've been Minsky, around PDA since the founding. Uh, Thank you, and the great Santita uh, Jackson is good, on her way. Good memories and aptly, with my however, dear brother, I now bring Tim Carpenter to you all. and Steve Powell. First of all, and Santita's coming, and thank you for your patience, by the way, Reverend Yearwood and PDA started, and I think that's important for this LA conversation County because there's George still a Gascon. need since for we just heard from Keith Ellison, Democrats. we will speak now uh, when with George Gascon. George Gascon is one of the uh, PDA together. It was a vision of both uh, having both an inside outside game. Been elected in recent times. It was also a vision of understanding of people putting people in positions of power in our who were progressive the criminal, and electing progressive. Uh, 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 and uh, I think uh, most importantly, creating the streets so that those who were inside who maybe wanted to be more progressive understand that we were mobilizing, the organizing, and, there is and no energizing. Country in the history of the um, I think over the now the past, man, like the United I would say has, it's 15, ongoing. almost it's today uh, 18 hour, years and all of us um, in since the those initial conversations. In the I would say that where it's we are now in regards folks. to structural is racism that, of course, people is that we're now understanding that while we that are successful are on the progressive front, socially acceptable there's still structural racism while not only the democratic institutions, but also the progressive. 
progressive state. movement. And there are times on top of that, looking at our own movement just, that we are, are we have a siloed so progressive believing that the American uh, movement. working class and, and that is an working class more. communities of um, color so are somehow I think one of the things there that I've the noticed that I would want to talk this about treatment? For me, no, it's a couple of it things. Is one, we have um, failed the to need invest for in those us communities to in so many ways. ensure that we're holding so much politicians that accountable, no matter who they are and what position. Do. That still works. It's very important. Um, we do George it with Gascon, a strategic way. Welcome. We want to win. We want to win on economic justice. We want, want to win on health care. We want to win on issues regarding public safety. We want to win on issues regarding climate justice. We want to win. But the key thing here in that that we have to understand that there in the city think of Philadelphia, our own movement um, that's they face so let me actually speak fierce to opposition the environmental campaign, justice standpoint. The new school did a study. George, how are you doing? In which they looked at your thoughts, how much was given uh, out all, in one year. First of all, maybe a little bit about year, your experience as a progressive um, um, attorney general, 12 foundations person who has gave out this from the inside, billion and dollars. again, how you see um, your role in combating you know, it's a good amount of resources and money to fight criminal justice system, the other massive sentencing, the things that you can do in your position, and then what can be done going Forward the, and then from the finally, industry, just five, only 1.3 percent went to bipoc led organizations. To so you're seeing this problem. You're seeing that philanthropy is, has Thanks, structural George. racism and is not providing hey, the resources. Good morning, Tyler, that's and good morning, everyone. First of all, thank to you for the line and fence line community. So even here, they come to the I, DNC. Some conversations and we're coming here to do, get out the vote efforts. So we're coming here to do vote protection. But let me tell you that. First of all, I want to start with the not sort of the good news. Because of racism going to black, brown, and indigenous organizations. In our nation, and that's a problem. I think there's so I do think that for us to deal with I what's happening that on the outside, Harris, we will be the, much more uh, successful ticket, as a movement if we can tear down nation, the structural racism within our own have. progressive movement. Uh, and the great thing about that, if we can achieve that, if we can begin to give out those resources, we can begin to level the playing field. We can begin to, to lift reality. up, particularly black women and, wonderful. and brown we women, and women, and women, and indigenous women, and queer, and young people. We can uh, lift you know, them up and resource uh, them, not to only be used uh, as talking points for our white people energy, efforts, but we can uh, under lift tremendous up young people by, and women you know, the, and the, queer communities the more, to leadership uh, positions right and fund them. We will win on this. The fact that we are actually in a fight to begin with. Narrative the fact that we are know, even uh, in this crime moment as, you know, right now crime is going dealing up. with someone uh, who should be disqualified on so many measures large, means that we are not broadening that, we, and moving and I said our we movement because it to the takes next all level. Of us together. That's how we, we went on every issue we fight on, we're running but we can very break strong, down we're going to do well we can win. in November Thank of this so year. And the reason why we are is because we're talking about hope. We are talking about collective security. We are addressing crime but we're also addressing issues of systemic racism. We know that our system for generations has impacted black and brown people in different ways that has impacted other communities. And that actually impacts our collective safety. There are not enough gated communities out there. We have to make sure that all of our communities are, have equal access to opportunities, healthcare, education, public safety. And that is the message that we're carrying, and that's the message that we will continue to carry. And interestingly enough, and I think we often don't say this effectively enough, when you look at crime numbers around this nation, and certainly in the city and the county of LA, and you compare our numbers to those of communities that are represented by people that want to take us back into the 80s, or actually never left the 80s, uh, the periods of mass incarceration, the periods of over-policing. What we see is that our communities are safer. I know that we get hung up on the, the images of a video that gets played over and over again. Uh, I think often we forget also that some of the communities that the more progressive prosecutors like Alvin Bragg, Larry Krasner, and myself, we, we have major urban centers. L.A. County is over 10 million people. Our media market is the size of many other states put together. So when people may see an event occurring in LA and they see another event and say, my God, what's going on? What they don't realize is that we have this huge service network that we're dealing with over 10 million people. But when you look at the per capita data, 
you see that we do extremely well and we do much better than so many other communities that are policed differently and they're prosecuted differently. So yes, we're fighting a fight. We have reduced incarceration in LA and those savings are going to public services and healthcare, education and others. Our state was able to shut down prisons because of so much of the work that LA County has done. We are also stop wasting money doing things like trying to seek the death penalty, a, 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 a sentencing scheme that has proven to be ineffective, racist, and irreversible if you make a mistake. We're addressing many of the wrongs of the past. We're exonerating people that were wrongfully convicted and have been in prison collectively for hundreds of years. We're addressing the fact that juveniles, kids need to be treated like kids. And when we put kids into an adult system, all we do is ensure a life, a lifetime of problems for all of us, including that individual and the communities that they live in. We're addressing police accountability in ways that has never been addressed in this county. And that is one of the reasons why we get so much pushback. Police is necessary in our community and we wanna support good policing. But when police violates the rights of our community, when they are discriminating in segments of our community, when they're violating the law, they need to be held accountable just like any of us. So I say all this to tell you that I feel very optimistic. I believe that 2024 is gonna be a wonderful, wonderful election year for us. That is not to say that we do not have to work hard. We clearly have to work hard. And this is a message to progressive. You know, our message is the message for everybody, having a more equitable community, having better health care, having better education, having more equitable public safety, it helps all of us. This is not only about uplifting one community. Yes, it is uplifting those that have been abused and those that have been discriminated against, but actually by uplifting those communities, we're uplifting our entire community. So again, we have a lot of work to do. We need to do a lot of educating. We need to make sure that our message is conveyed in a way that people understand. The data, the facts are with us, the future is with us. We're on the right side of history. And I'm so excited for the work that we're doing and the work that you all are doing. And thank you for this opportunity. One more question, George. One more minute. And that's George Gascon. Again, aggressive as the largest county in the United States of America and he's the district attorney, and you're up for re-election. Who in the audience right now knows <laughs> that Los Angeles law enforcement institutions have had a serious problem with racism across their recent history and their broad history? The LAPD, there's some of you not raising your hands. I, is that possible? I mean, have you not seen like OJ Made in America or, or kept your eyes open through the Rodney King? His, okay. Your defeat in this election, your victory in this election, so let's focus on that. How important is it for the continued reform, not just of the LAPD, but the LA County Sheriff's Department and the whole trajectory of the law enforcement and public safety in Los Angeles, given that fraught history? And we only have a second, so put it on a scale of couldn't be more important, or in other words, your defeat by the reactionary forces against you just your sense of the importance of your re-election on that plane. Look, this election will have a tremendous impact in LA. The individual that I'm running against wants to take us back to the 80s, uh, 90s, but not only LA. We represent a county that is, if it were a state, would be the 42th largest state in the country. We impact the entire state of California. We impact many parts of our uh, nation. And that's why, quite frankly, Republicans are so focused at the national level on funding my opponent because they know that I represent change and they don't want to see change. How many people bring that spirit into the heart of the environment where he has to work with Los Angeles County and Los Angeles Police Department Los Angeles? Thank you so much, George Escon, and I'll see you back in Southern California. Thank you. Thank you. But we have with us now somebody who has provided visionary leadership for American society for decades. 
and he has been a partner with PDA from, I believe, the founding of PDA. I last saw you up in Burlington, Vermont. How you doing, Reverend Yearwood? And uh, touche, but again, my contribution here is to concur with everything I've heard. I am, by the way, a huge advocate for reparations, and um, as well as just we have to get our society to rectify the crimes of history as much as we possibly can to generate the kind of levels of middle class prosperity that have been shared by white Americans and beyond for all black American communities. Jackson, I am tremendous. 
immensely honored to introduce you. And again, your thoughts on a, a panel entitled, um, you know, Addressing and Overcoming Structural Racism in America in the 21st Century. And then we'll hear from Attorney uh, Jones, and then we'll hear comments from Reverend Yearwood. And maybe at the end of that, I'll read Professor Darity's. I'm sure by that point, I will have found the proper, yeah, there we go. Well, you know, let me say this. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad to be here. How are you, everybody? Come on, give yourselves a great round of applause. I bring you greetings from the Rainbow Push Coalition, of course, and this is, well, we're related, obviously, because, uh, of course, Senator Bernie Sanders came out of the Rainbow a Coalition. Can you a little bit more, Mike? Can you hear me now? All right, I bring you greetings from the Rainbow Push Coalition, and of course, yes, that's because we are family after all. Uh, I remember meeting Senator Bernie Sanders when he was the mayor. When Reverend Jackson ran in 1983, ran for president, there were only two white American elected officials who endorsed Reverend Jackson, and Bernie Sanders was one of those persons. And just as a little bit of background, whenever you stepped out with Reverend Jackson and stepped out on that campaign, but with him just generally speaking, you were waving a flag. And of course, he was called self-loathing. Uh, he was actually slapped in the face, punched in the mouth by a woman who said, you know, how dare you endorse this candidacy? And I felt so badly when I saw him. I said, oh my gosh, this is so terrible. He said, oh, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna keep on going. We're gonna keep on going. Because our, because our cause is just. And this is, yes. Then, many of you might not know, but yes, I've been a political commentator on Fox News. Look, they need a little redemption, too. <laughs> and you know, but it's, it's important to take our message everywhere, right? right? Yes. And one of the things that I, but I also host a radio show, and I'm based on AM 950 radio, that's right. How you doing? The progressive station in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I'm coming up on other stations uh, as we speak. But I had the opportunity to have Senator Sanders on my show more than once. But this particular time, my father, Reverend Jesse Jackson, called in. And he was so excited, and they just had this reunion on the air, which was great. And um, a lot of people have gone on and on and on about Reverend Jackson and his iconic run for the presidency, and it wasn't just him running, it was all of you. He said, when I win, we win. That was always the point, right? And Senator Sanders stopped us. He said, you know, a lot of people make a lot about the fact that Reverend Jackson broke the color barrier in top tier presidential politics, and that's important. He said, but he also made it possible for white progressives like me to be on the stage. And indeed, that is why I'm honored to be here today, because the progressive Democrats of America, really, we do need to occupy that space in our party. We need to claim and proclaim that progressivism is alive. We need to claim and proclaim that we are patriots yes. of the highest order. We cannot let everybody else take our flag from us. These are the most American of issues that we are fighting for. We are fighting for a floor beneath which no human being should fall. That is what Dr. King lived and died on. That is what we campaigned for president on. That's what Reverend Jackson's 60-year ministry has been about. It's about putting out the fire in this burning building in which we find ourselves, in which all we do is go to war. It's about looking at the fact that black people have been here more than 400 years, but by 2085, we are looking at having negative wealth. Black families are looking at having negative wealth by 2085. It costs $3.4 million for each one of you to achieve the American dream. I don't care what color you are. That's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong that it will take 500 years for black people to achieve economic equality in America. That's according to Chuck Collins and the Institute for Policy Studies. They just did this study. It just came out a year ago. How can that be? And be very, very clear. My great-grandmother, Tibby, she couldn't read, she couldn't write. But boy, she could figure. She said, you know, I'm going to tell you something, baby. 
White folks catch a cold, but black folks get pneumonia. But eventually, if you don't treat the cold, it will become pneumonia. This is where we are today. As we were riding over here, I said, who can afford an apartment in Chicago? Who can afford to work at McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's? Those are all honorable jobs. Yeah. What if they closed down? How would you feel about that? You wouldn't be too happy. But they cannot afford to live in this city or in a town. So when we're talking about structural racism, and of course you collared me at the Rainbow Push yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited, but you know, I had to work this morning. But I said, I will, I will work it out and make the space. Yeah. We have got to... Oh, please don't applaud me for that, because you're family, and that's what family, that's what we do for each other, yes? I said, we've got to, you're right. And, of course, I did say what Chris Rock took that from Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby said, I refuse to answer your questions about racism, because I didn't start this fire and I can't put it out. When you want to bring on Bob Newhart and Bob Hope, Bob Hope and talk to them about racism, he said, then I'll answer your questions. So, but I do absolutely appreciate the fact that the Progressive Democrats of America have put this on the table, that you have said that this is an important issue. Because if we don't deal with structural racism, this disease is going, this cancer is going to kill us too. Because Reverend Jackson said, we came over here on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. <laughs> so when you look at any people who could be here for hundreds of years and build the country and be looking at ne negative wealth, that does not bode well for anybody. 500 years to achieve economic equality? Do, do you have 500 years? <laughs> so that was why we're here today, Alan. But I also brought someone with me because, and I appreciate you for being so open because I said I don't want to just bogart my way in the way Reverend Jackson does. <laughs> but he doesn't bogart. What he does is force us onto the stage because no one wants us there. I said, you know, you can't talk about the, you cannot talk about structural racism in America unless you talk about the vote, right? You can't. Because if the black person's access to the vote is threatened and it is, if our votes are suppressed, if we can't trust these machines that count our votes, because remember, it's not, it's not the votes that count, it's who counts the votes, right? Then we got a problem. And so there's a reason that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which came out of the end of the Civil War, that gave black people our freedom, our citizenship, but it gave, us the, gave at least black men the vote. Those things are tied together. Your vote makes you a citizen. So that is why I brought, many of us know of the iconic work and the icon, Attorney Barbara Arnwine. Well, you know, you always have a team. You never do this by yourself. And two of the foremost advocates for the vote in America today come from the Transformative Justice Coalition, which is an organization that she founded after she left the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And so I'd like for you to welcome the chair of the board of the Transformative Justice Coalition, brilliant, brilliant attorney, Attorney Daryl Jones. And I would like for him, well, please stand, please, please. I would like for him to share a few words with us about the tie between structural racism and the vote. As we're excited about this moment, everything that we do is grounded in the vote. The Supreme Court, your state Supreme Court, your local courts, your DA, your prosecutor, your mayor, all the folks, and when you get arrested, they, that's the vote. And I would be remiss, the person, our chauffeur today, is someone who actually is a brilliant attorney who's won three cases before the Michigan State Supreme Court. And she is the first African American to get a master's in law from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And she's also the police. She's, she's a police commissioner in Detroit. Please welcome Attorney Linda Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> But let me ask you, Attorney Jones, and I'm going to step back so that you can speak to us about structural racism, Alan, and 
where the vote intersects with all of that. I mean, is there, is there a relationship? Is there a connection? Thank you, Santita. And uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. You know, I would say that um, there are certain people that when they call, you answer the phone, and then you get a question, which is really a statement, saying, uh, I need you to go too. And Santita is one of those people who called and said, um, there, there, there's a forum I wanted you to go to, which really means there's a forum that you're going to. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really excited and glad to be here and certainly dealing with the topic of structural racism and the vote. You know, to me, and let me say this, when I came in, I heard Reverend Yearwood uh, on the screen. I, I was like, I, I got it all now, because Reverend Yearwood uh, and the Transformative Justice Coalition, we go back quite a ways, and we intersect uh, in a, quite a number of areas. But when we're talking about the vote and structural racism, you know, I began post-Civil War. Why do I begin post-Civil War? Post-Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, was when black men got the right to vote. Once black men got the right to vote, what then happened is that a lot of the public education you see going on that was supported by the black representatives that were being elected out of the South, they're the ones that were pushing for public education before it was all landed gentry, white gentry, that was having the vote. There were more changes that started coming about as a result of the black men that were elected and trying to provide for their families. It was as a result of that that you had the Ku Klux Klan that came in that said, we need to stop them from voting. We're gonna do it with violence. We're gonna stop them from believing that they can have power and that they can achieve. From that, we then develop and we go forward. And so let me bring you all the way up to this thing, this electoral college. The Electoral College wasn't based on anything other than being certain that those that were in the South that were landed gentry in power continued to have their influence to try to stop the black power that was coming out of it, the electoral power that could come out of there. So let's bring it forward a little more because I, I know you asked me to keep this down to, 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 uh, to a lawyer's five minutes. <laughs> We bring it forward a little more because I want you to see the connection. I want you to see the connection because one of the things that Santita just said is so on point because when we start dealing with the right to vote, we start dealing with judges that are elected and the judges that are elected locally make decisions with regards to elections that are local. The people that are, are, are elected uh, on state, well, state offices and federal office appoint the judges. Well, election cases, and dealing with uh, all kinds of redistricting ends up before these judges. And so when I bring it forward, I want you to remember a case, the Alexander case, Alexander versus South Carolina. It was just recently decided uh, this year. What it did was this. In Alexander, the state legislature in South Carolina decided that they wanted to uh, carve a way to limit the influence of the African-American community that was in Charleston. So what they did was they took 60,000 black Charlestons, Charlestonians and divided them all up, broke them up into districts. So they did not have the voting power to be able to elect representatives and have an impact on Congress. This is the essence of racism. This is the essence of what we're talking about when we're talking about the structural racism and how voting impacts it. This is that impact. There's another case that I want you to take notice of, because most people across the nation don't know about it, because it's out of Arkansas. And it's the Arkansas NAACP versus the Arkansas Board of Apportionment. In the state of Arkansas, and I didn't know this, Santita, until your father really pointed it out to me, that Arkansas is probably one of the most racist country, uh, states in the country. And their ability to elect an African-American uh, to any statewide office has not occurred. Their ability to elect uh, blacks to members of Congress are all impacted. 
In the state of Arkansas, their board of apportionment uh, were sued by the NAACP because they decided that the African American vote there, they were, they were uh, receiving too much attention, they were gaining some power. So they broke it up, broke it all up, crack it up, uh, the, the districts, so that the uh, power wouldn't be there. Well, the NAACP in the state of Arkansas sued because of the redistricting issue. As a result of the suit, now what you all, are there attorneys that are in the audience? Okay, as a result of the suit that was filed federally, neither party, hear me, the, the uh, Arkansas Board of Apportionment didn't ask for this. The judge on his own decided that the NAACP did not have standing to sue on behalf of the citizens that were being wronged because of the voting rights violation, section two. It went further to say that only, only the Department of Justice can sue for a violation of voting rights under section two. Well, what does that mean? And I'm gonna take my seat on this one. What does that mean? Here's what that means. It means that organizations like the NAACP, organizations like the ACLU, organizations like uh, 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 Black Voters Matter, organizations like my organization, Transformative Justice Coalition, when there are violations of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that are in that eighth circuit, Arkansas and the, uh, and the other uh, eight or nine states that are there, that individuals and the individual organizations can't sue. The only way to have it corrected is through the Department of Justice. And I want to bring it, bring full circle to your attention what this means. You're probably thinking, oh, the Department of Justice can do it. That's fine. That's a good thing. In the last 40 years, less than 10% of the voting rights cases under Section 2 have been brought by the Department of Justice. I want you to understand that when you're talking about if the Department of Justice is the only place that can bring a violation of a Section 2 suit right now, what that would mean is that whoever is serving as the U.S. Attorney General makes that decision as to whether or not it should be brought. So if you have a very conservative Attorney General, they need not bring it. If you have a more uh, progressive one, they do bring it. Folks, this is the essence of uh, white structural racism that's in place. It's why we need to really push for voters to get out and be certain that we uh, focus on the community of color to get them out to vote, to encourage them to vote. So we're really excited where we have organizations like this that, that are unrelenting uh, in going into those communities and pushing them to vote because the only way we're going to have change and equality in the country is if we have access to the vote, complete and total access to the vote, so that the candidates and the representatives that are elected are representative of the fabric of our country. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you all so much for welcoming us today, but I want us to just, Alan, if you'd come forward, because I want to thank you for having us here today, for welcome us, welcoming us home. When we talk about racism, racism is racialized classism, right? That is the dirty little secret in America. You had people who were, if you were not an oligarch at the beginning of this American project, you did not count. We were all indentured servants. Then they racialized it, and then you had indentured servants and slaves. The fact is, we've all been hoodwinked and bamboozled and run amok. And what, what the power structure wants to do is break up gatherings like these. But well, we're coming together across all lines and we're saying, enough. We want our country back. We have to fight in the Democratic Party to take our party back. Right. That is what we're doing here. And that is why I am here. And I will say this, as my father says, because we're carrying on this tradition, red, yellow, black, brown, and white, we're all precious in God's sight. There is no one who is less than anyone. God made us all. See, I am a woman who believes in God, and you can be agnostic, you can be atheist, you're all, you're all my brothers and sisters. That does not matter to me. 
but I don't believe God made junk, and I don't believe God is capitalizing and making mistakes. Everybody here has a purpose. There's a reason that we're here. There's a reason we were born. Now let us come together and let us do the work and let us save our country because it is ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you so much for your participation. And, and no, no, um, just wait one second because I do have the words of Professor Darity here, and they follow pretty much from what Santita was just saying, and I promised him I'd read it. And as a kid of an economist, uh, very much my dad being in the same lineage as Professor Darity, um, and I think we did, uh, Lennox uh, Yearwood, Reverend Yearwood is not with us. I did want to say I didn't really provide a proper introduction. I almost assume for everybody that Reverend Yearwood's organization is known to everybody, but it's the Hip Hop Congress. Oh, you're there. And, and you know, so hey, just, just so we're running behind schedule. Just know I do want to hear your thoughts on what you heard from Attorney Jones and Santita Jackson. Reverend Yearwood, you have the floor. Again, hiphopcongress.com. Well, I just want to just repeat, I mean, obviously, I mean, both the Transformative Justice Coalition and my dear sister Jackson, I think that what we're all saying here is this. We are at our lunch counter moment for the 21st century, that our parents, our grandparents fought for equality in the 20th century, and we're definitely still fighting for equality, but we are now fighting for existence in the 21st century, and the stakes are very, very high. And in that, because we're dealing with a climate crisis that is raging literally as we speak right now, because we're dealing with homelessness, literally that same climate crisis in Phoenix, Arizona, which has the sidewalks at 168 degrees, where homeless people are literally cooking on the sidewalks. People are hurting in Chicago and in Newark and in Baltimore. We have folks who are still lining up to get food. We have atrocities with wars from the Congo to Gaza to Ukraine. We need a progressive movement. And so this conversation is very simple. The way that we win is by getting rid of racism within our own movement. We will not be successful or achieve the things we can if folks who say on one hand, they are bringing in black and brown and indigenous people, but on the back hand, they are closing the door on black and brown and indigenous people. So this is a moment here that we can gather to hopefully organize and mobilize, but this is also a serious moment where we have to recognize too many times we are putting black folk, brown folk, and indigenous people, young people, and queer people on the fronts of our annual guides and on the front of fundraising documents, but they are on the back burner. They We cannot have folks speaking on the mic, so to speak, and then trying to catch the bus home from the same place they spoke on the mic at. We need to have solidarity. This is not about charity, but solidarity. So what I'm saying to us is that if we're going to be serious, the same way that we're asking people to transition from fossil fuels to clean energy, we must be willing ourselves as a progressive movement to transition away from racism. If we do that, then we will win. And nobody who comes in in the guise of racism, under the guise of trying to make whatever they think is better, that kind of mythology will not exist in America if we, as a movement, come together and get a racism out of our own movement. Thank you so much. God bless you and all power to the people. Thank you so much, Reverend Lennox Stewart. From the Hip Hop Caucus folks, Reverend Lennox Stewart, I do want to say, and I'd be remiss not to mention, first of all, it is an honor to work with Hip Hop Caucus as PDA. They've been there as a part of PDA from the beginning. But I do have to say to everybody, over the last two months, as PDA has partnered with the nation, PDA has partnered with the Arab American Institute, PDA has partnered with Rainbow Push. And I have to say, every week I wait for those meetings. They are the most beautiful group of people that come together to work for progressive change. Lift up the Rainbow Push Coalition everywhere you can, folks. PDA and Rainbow Push are going to work together on a people's agenda that we are going to deliver to the country and the world shortly after the presidential election.
Okay. And that is something I am so honored to be participating in. Now, Reverend, uh, William Darity, and please look up his work. He is a brilliant, incisive economist. He is at Duke University. Here are his words on the subject of the racial wealth gap and reparations. There are three major ways in which Americans can be mistaken about the racial wealth gap. By the way, in case people are confused, um, William Darity is a black American professor of economics at Duke University. First, they frequently continue wealth with, they, they confuse wealth with income, where the former is the net value of your personal property, and the latter is a flow of resources primarily composed of earnings, transfer payments, and interests on assets. The difference, again, between accumulated wealth and income. Second, they generally believe the gap is much, much smaller than its actual value. Americans estimate blacks have $90 in wealth for every $100 held by whites, while the actual figure is 10 per 100. Third, they can be misled by incomplete measurements of the gap. For example, President Biden recently said that the racial wealth gap is the lowest it has been in 20 years. It is true the ratio of wealth to black wealth, white black to wealth, wealth, black wealth, has fallen somewhat over the past two decades. But the dollar amount of the gap has surged upward. The dollar value better captures the gulf in resources, opportunity, and financial security. To illustrate, between 2019 and 2022, the white-black ratio of average wealth fell from 6.9 to 1 to, to 6.5 to 1, from 6.9 to 1 to 6.5 to 1. But the money value of the difference in wealth rose from $841,000 to $1.16 million, a 37.5% increase. Accounting for inflation, it is still constituted a 21% increase. By the way, I want to say, I'm going to inject this, interject this. I commented on the prison industrial complex. I think every American, when they reflect on our society, needs to have this information foregrounded in their mind, okay? The gap per person, again, especially given the black, the black labor, labor built, America, built America, America. Coerced, coerced to build, to build America. America. The gap, the per, gap person per person amounts, amounts to approximately 400,000 per person because households have multiple people. So the gap per person amounts to approximately 400,000. The total gap overall is approximately $16 trillion. Popular measures like the provision of a $25,000 as down payment on a home will make a little, little headway with the gap. The median home prices in many urban areas in the, are in the vicinity of 500000 to 600000 Alan, for talking all the way through. But, I, you know, when you come to these events, you never know how the Lord's going to bless you, right? And I promise you this happened. A few weeks ago, this, gentle, this young man passed his, his face passed through my mind. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's much better. I promise you, you never know where your blessing is going to come in. I was thinking about going back 50 years plus, and I thought about a young man I was in grammar school with. Hadn't seen him since the early 70s. And do you know there's a young man who just walked up to me and said, do you remember Alfred? I said, Alfie Lowy? Now when I knew you, are you telling me you're Alfie? You were not Alfred. What? I love you, Alfie. Alfie Lowy. Oh my. We were, in, we were in kindergarten together, John J. Pershing Public School at 31st and Rhodes, 3113 South Rhodes. Come on, I love you. I just had to say that. It just it touched me so greatly. And you know, and I'll tell you this my mother, after seeing you and Jimmy and all the people we were in school with, she said, you know, it hit me that, you know, you all actually grew up in a desegregated America. You have white friends from 40, 50 years ago. I mean, friends, because we had the same first grade teacher, kindergarten teacher. We have had the, our foundational experiences we shared with each other. And I thank God for you, Alfie. I love you. That's my, that's my brother right there. Oh, wow. Touches me greatly. And you know, that's what happens when we all come together, yes? Well, you know, I have to tell you, 
When Senator Sanders was running for president, I always wanted him to run, right? Because when I hear him talking on television, I said, now that's what I want my senator to sound like. That is what I want my elected official to sound like. I want, I mean like Dennis Kucinich, I want these folks who, who have, they share the same concerns that I do. We have the same points of view, yes? And, um, and sometimes, you know, I have to tell you, we can all get caught up in color, right? Maybe, but the gift never comes wrapped the way you think it's gonna be wrapped, right? The bow always looks a little bit different, yes? But I saw him gathering steam and gathering enthusiasm and touching people everywhere he went. And one of the things that I love about Senator Sanders is that he was picking up people who were on the margins and he was putting them on the main stage. Which brings me to the person who's going to come before us now. I saw this woman who I wanted to be like and who I want my nieces to be like and quite frankly, who I want my nephews to be like because I'm not gonna segregate this on gender because I love people with nerve and fire and more than that, I love people who will fight for the least of these Jesus said, that which you've done unto me, you have done, what, that which you've done unto the least of these, you've also done unto me. I love people who find the folks on the margins and put them on the main stage. I love to hear someone say, you know what? No one should be hungry, not just in America, but any place in the world. I love it when someone says unapologetically, I'm an unapologetic progressive. I'm not playing with you. You can be a centrist, I'm not mad at you. But this is where I am. I want everybody to have food, clothing, and shelter. I want everyone to have access to an education, academic or, or vocational or athletic, so that they can actualize their dreams. And I want our budget to reflect that because our budget is a moral document. I heard this woman say that and it made my ears go like this, wait a minute, who is she? I've not seen her, who's this woman? And she had so much fire and brimstone and information. And then when Senator Sanders did not get the nomination, I saw her on television one day on the verge of tears and you brought me to tears. I said, but if I see you at this convention, and I found you at that convention, didn't I? I said, don't you cry. I said, because these tears are, that's salt water. Now we gotta sweat and get to work. I said, we almost got him and we're gonna keep on pushing. And she's kept on pushing. She's kept on pushing for each one of us in this room and beyond. People like this woman do not grow on trees. She is a rare breed indeed. She is someone who fights for mothers and fathers, for the LGBTQ plus community. She lets you know whatever your background, whoever you are, you matter. And you know that when you send her into the room, into the, down, in the, down those corridors of power and walk into those rooms where the, where the deal is negotiated, you do know that she's going to stand 10 toes down for us, that she will not betray us, no matter what she's offered. And that is why she is my sister. But more than that, I can't be selfish because she's your sister and your daughter too. And she doesn't look like a grandma at all. And I love it. I ain't mad at her. Because I ain't mad if I ain't mad at it. Whatever we look like, we're perfect. Amen. Hello. Okay. But I love her. And I'm so honored, Alan, that you would allow me to bring her before you because she is my sister beloved. And I see her continuing to fight. And when she runs for Congress again, I want you to get stand 10 toes down and send her the money. Yes, sweetheart. Send her the money so she can run because we're not gonna let what happened to her happen again. We are going to put her in Congress if that's where you wanna go. So everybody in the middle, I'm gonna wait for you to finish taking that bite because I want you to put your hands together and if you can get on your feet, move it over. Get on your feet and show some love to our sister beloved. <laughs>
say that to Nina Turner. I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I love my, we are somebody. I love my sister, Santita Jackson, and I call her SJ fondly. We have such a bond. And like spirits meet. And to be in Chicago at this period of time, I want to shout out the Jackson family. Can you do that with me? Reverend Jackson and Dr. Jackson laid a strong foundation for this progressive movement even back in the 80s. He was blazing a trail for each and every one of us to be in this moment. We actually build on generations of people who have gone before us and some of the trailblazers are still walking the face of this earth. Sometimes we forget about that, and some are in the ancestral plane, but we have Dr. Jackson and Reverend Jackson who are still breathing the same air that we breathe, and we ought to shout them out for making the sacrifices. The first presidential candidate to bring Arab Americans into the fold happened under Reverend Jesse Jackson. And he has done so many trailblazing things that he doesn't get cr credit for, so I want to shout them out. I got to thank Alan Minsky, the executive director of PDA, and all of the national staff members of PDA. PDA is keeping the progressive dream alive. I'm telling y'all, I've never seen such a thing that every Sunday they have a town hall. And every Sunday there are over 200 people every single Sunday. I'm like, how are they pulling this off? It is indeed a beautiful thing. PDA, happy anniversary to you for over 20 years. You have been on the front line of progressive causes across our nation, working to make the lives of Americans better. I want to lift up every single volunteer. I want to thank the Teachers Union for allowing us to be in their house today. So let us reflect a little bit, and I'll probably get off notes and come into the crowd. So I'm just going to warn people right now. But this room is a seed of liberation. And I've had the opportunity in January to address the members of the UAW at their political conference in February. I spoke with workers in the workers of Volkswagen. In February, I spoke at the Black Labor Week in Gary, Indiana, just down the street, round the corner, down the way. This was the United Steel Workers, and that room was a seed of liberation. Just last week, I spoke at the Teamsters National Black Caucus Annual Education Conference. That room was a seed of liberation. And in each of these rooms, the people who were assembled there have similar struggles and understand very clearly that each and every one of us, we are seeds of liberation and that our struggles are connected. Now I know it may feel like the movement for health care for all, housing for all, college for all, and other progressive policy issues are at a crossroads right now. I had the opportunity to speak to a reporter briefly from the Washington Post and the question was, what's happening to the Sanders movement? Well, we still moving, baby. Right. We still moving? We still moving? And we still grooving. And we all understand that Senator Bernie Sanders lit a fire under what I call the modern day version of the progressive movement. But fire and flame, we are the flame that stokes and keeps it alive. It can never be based on one person. It is based on the collective of who we are. And we are fighting. So now electoral politics is good and necessary. Electoral politics, good and necessary. 
But we must not rely on electoral politics alone. With the influx of dark money in our elections, it is necessary to organize outside and around. And I really thank Allen for laying it out. My race in 2021 and 2022 was the canary in the coal mine about how divisive dark money can be in races and people's communities and allowing, whether it's APAC or DMFI or the NRA or the health industry, whoever they are, putting dark money in these races to take away the wheel of the people, we as a progressive movement must not abide by that because they take away the ability of individuals in individual communities to choose who's going to be their leaders. We must stand up and fight against it. We will continue to fight against it. So I'm about to digress a little bit Everybody's in a hurry to get to the presidential election. Everybody's in a hurry to get to November. But I'm going to tell you what I told the Black Caucus of the Teamsters. We left Congressman Jamal Bowman on the side of the road. We left Congresswoman Cori Bush on the side of the road to get to November. First things first. I remember seeing an editorial cartoon Alan, that it was a princess. She was tied up, and her prince could not see what was behind him, but she could. So he's trying to untie her, and she's pointing at the dragon that's behind both of them. Underneath, it said, first things first. What is the moral of the story, s and The moral of the story is this. The princess was saying to the prince, while you trying to free me, we both about to die because I need you to slay the dragon first before you save me. I need you to slay the dragon. So while all of this hype about what is happening in the Democratic Party is a good thing. The energy is high. People believe again. All of that good stuff, beautiful, 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 beautiful. Don't let it be said that SNT didn't say it was beautiful. But baby, we should have slayed the dragon first. We need Bowman in the Congress. We need Bush in the Congress. But we left them on the side of the road. Nah, I'm all off my notes. I'm going to get back. I just had to get that off my chest. Is that all right to just get that off my chest? Now, meanwhile, back on my notes, despite being built to uphold white supremacy and maintain the status quo, our government has always been an institution that responds to external pressure. Progressive movement, that is our motivator right there. Now, during the height of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was clarity among activists about the need to realize black liberation and force public policy to protect black lives. The powerful in Washington didn't just wake up one day and decide to end Jim Crow or decide to end black codes or decide to end de jure or de facto segregation and discrimination discrimination against black people. They, they just didn't wake up and do that. It was the people that forced the passage of the civil rights legislation by marching and boycotting and leading civil disobedience by relentlessly fighting for clear policy demands until they were passed by Congress and signed by the president, signed into law by the president. So my message to the progressive movement is that even though I believe we have the right ideas, our ideas are righteous, what is wrong with wanting people to have health care? What is wrong with wanting to have paid family medical leave? What is wrong with not wanting to allow corporations to buy up all the housing? What is wrong with wanting to say that we need to house unhoused people? What is wrong with having a social contract? What is wrong with creating a human rights economy? There is absolutely, unequivocally nothing wrong with what we are are standing for and fighting for, but meanwhile, in the neoliberal corridors or the neo-fascist corridors, they want to make us think that we are out of touch. Well, I'm here to say, sisters and brothers and family and friends, we are in touch with the American people. The ones who are out of touch are the neoliberals and the neo-fascists. They are out of touch. We're in touch. 
Most of the American people are right where we are. They just might not call it progressivism. But when you talk to them about how high food prices are, or rent, or mortgage, or not being able to make it every single day, they are right where we are. So we are not out of touch, we are in touch. And so the beautiful thing about how, if we can find any beauty in all of the foolishness and folly, it is that our government responds to pressure. And baby, we are that pressure. Hello, somebody. So together, we will organize working class to make a demand for big structural changes and create a moral economy centered around people and not around corporations. It is an enormous undertaking, but it is one that we can do together. Now, I'm reminded of when I ran track a few years ago <laughs> in high school. I was the first leg of the 440 relay. So you know what that means. I was fast. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around, because we got the Olympics and all of that, I want you to wrap your mind around the 440 relay, because this is the vision I want you to have in your mind's eye. The first leg of the race, their job is to get the lead for the team. They got to get the lead for the team. Everybody on the 440 relay team has to be in sync with one another so that when the second leg gets the baton, they can't drop it. And their job is to keep the lead and advance the lead. The third leg of the race, keep the lead and advance the lead. The anchor leg of the race is supposed to be the fastest person. And their job is to keep the lead and bring it on home to the finish line. I want you to liken our justice journey to a 440 relay, the only thing it never ends. Our job is to keep the lead and advance the lead and pass it to the next generation of freedom fighters who will keep the lead and advance the lead and pass it to the next generation of freedom fighters who will keep the lead and advance the lead. That is our job. So I don't want you to get weary and well-doing, although it seems like we're going backwards, and in some ways we are going backwards. But that is what our movement is for, is to recognize the backpedaling that is going on and try to keep the lead and advance the lead. Can I just pause for a minute and talk about Project 2025? It's on my heart. It's not in my notes. I don't want you to fear it. We got to fight it. That's right. Now, there's a certain group of people, i.e. black people, who've been living under a Project 2025 the entire time, the inception of this country. We got governors in states like Florida and Texas who are already testing out Project 2025. What are you saying, Sister Turner? I am saying that we should not let the elites of the Democratic Party fearmonger us about Project 2025. My question is, where is their Project 2025? Hello? We mad at the Republicans. The urban poet Tupac said, don't hate the player, hate the game. Where is their Project 2025? We just said it for the progressives and did all the work. We said health care for all. Hey, college for all. Pay family medical leave for all. Raise the federal minimum wage in the United States of America. We did all the work. See, it's one thing to hate on the other side. Project 2025 is horrible. No doubt about it will take us back as a nation, but you don't fight against it by complaining about it. You fight against it by having policies of your own. And progressives, we did the work. I just want you to be aware when you have leaders who only can rail against the other side and they don't have a vision to provide provision for the people, that is problematic for us. We aware of Project 2025. I just want to know where the Democrats Project 2025 is. That's all I'm asking. Now, in 1963, civil rights leaders, faith leaders, labor leaders organized the March on Washington. 
That's what is known as in popular culture, but let me draw us to this. Its full name was the March on Washington for Freedom and Jobs, and they always leave that out. There is a nexus between the labor movement and the civil rights movement. They're married. Now, we remember the speeches of that march, but it took everyone, the speakers, the organizers, the volunteers, to make that moment happen, to make the material change. If there weren't people calling others, making sure that the buses arrived on time, making sure everything was scheduled, they could not have accomplished what they accomplished. So my message for the people who are behind the scenes, thank you for behind the scenes people, because the people on the front line couldn't do it without you. Every single person has a role to play. And as a movement, we can look at the civil rights leaders and pick up that baton. Now, inseparable from the goals projected by the historic 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom, a freedom budget for all Americans was advanced in 1966 by the one and only Asa Philip Randolph, who brought along with him Bayard Rustin and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They were central leaders of the activist wing of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s. It promised the full and final triumph of the civil rights movement. Its aim was to eradicate poverty in 10 years. Progressive movement, I want you to know that we are not the only ones in history who have tried to do what we're trying to do right now, that we are on the precipice of change and we have footprints by footsteps of others who have gone before us and they have done this same thing. Now we owe a debt to the freedom fighters who came before us to keep advancing the baton. They did not free us for us not to continue to fight for liberation. Their vision has yet to come to fruition, but the ball is in our court to push it all the way through. You know, my sister Santita Jackson quoted scripture and I'm feeling a little revival right now. And I know that everybody is not from the Christian faith tradition and that is okay too. Whatever tradition you hail is fine with me and if you hail none, that's fine with me too. But if you believe that there's a higher power, a higher force, if you believe that universally we should be looking out one to another, you are part of my tribe up in here. In the Christian scripture, there is one that says that Jesus left the 99 to go get the one. We need more leaders who are willing to embody that spirit of leaving the 99 to go get the one. The one might be in Flint, Michigan. The one might be in Chicago, Illinois. The one might be in the Gaza. The one might be in Sudan. But we need leaders who are willing to leave the 99 to go get that one. We are missing that in our politics today. So progressives, we can't get seduced by the donuts and the water. We have to continue to be on the front lines because if we are not, then we just might as well be with the neoliberals. There should be a difference when we call ourselves progressives. I call us liberators because progressives have been co-opted. We are liberators. We're liberators. And speaking of liberators, we are in Chicago, the home of the Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton. He had a revolutionary vision of class struggle. He saw working class white folks catching hell. He saw working class black folks catching hell. He saw people from every single background catching hell, and he decided to bring everybody together to unite and con to a connected struggle for liberation. And this is what motivated him to say, all power to the people. So as I close this thing out, I want you to know all power to the people. I don't worship at the feet of a party even though I am a Democrat, I'm in it but not of it. Hello, somebody. I worship God and I serve the people. 
So I want to leave you with two stories. One is grandma, and the other comes from Father Jones of St. Benedict of the African Catholic Church right here in Chi-Town. So my grandmother often said, you can put truth in the river five days after lie, but truth going to catch up. And the truth has caught up with this country that we are lacking. If we got money for war, Urban Tupac, can't feed the poor something wrong. If people don't ask how we gonna pay for sending bombs to other nations to bomb other people's children and their mamas and their daddies and their grandmamas, but as soon as the liberation movement asks for Medicare for all, they're gonna ask us how we gonna pay for it. I say they don't pay for it the same way you pay for bombs. Hello. You can put truth in the river. Five days after lie, but truth is going to catch up. The truth is caught up that in this hegemonic nation, we are lacking in capacity. We are lacking, not in capacity, we're lacking in compassion. And we don't have the type of moral clarity that is necessary because we got too many elected officials more worried about their next election than they are about the next generation. We need progressives who are willing to make a demand. Now, we understand the situation, as my grandmother would say, that we are in, in terms of what is happening now, but progressives for a long time, and let me shout out, uh, uh, let me shout out, not only just PDA, but Roots Action. Progressives were calling for real primaries before this happened. I'm about to tell some truth here, but we understand what the situation is. But even in that understanding, we must make a demand. Votes are transactional. And if anybody asks you to give somebody their vote because of their ethnicity or because of their gender, then they dead wrong. I want to know where you stand on policy. And all that other stuff is a bonus. But if you don't believe in serving the least of these, I got no use for you. People are being told don't ask questions. Just go vote. The hell we will. We will ask questions. You got a right to ask a question or two. It's a transaction. Your vote should mean something. I told the black black caucus of the Teamsters just last week because they endorsed the Harris Waltz team, and I ain't mad at them for doing it. But what I said is this. If they win and y'all come calling, they better not say, who this? You done endorsed. They better know exactly who you are. I'm saying to the House of Labor, I'm saying to the progressive movement that somebody got to stand up and make a demand. And it has to be consequences if our demands are not met. I ain't against it. But I am going to stand strong. I ain't just giving endorsements. And I don't care what progressives have endorsed already. Progressive movement needs to take a stand. It should be based on policy. And all that other stuff is like icing on the cake. Now let me get to Father Jones. So Father Jones of St. Benedict of the African Catholic Church told the story about truth and lies swimming. Now I'm about to put some turnerism on it. So don't hold the father responsible for what I'm about to say. So Father Jones told the story, but I'm going to embellish on it a little bit. He said, truth and lie when skinny dipping. Well, I'll put the skinny dip. Truth and lie when skinny dipping. Lie, truth got into the water first. Thinking that lie was going to be a man of his word, but lie does what lie does, and lie lies. So as truth is swimming his heart out, he look around and see that lie is nowhere to be found because lie does what lie does. Lie lies. Come on, it's call and response, y'all. Keep it up. Keep up with me. I can tell some of y'all ain't been to the black church. Follow me. So lie does what lie does. So truth said, let me go on back to shore. Now, as truth is swimming back, lie decides to put on the garment of truth and walk through the town. And people saw lie with the garment of truth. But didn't nobody want to say anything because they didn't want to upset the apple cart. They knew it was lie, walking around with the garment of truth, but then nobody didn't want to say anything. And then truth gets back to shore, 
And truth has two choices. Either truth puts on the garment of lie, or truth has to march back into the city naked so that people can behold the naked truth. The naked truth today is that the system is failing the vast majority of the American people, and we need to have the courage to say it. That is the naked truth. The naked truth is that 60% of the American people say that they are living paycheck to paycheck while corporations are having gains like they've never had before, but yet the system continues to bend to corporate interest. That is the naked truth. The naked truth is that over 500,000 of our sisters and brothers and family and friends are unhoused in the hegemonic nation known as the United States of America, yet we have elected leaders that turn a blind eye to their suffering, the naked truth is there is no excuse in the United States of America for people not to have their basic necessities met. That's the naked truth. And while anti-blackness See, cause I, I need to connect the dots. See, I believe that the liberation of working class people is rooted in black liberation. And I heard in one of the panels, one of my brother bring up, bring up, and this is something the progressive movement, y'all got to face. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Minister Malcolm X critiqued white liberals. They critiqued them. We gotta wrestle with that. Now, in this part of my remarks, you're either going to say amen or ouch. It don't bother me which one you say. It could be amen or ouch. But I am here to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. We have to deal with the isms in society, and as human beings, we are imperfect. But I guarantee you this, if you look throughout history, most of the gains that have been made, that have been social, political, and economic in nature that transcends the trajectory of this country has come by black liberation. We must connect the black liberation struggle to the struggle of all working class people in the United States and abroad. And we gotta check ourselves. What happened to Bowman, anti-black? What happened to Congresswoman Bush, anti-black? When you take away a community's ability to pick the people or the person that they want to be able to serve them, and you are laser focused on progressives, and then when you break that thing all the way down, progressives of color, and then when you break it down, 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 you see the targets are mainly black progressives. There is a connection between the black liberation struggle and the struggle of every single working class, man, woman, family, or friend in the United States. States of America. We should not allow any dark money group and I don't understand. People need to be more outraged and we need to call it what it is. And it doesn't matter to me if there's another black face standing on the other side of receiving that money. They rotten to the core, too. I didn't mean to go these places. Y'all blame it on me. Don't blame it on Alan. I did mean to go these places. I did. I'm a renegade. I'm a liberator. So progressives, I want to salute you in being relentless. When you are fighting for freedom, it is never fun. But I want you to know that we stand on the shoulders of some pretty awesome people, some who are still walking the face of this earth and some who have gone on to the ancestral plane. But what will move a nation towards liberty and justice for all? is how we treat the people who have the least. And even though 
Many of us may be on board with, with what is happening in the DNC right now. That does not mean we give up our leverage. That does not mean that we fold. All that means is that we're going to give the Harris Waltz ticket an opportunity to do right. Hello? We're going to give them an opportunity. They need to say permanent ceasefire and no more bombs. Permanent ceasefire and no more bombs. That's it. That's it. But by the grace of God, it could be any of us in this room, permanent ceasefire and no more bombs. Brother Allen, come on, because see, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Permanent ceasefire and no more bombs. We're behind schedule. It's our fault, not yours. It's not our fault, not hers. Look, look, no, 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 I know, I know, but we have an incredible, incredible speaker up next. Incredible speaker up next. Yes, but also, the, here's the thing. Well, I mean, look, I'm actually going to be a buffer because I will not let anybody follow Nina Turner. I will take that hit. But, but the truth of it is, look, um, what they did in the 2021 special election. And why do they invest in this? Because they want to silence this voice. This is a very, very distinct voice for our life and our time in our society. And all of us have to do everything we can, whether it's in elected office or, or lifting her up and carving a pathway and gaining the momentum to get this voice elevated everywhere. And if she wants to go back. We are somebody. There we go, we are somebody who will be back tomorrow, by the way, I'm hoping to get you in and be able to get to your next event by, so that you can get out of here and get to it, so you'll be the top of that panel tomorrow. But it's gonna be a different framing. This is obviously a lunchtime keynote. But this, this, there's a reason why they try to suppress this voice, because it is, it is so powerful. I was privileged in Jesse Jackson's company to watch his 1984 speech at the Democratic National Convention in our generation, in our time, I know of no orator who connects on these issues. And not only that, just like Reverend Jackson, off the stage and off the oratory, incredible depth, incredible deep historical understanding. Tomorrow we'll hear from Senator Vincent Fort. He is down in Georgia, a progressive's progressive, and he taught black history at Morehouse. Folks, that's like teaching Shakespeare at Oxford, okay? And then he went into the Georgia State Senate for 20 years, and again, he has the depth and incredible understanding. For those of you who don't know, Nina Turner taught history in Cleveland. I mean, this is a person with incredible depth, but also this is also a skill set. We all have to understand what our skills are. Sadly, our opposition does too. That's why they need to silence this voice. And all of us need to commit today to support the progressive movement and also support Nina in everything she does. Thank you, Alex. Join PDA if you're not a member. Join. For sure, absolutely. Join PDA and then go to wearesomebody.org. Love you guys. Oh, Nina Turner. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do. And it's, yes. Um, oh, my. Jackson event tonight. I'll see you there. Um, and uh, up next is going to be William, but I'm not going to really allow William to come up for a minute. I'm just going to take another minute because it's unfair to William to follow Nina Turner. William is going to hand back to me, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Pramila Jayapal. Now, um, we do have, uh, again, uh, we'll be joined then in a remote presentation by the National Nurses United who have been on the forefront of the fight for Medicare for All to make a presentation about Medicare for All and the movement for Medicare for All. We're going to hear from People's Action. We're going to hear from Physicians for a National Health Plan. We're going to hear from Jillian Mason from Healthcare Now and Chuck Pinocchio from One Payer States, folks. So we got something incredible coming up. And I'll uh, offer a few thoughts on uh, our next speaker, uh, Pramila Jayapal, momentarily. And with that, enough of a buffer rhetorically, and in terms of our oratory skills, I've taken the room down a notch, that was the idea. One more time, though, for Senator Nina Turner.
Thank you, Alan. Uh, I do appreciate that as uh, I made the program and I made the mistake of putting myself after Nina. So life lesson, uh, don't do that in the future. Let somebody else take that. I appreciate that, Alan. Uh, so I am here to introduce our next uh, conversation, our next issue, uh, and that is, of course, going to be Medicare for all. Now, healthcare is a human right. Every other country, every other major country on earth guarantees healthcare as a right. Medicare for all would guarantee health care as a right. Comprehensive health care coverage free at point of service, including dental, hearing, vision, uh, all of the above, would be within reason and would be expected if we had a single payer Medicare for all system. Uh, now, the United States spends more per capita with worse outcomes than every comparable country on earth by almost double. Now, we can expect better and should demand better with 30 million Americans uh, that don't have health insurance and insurance uh, even more being underinsured. Medical bills are currently the number one cause of bankruptcy. Insurance by nature is predatory, profiting off of bad health and misfortune, incentivizing poor or ineffective care options have caused this issue. If we cannot pursue our passions or dreams when we're perhaps stuck in a dead end job or requiring this job to have uh, health insurance, it limits professional and personal growths. These opportunities cannot be taken as loss of coverage for self or family looms large. Now, our tax dollars could be going to us, to our neighbors, to our families and friends to keep us safe, and it should be going to our friends, our family, our neighbors to help keep us safe. So with that, I'd like to go back to Mr. Alan Minsky. Thank you so much. And, what, and, and just again, to hone in on what we're about to talk about, the United States of America, and this might be mentioned by Jasmine Rudy, it might be mentioned by other speakers today, but keep this in mind always, 18% of our GDP is spelt, spent on health care. No other country in the world is above 11 percent. Everyone, of, and that's Germany, and that's 10 or 11, and they have a effectively single payer, highly regulated system, effectively single payer in Germany, as they do in all those other development countries I spoke about as people went off to lunch, and they didn't hear me talk about all the prosperous countries in the world other than the United States, okay? So here's the thing. The government in the United States and state and local governments, governments, do cover the bill of approximately half, slightly more than half, of our total national health care bill, okay? And we pay for that out of our taxes. In other words, all the money that people in the middle of their life are on top of, are paying into private health insurance, that stays in your pocket in all of those countries. So through the middle of your life, you pay for no health insurance premiums. It's equal to that. That would just disappear in savings. Talk about a boost to family finances. Now, of course, transition to it, and here's where we get to introducing the next guest. Because here's the thing, too. Um, first of all, nobody has uh, the power of Nina Turner's oratory. But the power that the next person has is also unrivaled in our society. I actually believe that Pramila Jayapal, in her first set of terms in Congress, has had a level of achievement that matches anyone, and this is now just in form, not content. Of course, her content is massively better than the people who were previously in the House of Representatives because she has a brilliant progressive uh, agenda that she supports. But in terms of achievement and form and creating power and organizing people to achieve power inside the US House of Representatives, how easy do you think that is a place to achieve that level of organization? This is one of the great all-time organizers in American history, and she is plying her trade to the benefit of everyone in society. The Congressional Progressive Caucus, which PDA had a really big role in lifting up as best we could in the early years of PDA, was not a powerful organization until Pramila Jayapal came to the helm of it. And what she's been able to achieve in lifting up the progressive agenda along with probably Bernie Sanders. No other person in our society rivals the achievement. And the Congressional Press, of course, is now a powerhouse within the Congress. It is the anchor our movement has within the federal government, and it is led by Pramila Jayapal. I have one other thing to say, because I know you're coming back tomorrow, and I want to say this, too. I would be remiss if I didn't. That's the beautiful part. Let's return to the beautiful part. The very sad part is, and I know this is a difficult subject, but Pramila Jayapal's sister ran for Congress this year, and for people who don't know, she was victimized by big money in politics as much as Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman. And she is a fantastic person, 
And again, just as I said about Nina Turner, keep in mind, I don't know what your sister's plans are, but every effort we have, and I, you know the crazy thing is the person who wins, the person who, who be defeated Bowman and, and in my home district in Missouri, Wesley Bell, they're gonna enter Congress and people are gonna have to work with them, you have to do that. Um, it's going to be a long time before the scars are going to heal about these things because to take that level of dark money because Shashila Jayapal was defeated by a massive influx of money, APEC affiliated money, if you don't know the story, because it wasn't a sitting congressperson, and to have had two Jayapal sisters, and I met Shashila Jayapal virtually, spectacularly brilliant just as well, we would really be on a roll. So. I just want people to be cognizant of that because that's part of the landscape and there's certainly in the empowerment that she represents and the power that she has in our society, I can tell you there is nobody who understands the nefarious force of dark money in American politics better than Pramila Jayapal. I thought your comments on that election night were incredibly powerful. I thank you so much for them. And now back to the beautiful part. One of the most effective politicians in my entire lifetime in the United States, Pramila Jayapal, to talk about universal single payer health care. Oh. Oh, no. What you what you do is beautiful. Honor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It is so good. It is so good to be with you. And what an incredibly kind and generous introduction from Alan. Let's give it up for Alan, for PDA. We are so grateful for you. Um, and yes, let me tell you, my sister is incredible. She had seven and a half million dollars thrown into her congressional race for her opponent and against her in 18 days. 18 days, seven and a half million dollars blanketed the airwaves in Portland and she lost. Um, but I will tell you this. To me, all this money that's being spent tells me that people are terrified of the progress we are making as progressives. And if you have to spend that much money to defeat a Jayapal because you don't want, we called ourselves double good trouble. Um, if you have to spend that much money to defeat a Jayapal, then you know we are doing the right thing for the people. Is that right? So I am really thrilled to be here today, and um, I really want to thank uh, all of the Medicare for All advocates in the room who have been fighting for this for such a long time, and I'll just call out a couple of groups, including PDA, People's Action, National Nurses United, Physicians for a National Health Program, one payer states and everyone else that I left out, but you have been on the ground doing this work, building this movement, and I wanna thank you because we wouldn't be where we are without you. And yes, we're not there yet, we're gonna talk about that. But we have made tremendous progress and we will continue to make tremendous progress. Now, you all know I'm the lead sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the House of Representatives. <laughs> And I love talking about Medicare for All because in my view, it is one of the most urgent things that we have to tackle as a country is our broken for-profit healthcare system. The Medicare for All Act, they kept saying to us for years, of course, there was the incredible John Conyers single payer resolution, and people would say to me, well, you don't have a bill. You can't actually show us how the transition is gonna happen. We don't have the details. This is all just pie in the sky. So you know what, working with all of you, working with Bernie Sanders, we introduced the Medicare for All Act, and it is a real bill that shows us the way that we can make this transition. It shows us exactly what it looks like when you have an expanded Medicare system that actually covers all the things that you need with no copays, no private insurance premiums, no deductibles. You actually get health care when you need it, what you need, and not tied to an employer so that if you lose your job, you suddenly lose your health care. No more of that. Medicare for all takes it all. Now, I want to be very clear. We have Republicans who want to strip health care away from every American, and that is what they have been trying to do for the eight years that I've been in Congress, certainly before that, but certainly for the eight years I've been in Congress, we keep having bills to strip away health care from ordinary Americans. And as Democrats, 
We have expanded access to health care for sure through the Affordable Care Act, through additional subsidies during COVID for the most vulnerable, through finally passing legislation that for the first time makes Big Pharma negotiate the price of prescription drugs. Finally capping the cost of insulin for seniors and then through the Biden-Harris administration's executive order These are all things that you, we, Democrats have accomplished. And yet, and yet, we are still working within a very broken system. A broken system that is prioritizing the profits of private insurance companies, of big pharma, at the expense of your sickness, your illness. And the reality is, our broken healthcare system, and Alan mentioned this, is the most expensive in the world, costs the most in the world per capita, and has some of the worst outcomes, unless you happen to be amongst the very wealthy and you can afford the most expensive doctors. But for the vast majority of people, the outcomes are terrible for a country that spends this much on, on uh, health care. Meanwhile, these private insurance companies that we have been giving subsidies to don't use those subsidies to reduce the cost of premiums for everyone. They actually continue to raise those premiums at the same time that they take the subsidies and use it to become even bigger and more monopolistic. This is all at a time when 25.3 million Americans of all ages remain uninsured in 2023, where 43% of Americans are now underinsured. This is the new uninsured category. People have health care, they're paying for it or someone's paying for it, but it's still not sufficient to actually take care of their health care needs. That is what we call the underinsured, and that number has dramatically increased. And meanwhile, 41% of Americans, whole, uh, adults in America, not just Americans, 41% of adults in America hold medical debt that totals 220 billion, billion with a B, right? That is the medical debt that we have in this country. Those are just stunning statistics. And we saw it all play out during COVID when 27 million people not only lost their jobs, but lost their health care because of this crazy employer-based system where you only get health care if you are tied to an employer or if you get it through Medicare or Medicaid or if you buy it on the affordable care marketplace. So when they lost their jobs, they lost their health care in the middle of a global health care crisis. That is just outrageous. And of course, it was black, brown, indigenous, poor people who suffered the most. And I know that so many of you were on the front lines in that crisis. And I really wanna thank you and just take a minute to say thank you so much because I don't wanna forget how much you all sacrificed, how much you all did to make sure that we were taking care of people across the country who needed health care. So please give yourselves a round of applause for that, for the frontline workers that were really doing this incredible work. Healthcare should never be tied to your job. It should be a constant, no matter who you work for, no matter whether you work, no matter whether you want to start or work for a small business. It should be a right and not a privilege, not a choice between groceries and prescription drugs, and not about not going to the doctor early enough so you can catch that growing cancer that you may be confronting. Meanwhile, what's happening is all these Americans are underinsured or uninsured or getting sicker. The top six private health insurance companies raked in $41 billion in profits. That's with a B. That ain't right. And while one out of four Americans couldn't afford prescription medications in 2021, 10 of the top pharma companies collectively made $4.5 billion in profits. So these are the profiteers who we have to pay attention to as we develop our strategy, because these are the folks that have the most to lose if we win our vision. And that's what we're up against. They have huge amounts of money, including to put into Super Bowl 
ads any time that we make progress, whether it's pushing to expand Medicare by adding dental, vision, and hearing benefits to Medicare, whether it's pushing to expand Medicare by lowering the eligibility age at least to 60, or getting more co-sponsors on our bill, or stopping the privatization of Medicare through what I call the Medicare disadvantage plans. And at a minimum, disqualifying, we should at least be disqualifying these fraudulent private insurance companies that have been convicted of fraud. Not even just accused, but convicted of fraud. They just don't want the truth to get out. And the truth, according to the Congressional Budget Office, which has been clear for actually many decades, that a single-payer health care system would save us money. In 2021, they said it would save us $450 billion every single year. Every single year. That's the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, all while pre preventing tens of thousands of deaths. Now, our opponents, these private insurance companies, these big pharma companies, they are particularly worried. Why? Because they know that an expanded Medicare for all system that provides comprehensive care where your insurance card comes from the government, but you still continue to get to use your own doctor, that concept is actually supported by 70% of registered voters and has been endorsed, thanks to all of you in this room, and the movement across the country has been endorsed by over 120 local governments. Way to go. Great organizing on the ground. So, <laughs> so we've got our work cut out for us, and that's why this panel is going to be so important. We've been making a lot of progress, but we're not there yet. Thanks to your work and our organizing inside Congress, and it's been an intense organizing effort, we now have more than half of the Democratic caucus in the House as co-sponsors of the bill. That is a huge number. And we focused a lot of attention on powerful committee chairs, or ranking members in this case since we're in the minority. And we now have 13 powerful committee ranking members who will be chairs if we take back the House, when we take back the House. Um, so that is huge, and a couple of years ago, I was really proud to secure the first ever actual hearings on Medicare for All in the House of Representatives, and um, they were so powerful, and, you know, just thinking today of our incredible Adi Barkin, who uh, testified there and just was remarkable, as were so many others. We love you, Adi. Um, that was a huge first step, and those hearings went exceptionally well. In fact, I remember after the first hearing in the, Ways in, uh, in the uh, Rules Committee, somebody came up to me, and it was an all-day hearing, and it was a Republican, came up to me and said, you know, that was really interesting. That is a conversation we should be having in Congress. I was like, yes, it is, and it brought out, I think, some really important points. So we're going to continue to try and do that again when we take back the House, continue to use that as an opportunity to build momentum and keep educating the American people and our electeds. Now, there are three quick things I want to mention before I close um, that I think we should be ready for. First of all, there is incredible momentum across this country to make sure that Kamala Harris becomes the next president of the United States and Tim Walls becomes the next vice president, that Democrats take back the House and the Senate, and that we are actually able to make significant progress on so many important issues. And I think that this is a moment for us as an organizer, I think about it this way, this is what I call organizer gold when people are energized, when they're enthusiastic, when they're ready to make a change, when they want to get involved, this is a moment for us to really think about what is it we want strategically. So a couple things that I'm working on. One, when I introduce the Medicare for All bill next year, I would like to coordinate it with states that are introducing Medicare for All legislation in their states. and also coordinate it with a rush of resolutions in localities across the country calling for Medicare for All, right? So we make it a powerful organizing moment as we introduce that Medicare for All legislation in Congress. We also show that it's a national movement. Second, 
Um, in our Progressive Caucus Day One agenda for 2025, which we put out several months ago, we are pushing for a couple of major things that we think will get us uh, closer to Medicare for All. The first is expanding dental vision and hearing, making sure that Medicare expands to include dental vision and hearing. We can absolutely do that. We got so close in Build Back Better. We got it through the House. We just needed a couple of votes in the Senate. This year, we can get it done in the Senate and get it signed into law. Secondly, to lower the Medicare eligibility age. Imagine how many more people that would bring up and help if we were to lower that eligibility age at least to 60. That is something we absolutely can do, and it will help working people across this country. It is also incredibly popular. So those are two critical pieces along with continuing to expand the, uh, the list of prescription drugs that prices we are negotiating. And we need to make sure that that gets on the next administration's agenda and get that done. And then third, we have a great new tool for you that um, I helped uh, develop further. It had already been developed for uh, one state, but we, ex we gave money to expand it to all states. And it is a Medicare for All calculator. So when you're talking to people, you can whip it out on your phone, and they can fill in how much they currently spend, what their family demographics are, just generally. It's very quick and easy to use. And it will tell you how much they can save with a single-payer uh, Medicare for All system. So I really love this tool. I want you to use it. And you can find it at calculator.passmedicareforall.com. Org. So check it out. It is a great tool to use to help people understand how it's actually going to help lift them up and save them costs, save them, you know, expenses in their daily lives. And then the last thing is I'm hoping to um, have the Medicare for All PAC do some important message testing and polling in battleground states over the next couple of months because we know that we are going to see a lot of attacks on Medicare for All over the next couple of months. And I want people to have the best messaging so that they don't you know, completely distance themselves from Medicare for All and actually talk about the profiteering. Talk about the fact that insurance companies are making so many profits even as people are not getting health care. So keep your eye out for that. We will make sure to get all of these resources to you. And I, I'll just end with this. You are all organizers. I'm an organizer. That is what I believe makes change. My whole theory of change was to come to Congress and do the organizing on the inside and coordinate with the outside. And you know in, it, what I've always said is that progressives, what it means to be a progressive is just that you're first to the best and most just idea, and then you build the movement and you organize and everyone else runs to catch up with us. So that is exactly what you're doing. That is what Bernie and I will continue to do inside Congress. And let's end with a little, when I say healthcare, you say human right. When I say healthcare, you say? When I say healthcare, you say? When I say healthcare, you say. Thank you, everybody, and have a great panel. Hello, everybody. And so I would like to bring up onto the stage now. Um, oh, uh, well, actually, wait a second, it's all good. And uh, by the way, state, state, by the way, you're going to get a real treat, too. I saw a person speak yesterday who's going to speak at the end of this panel. Again, off the charts oratory, upcoming right here, right from this podium, folks, because Representative Jonathan Jackson is going to speak. And what I heard him talk about yesterday was hilarious, poignant, and powerful, folks, and right for the moment. It's about Donald Trump. But last, welcoming to the stage now, Megan Essenhet from the uh, People's Action. And I'd like to recommend, uh, welcome to the stage, Dr. Monica Maloof. And I would like to welcome to the stage, Chuck Finacchio. <laughs> uh, why don't you put it over a chair? Just, I'll, no, 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 here, hand it to me. But first, I see that. Oh, then give me two. It's all, it's all part of the same cause here on this issue here. So, um, and again, getting healthcare justice in the United States of America 
It's almost like, again, the Leonard Cohn song popping through my head today. If you don't know democracy in America, it's a struggle to get there. But we're going to get there on both of those two fronts. And right now, we have Jasmine Ruddy joining us. And she is somebody I've been honored to work with uh, through our partnership at PDA with National Nurses United, as well as with the California Nurses Association, which is just one of the great union uh, unions in the country and in the world, folks. And I do want to say just a thought, because I love NNU, and I just want to have a little thought here, too. For anybody who doesn't know, nurses around this country and around the world during the pandemic saved thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives. And nurses in this country and around the world lost their lives and were harmed and permanently wounded by the fact of COVID-19. These people are true heroes in our society. Jasmine Ruddy, welcome and take it away. Hi everyone. Am I okay? Is that you're on. Good to go. Okay, great. And you guys can hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, thank you guys so, so much. Um, it's just a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. We, uh, the nurses, love, uh, love PDA, love all of you so much, and really appreciate um, uh, your nurses for the opportunity to be here today. to see these well, um, and I want to know if you, if you can, but I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slideshow here. All right, here we go. Wait, I oh. have a slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. There's my slideshow. Yep, indeed. Okay. We are the country's largest union of bedside registered nurses across the country at 225,000 members strong. Uh, and we have been uh, incredibly proud uh, alongside all of uh, the other organizations on this panel, uh, so many folks across the country. Our union has been proud to be fighting, uh, have been fighting for Medicare for all uh, in the United States for, for decades, since at least the early 90s. And the reason for that is because nurses, I don't think I need to tell all of you, just like we saw with COVID, um, and just like nurses have always seen in the bedside, uh, nurses see firsthand the consequences of what this broken for-profit healthcare system looks like for, for patients, um, and, and, and what, that, what that looks like in practice, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do uh, for just a little bit today is dive into, uh, you know, some of what programs and that all touched on, but just a bit more about, you know, how nurses see our, our for-profit broken healthcare system not working for people, uh, and why we think Medicare for all is the solution, and a little bit about what we're doing to organize to, to make it happen. So, um, so yeah, thank you again so much. All right, so uh, first, just to start with, just uh, you know, recapping some of uh, of these reasons why our broken healthcare system, uh, or you know, some of the, the effects of our broken healthcare system. Some of this has been touched on, but I just want to touch on it again because I think these are really important points for all of us to know. Uh, the first is that, uh, like someone mentioned earlier, we do spend more per person in the United States on healthcare than any other country. Um, it is about twice as much. Um, and as we do that, we also get worse health outcomes as a result, even though we're paying twice as much per capita. In the United States, uh, we know that infant mortality is double that of other major countries around the world. Uh, we also know that by the time that uh, US adults reach the age 65, that 68% of adults in the United States have developed two or more chronic conditions. And that's just for uh, comparison, compared to 33% of US adults in the UK with two or more chronic conditions. And we know that this is a result of a lack of ability to access primary care, the routine care that people need, right? Uh, this has been touched on too, but uh, we have a gross lack of coverage in the United States. Even after, a decade after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we still have somewhere close to 26 million people in the U.S. who do not have health insurance, and at least 44 million people, by our count, who are what are called underinsured, as Congressman Jayapal touched on. Folks who have insurance, technically, 
They don't need it because they can't afford the deductible, they can't afford the co-pays, they are underinsured. That is a great thing in itself, right? The fact that we have so many people walking in the United States, an industrialized country, with no ability to get the care that they need. And in addition to all this, we know that medical debt is the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. Some of you may have seen that there was a poll that just came out of West Health and Gallup last month that really just, you know, drove home how this crisis in the United States is only getting worse year by year. So this survey that took place from last November to this past January showed us that health care is getting worse in America. So in this study, 45% of Americans surveyed in the study were unable to afford or access the health care that they need. That is a six points, that's six points lower than in 2022. So this is only getting worse, right? That drop in affordability is the highest among adults who are over the age of 50 in the United States. And we know that all of this is disproportionate among Black and Latinx adults. The survey found that this is highest among Black and Latinx adults of all ages. We know that, you know, this is the case across the board. The people of color in the U.S. are disproportionately impacted by our broken health care system. Just to name one example, of those about 26 million people in the U.S. who are uninsured, half are people of color. So this is disproportionately affecting communities of color in the U.S. And this problem is getting worse. So why is this the case? Why is this a problem in our for-profit health care system exist? We could spend a whole panel, a whole hour talking about this, but I'm just going to touch on it for one slide. There are two major systemic issues in our for-profit system that lead to every single one of these problems that I just mentioned. The first is fragmentation, and the second is the profit motive. So the first, just to touch on fragmentation. So our health care system in the U.S. is composed, if you think of it in a really easy way, it's composed of two parts, basically. Part one is financing, and part two is delivery. What we're talking about here, when we're talking about single payer, is changing the financing of care. So in other words, financing and delivery, there's how we pay for care, right? And then there's who and how we deliver care. Today, in the U.S., the financing side, it looks like this picture, right? It consists of a mix of insurance companies, employer-provided health insurance plans, public health care plans, all of which play a role in paying for health care for some number of Americans. And the result of this is a complicated mess of a system that demands an even more complicated bureaucracy to keep track of it all. This all costs money, right? It adds an immense bloat and waste to our system that hospitals routinely have to have entire booking departments dedicated to navigating the fragmentation of this system. Single payer, by the way, is one payer, right? So there's no fragmentation, no complicated bureaucracy. And then in addition to the fragmentation that drives costs up by adding all that bloat and all that waste, we all know here that greed defines the United States health care system. This profit motive creates an incentive for insurers to deny care to patients. In fact, the very business model of insurance, of health insurance in the United States, is to maximize profits by denying care to patients. I want to repeat that point again, because if you take anything away, I think it should be this. The very business model of health insurance in the United States is to deny care to patients to maximize profits. That's how they make money. And that is unjust, right? We cannot let that stand. And the only solution, the only policy solution that takes both of these four problems head on to their core, that takes on that fragmentation and takes on the profit motive, the only solution that nurses have been fighting for, that all of us have been fighting for, is Medicare for all. So I want to touch on the case. I'm sure you've heard about that, but I'm just going to briefly recap some of the top principles so that we're all on the same page. Number one, Medicare for all is a universal coverage. Everybody and nobody else, right? That's what we say. Health care for all U.S. residents, undocumented, whether it's just your siblings included, everyone living in the United States gets health care. Number two, it would be a single public program. So again, Medicare for all is what's called a single payer system because it means what it sounds like. There would only be one entity paying for the health care, paying for health care for everyone, instead of having tons of different private 
decide it before you're a government insurer, one plan would pay for all the things they would get. Number three, a cost free hundred benefits, right? Medicare for all is not simply Medicare as it is today. And if everyone, Medicare for all, vastly expands and improves the Medicare for all, the Medicare program, and it covers, or if you look in the bill, it will cover not only medical care, but also kind of dental, vision, hearing, reproductive, long term care, mental health care, and so much more, right? That's what Britain is doing with the nation today. Number four, freedom of choice. This is so important, right? No more in network or out of network. It doesn't exist in single payer. To get these services, you can be virtually any doctor, you can go to virtually any hospital in the country, no network for limited choice. And in addition, we know that it's doctors and nurses who get to determine who you the care that you need, not some insurance company bureaucrats, right? Freedom of choice. Number five, affordable to people, it's free for service. It's free health care, right? All medical care, uh, there's a free to point of service. There are no more premiums, co-payments, or deductibles, or surprise bills. If you need care under a Medicare for all system, you bring your Medicare card to the doctor, any doctor you choose, you get the care you need, right? That's, that's as basic as it is. And number six, the just transition. You know that Medicare for all, as just like many other progressive policies we fight for, includes a just transition, right? For both insurance and administrative workers whose jobs will be affected by switching to a more efficient healthcare system. Uh, this means that a certain percentage of the budget laid out in the bill is dedicated to job training programs, to all kinds of benefits for the workers that may be impacted by this significant transition we're trying to make in our healthcare system, right? So that's just briefly, uh, you know, just reminding ourselves the six basic principles of what it is we're talking about when we fight for Medicare for All. And uh, we should remind ourselves, too, that Medicare for All is overwhelmingly popular among voters, right? Uh, it tracks majority support across the political spectrum, showing uh, support from 88% of Democratic Party voters, even 46% of Republicans, and 59% of Americans overall. And some of you may have seen the Data for Progress poll that came out a few weeks ago that our friend Senator Bernie Sanders wrote about in The Guardian. Uh, they did a bunch of polling on a bunch of different progressive issues among um, swing state voters. And for Medicare for All, they found Supermajority support 63% of swing state voters in this poll uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, in swing states voted, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, in the poll said that they support establishing a Medicare for all system. So uh, this is overwhelmingly popular. We know that when our elected leaders don't support it, they are out of step with the American public. Um, and the, the public support is there. We need to build the political will to get it done, right? Now, uh, all of this is uh, not before I touch on sort of like the current campaigning briefly. I just want to start and kind of backtrack for a second by saying this is not new. I think probably so many of you in the room have been demanding Medicare for All for decades. Activists have been generally demanding universal health care in the U.S. for a century. Uh, and the nurses in our union have been working on, on the forefront of that struggle uh, since at least the 1990s. You can see some early, early photos here of nurses in California fighting on the 1994 ballot proposition. We fought as the California Nurses Association for multiple bills in the early 2000s. We helped to bring that fight to the national level in 2009, around the same time that NMU was formed. And I think all of us really recognize that with all this incredible history behind us um, that we're, that, you know, the shoulders we stand on, that there was a really exciting turning point moment in this movement with the Bernie 2016 presidential campaign. We all remember that Medicare for All really shot into the public zeitgeist with that moment. And there was a ton of energy needed to, to take advantage of coming out of that campaign. And nurses with our union, all the groups who were here on this panel, knew that it was it was crucial to like take that energy and turn it into um, what became, as Congressman Diapol touched on, the revamp and reintroduction in 2018 of a brand new version of Medicare for All in Congress. Um, that became the Medicare for All Act of 2018. Um, we are so, so incredibly proud to work with Congresswoman Jaya Paul and Congresswoman Debbie Dinkel and all of the others in this panel to put together uh, the most comprehensive bill for Medicare for All that has ever been written to date. Um, and Bernie introduced a similar bill in the Senate right around that same time. 
And so the really bright new moments, um, as Congressman Jayapal touched on, before this, Medicare for All was like a 20-page resolution in Congress. And now it is hundreds of pages long, right? It's legislation that, if we're able to pass, is ready to transition us into a Medicare for All system tomorrow, right? So we all knew it was crucial to organize like hell as soon as this moment happened um, and build the movement happen this into law. There was huge success around this moment we gained. At the time, nearly half the Democrats in the House as co-sponsors and 16 senators in, uh, in, as co-sponsors in the Senate, hundreds of organizations that were in support. And this is the bill uh, that we've been organizing around since that time that has been reintroduced now uh, a couple times in each session of Congress. So just to touch on some of the organizing, just really briefly, we've all been doing since then. Uh, you know, we, uh, with our union, helped to call on folks across the country to organize these huge barnstorm events across the country. There was thousands of folks that attended. We uh, successfully held a, a, a 1,500 canvas events that year in communities around the country. We went to 100 town halls held by members of Congress uh, to ask them about supporting the these new bills. Um, we held uh, a huge rally in San Francisco calling on Speaker, at the time, Speaker Pelosi to help move the bill forward. And together we knocked on tens of thousands of doors for tens of thousands of calls at the Congress. And as Congressman Jayapal touched on, as a result of the movement of all of this collective organizing and momentum, Medicare for All received its first hearings in Congress that year. A total of four different hearings ended up taking place. And you can see some of the photos of uh, some of what our nurses were up to during this time. Uh, we had nurses at uh, one of our lobby days deliver a giant monopoly pill. Uh, uh, sorry, not a giant prescription pill full of monopoly money uh, that we stuffed it full of. We brought it to Speaker Pelosi's office to call on her to support Medicare for representing the money she was taking from the pharma industry. And then another action we held that same day when we were outside the former headquarters. So I mean, so many of you were there. Uh, we taped up hundreds of printed bill fundies to their front doors with band-aids symbolizing the, their band-aid solutions to the mm. health crisis. Um, and, uh, and that was just kind of briefly some of what happened. Right? Yeah, and, and Jasmine? Jasmine, sorry, we're, we are running quite a bit behind, and I do apologize. So uh, another minute or so in, in wrap, if you can. We got a great yeah, Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, just then I show you briefly some pictures of the slide here that we were all uh, organizing around in 2020. You know, of course, the pandemic made that tough, but we, uh, we all organized where we could. Um, we re went on to the industry, we reintroduced the bills in 2021. Uh, there was the first hearing ever in the U.S. Senate that year. Uh, our executive director, Ronnie Castillo, was one of the folks that testified, so that was another really historic moment. During all this time, we've all been helping to call on Democrats who are still not co-sponsors on the bill uh, to uh, to join us and become co-sponsors. This is some pictures of the pressure campaigns that we ran, um, one of the, some of which were more successful. And this, this past spring, we reintroduced the bill once again um, with, uh, with with more even more record support. Um, I don't have time to get a ton into it, so I just want to touch on, you know, um, some of the other things I think that other folks on the panel will touch on that we've all been organizing uh, on, you know, also in recent years as we uh, sort of, um, you know, recognize the immense amount of power we still have to build in order to get these bills right past the finish line. Just some of the things we've worked on in our union are fighting against CVS Health. They became the number one donor to the biggest anti Medicare for all lobby group. We did a ton of organizing at hundreds of stores across the country, craft their virtual shareholder meeting, and so much more. And we've also been working a ton on our Patients Over Profits Pledge as we recognize that we need to take on the industry directly and uh, call on elected officials and candidates to stop taking money from the corporate healthcare industry. We have 220 candidates and elected officials who have taken the pledge. Um, if you have not, if you're running for office, please take the pledge. Please help us call on folks to take the pledge. You can find the full list of signers on our website and uh, sign the pledge on, the web, on our website. Uh, and yeah, just a couple ways that I hope folks will get involved in this continued ongoing organizing. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture of this slide, uh, join our email list, find a ton of FAQs, organize with us, ask us questions.
most of this time. And, yeah, very conducive to the lawsuit that I've had. I think that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. Jasmine, Jasmine Rudy from National Nurses United, and a pro thank you so much, Jasmine. It is an honor to work with National Nurses United, and now it is also an honor to work with Chicago-based People's Action and here, Megan Essence. Hey, y'all. Um, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Hi, all. I'm Megan Esahab. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Federal Affairs at People's Action. We're a national network of state and local power building organizations building the power of poor and working people in urban, rural, and suburban areas to win change through issue fights and elections. And I'm here representing our Care Over Cost campaign. Um, and we're, I'm going to show you a really short video to get us started. Well, actually, while they tee it up, I'm just going to ask, how, who in here has ever experienced a health care denial? Either your insurance told you you couldn't get treatment, or you got treatment, and then they said, we're not paying for it. Or that happened to a loved one. Medicine, anything, they're not paying. You're you have insurance, they're not paying, right? <laughs> There's a longer video on our YouTube if you want to watch it. <laughs> Thanks, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of our organizing. Um, and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to try not to be repetitive of what other folks have talked about, right? Jasmine talked about this is, this is how the, the health insurance companies are making their money, by denying care. And that, for people, means bankruptcy, debt, medical debt, just paying for myself. I was privileged enough to be able to pay for my claim, but I felt ashamed that I should have fought harder because it was wrong <laughs> that they were charging me, right? And so we talk about, we organize people, bringing people's um, private shame into public power, right? And fighting back and getting with other people who are experiencing the same injustice. So um, we're um, organizing, People's Actions Care Over Cost campaign is organizing people who are experiencing these care denials, um, and we're running these individual campaigns on the insurance company to publicly name and shame them and to both try to win um, real improvements for people's lives to try to win these cases, but really to run this kind of also narrative campaign because this is happening to everybody, but people sort of feel like, oh, I'm just happy I have health insurance, right? That's how we, they made us feel in society when really people should be more angry about how their insurance company is treating them. So we wanna organize that power and build a bigger movement, for um, bring more people into the Medicare for All movement. Um, we're also building out, starting to build out policy campaigns at the state and local level um, 
to try to win some structural reforms. And when we think about that, we want to th think about reforms that really take power away from our opposition, in this case, the insurance companies. So this year, as you can see, we've chosen United Health Group to be our main target. They're the, oh, exactly, they're the biggest um, health insurance company. They're actually one of the top five largest corporations in the United States. That's how big and rich they are. In 2023, they made $32.4 billion, which is a 14% increase over 2022. And their main subsidiary, United Healthcare, is earning most of those profits off of taxpayer dollars, privatized Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and that's not right. <laughs> So, you know, there's the Biden administration has um, taken efforts to reduce the overpayments. What's ha ha do you all, you all know what, it seems like a lot of people know what Medicare Advantage is, um, right? So that's privatized Medicare. The majority of Medicare recipients are now in privatized Medicare Advantage plans. And it is well documented that our government is paying them more of our tax dollars out of the Medicare trust fund per person than people in is paid for for people in traditional Medicare. It's fraud, like even the Wall Street Journal just wrote two articles about the fraud. Um, and so the Biden administration's been trying to rein it in, but these insurance companies have a lot of power. They're organizing just now in September, they're organizing a big lobby campaign, they'll have advertising, they'll bring people to Congress saying that they're gonna reduce benefits in Medicare Advantage because they don't have enough money and Congress should really give them more money. So it's a live fight, we invite you into it. Um, and just to be clear, we're not here to like shame or judge anyone for choosing Medicare Advantage. Sometimes that's the only thing people can afford. So that's why we have to invest in traditional Medicare. We can't just fix the Medicare Advantage problem. We have to improve traditional Medicare and lower out-of-pocket costs, as Congresswoman Jayapal was saying. So that's like the plan, if Democrats win a trifecta, will rein in and regulate Medicare Advantage and frankly try to kill it and look, make traditional, me, me, traditional Medicare affordable for everyone who's eligible while expanding benefits in the program. Um, and so I just I want to invite you into that to, to both of those campaigns on the, on the Medicare Advantage front. A bunch of us are working together on Reclaim Medicare and we'll have um, lobby day opportunities and uh, the care over cost campaign. Anybody who wants to work on claims denials will train you and you can join our coalition. And my colleague, Kate Redling's in the office. She's a good, in the front row over here with the, the People's Lobby. She's a good person to talk to about the care over cost campaign. And we have a table out there. Our QR code is for electoral work, but you can go to our website to find out about our healthcare campaigns. Back in my day, um, so many of the doctors were opposed to a system like single-payer universal health care. Now we have an incredibly, incredibly powerful group of doctors organized in particular by a person uh, who's representing the next organization, which is a real powerhouse organization, Physicians for a National Health Plan. And I am proud to introduce, uh, joining us right now, Monica Maloof from PNHP. Take it away. Thank you. Can I use one of the this one? Is that okay? All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, PDA, for organizing this space. Um, my name is Monica Maloof, and I am a doctor. I actually was just at the hospital seeing patients this morning. Ran over here to give this talk. Um, so, um, so just to let you know that like I'm deeply in this world, um, and I want to also thank all of the other organizers and people in this space because like. Representative Jayapal said, and so many others, that like it's going to take all of us to build the coalition to make this happen. Um, people ask me why I do this. Why did I go to work and then come here today? Well, I have two kids at home, but um, the main reason is because I see this every single day as a primary care doctor. There's not a single day where the cost of healthcare doesn't work its way into a patient visit. I can't afford that referral. I can't afford that med. The insurance denied my scan. I can't afford that colonoscopy. Just like a couple weeks ago, I had a patient who used to see me, stopped seeing me, hadn't seen them in almost two years, came back, diabetes is out of control, blood pressure is super high, and I was like, hey man, like what happened? And he's like, well, your hospital stopped contracting with Cigna for a while, and so I couldn't come see you anymore. And then I couldn't find another primary care doctor for like nine months, 
So then you were back in network, so I got on the wait list to come back and see you. And I was like, this is the worst story ever. Even patients with great insurance have so many barriers because this system creates so many structural issues for them to be able to access the care that they need. And I see this day in and day out. Um, so, and my patients deserve better. We all deserve better, right? So, um, I am one of the physicians with Physicians for a National Health Plan, which is a, a organization that started over 35 years ago by physicians, but now is a broad-based worker a coalition of healthcare workers really dedicated towards pushing and advancing the fight against um, Medicare privatization and for Medicare for all. There's a couple of things we've been working on the last few years. Um, really pushing back against Medicare Advantage has been one of our big platforms the last few years because we recognize that like, if Medicare gets privatized, we kind of lose the model with which to have a universal healthcare system. If we lose Medicare to private insurance companies, I think it's gonna set us really far back. And so we've done a lot of work in the last few years pushing back against ACO reach, um, really talking and publishing a really thorough reports about the harms of Medicare Advantage. Um, recently, we w helped push forward some small piecemeal victories. Every year, insurance companies get these inflation adjustment adjusted payments for Medicare Advantage. This year, with the support of many of our um, partners and um, supporters in Congress, we helped push back against a billion dollar um, like way payment, excess payment to insurance companies. So that was a huge victory, um, which actually cost United Healthcare in the in their stock, stock in the in their you know stock. So that was great, um, and. Um, so we're really um, working against, you know, working to support those piecemeal changes, but then also again help build that coalition of healthcare workers, um, medical students, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners to really like be engaged in this fight against um, against Medicare privatization, against profiteering in medicine, and then ultimately to accomplish our goal of achieving a universal Medicare for all type system. So um, thanks all for having me today, and thank you all for like being involved in this fight with us. Thank you so much. Now, we have like got so many progressive members of the House back in the green room. Chuck Pinocchio, though. <laughs> okay, was it Saskatchewan? Okay, I just gave away the answer to the question. If you, you know, the most popular guy in a poll that was done in the history of Canada, and somehow he's some kind of relative of Kiefer Sutherland, I don't quite get that. Um, he, <laughs> it is true, that's true. Uh, he was voted the most popular person in the history of Canada, topping Wayne Gretzky. What was his name? Tommy Douglas. What did Tommy Douglas do? What do you think Tommy Douglas on this panel was behind? And, and he, health care for all out of, the, out of the province of Saskatchewan, swept across the country. And do you think they'd trade that system for what we got here? Do you think they'd maybe elect this guy, Tommy Douglas, and vote for him as the most popular Canadian of all time? Yes. No, they wouldn't trade the health care system. And yes, Tommy Douglas, most popular Canadian ever. And here is Chuck Pinocchio, who organizes for one-payer states. And yes, this is a very, very real way to break an unjust and ridiculously overpriced healthcare system to organize in states. And here's Chuck to give the solution to this grave problem in three minutes. Chuck, take it away. This one live? Is this okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay? No? It needs to be on. Alan? Just get closer. Does that work? Maybe go for that. Go with this one? Go with this? Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, thank you so much. And nothing like the pressure of having elected officials uh, sweating in the background. Um, but just, just, uh, just to start out by saying, um, my name is Chuck Pinocchio, president of One Pair of States. We've been around since 2009. And uh, the campaign actually sprung out of the discovery of the organization of a group called Healthcare for All Pennsylvania. I ran for US Senate back in 06. And people said after I only got 10% of the vote on, what do we, we raised $120,000 and got 10% of the votes statewide in Pennsylvania, not bad. What we did is we unified the state and brought everybody together around single payer. And a few years later, I had discovered working in Harrisburg that the way to get this done was to make the economic argument, because mostly the Republicans were chairing the committees. Is this, the mic is going out again? I mean, you can hear me, okay. Um, 
fast, yeah, just fast forward here. The point that we, that I was pushing on then, and that was with my good, good friend Joel Siegel, right, John Conyers, and others across the country, is we've got to get economic impact studies done. We've got to make the economic argument. And we've got the economic argument. I don't know why we were hesitant to do that. Another thing I just want to say is that in turning to the question of greed, I've been pushing for this phrase and would love everybody to pick it up. It's profit first. That's what they're about. Not for profit, it's profit first. If we can all adopt that language, that frame, it drives home the very point about greed. It's profit first. It's baked into their business model. So um, just very quick thank yous for, for Pramila Jayapal, who carried our legislation, the state-based universal health care for many years. She knows it. Bernie Sanders is on record saying that the likelihood of getting to national is through states. And Saskatchewan proves it, as well as the history of the United States. Take a look at child labor, women's suffrage. Um, the list goes on. Civil rights, environmental regulations. This is where the action is often occurring, and now perhaps more than ever. And this is a real opportunity that we've got to uh, embrace. And, and also just want to thank my fellow panelists here, Jasmine, Megan, uh, uh, Monica, and Julian. I don't know if she's going to be with us. And PDA has been so forceful, a co-founder of One Payer States going back to 2009. Donna Smith's in the room today, our good friend uh, from, from uh, uh, Tim Carpenter. And need to thank our volunteers with One Payer States. 25 states. We have 25 states engaged in this work. This is very powerful. We've just circulated a petition and picked up over 15,000 signatures in support of the state-based universal health care. And we just got a senator for the first time. Senator Ed Markey introduced our bill. Now we've got the bill in both houses of Congress. We're going to work both sides. And this is really a, a critical step forward. And also a shout out to the 82 organizations, which I can't list here, obviously, who signed on in support of our legislation as well. Um, we know what the problems are in healthcare. Everybody's covered this. What I want to do is just touch very quickly on what SABUCA, we call it, State Based Universal Healthcare Act, actually does, is that it provides what are called super waivers, allows states to bring back the federal healthcare dollars that are paid out in the form of Medicare and Medicaid and CHIPS and so forth, bring those back to the states, and then that allows the states to model efficiently through a single payer Medicare for all model what the nation desperately needs, similar to what Tommy Douglas did in Saskatchewan, right? That's what we're looking at. This is our theory of change. I'm an historian. I taught for 32 years, have really studied this. Um, great resources out there. NV database, nonviolent database .edu, edu, NV database edu. And Steve is flashing our our new our new our uh, our new iconic uh, model here for. We want the DNC to bring the language back from 2020, which actually called for states to uh, uh, go forward, to, to um, model this. That was the result of the Sanders-Biden negotiations, if you remember, in 2020. So that language, we want to bring that back for Harris and Walls and the Democratic Party. Um, the, the, the other thing that the legislation does is it establishes a panel that vets these, these state programs and determines whether they are actually viable. And they need to hit benchmarks. The, 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 the money is, is uh, uh, is, is uh, cordoned off, so it can only be spent on health care. And one thing about uh, Warren Buffett is referred to, Warren Buffett is referred to American economic competitiveness in terms of health care. It's the tapeworm of economic competitiveness. Um, the, uh, the other thing here is, is that uh, Rep Jayapal, when we talked in the back, she said that she's going to wants to coordinate as much as possible with the states introducing them at the same time that we go forward with the Medicare for All bill. That's a shout out and a compliment to the work that she's done in the past and the work that Rep Khanna and Senator Markey are doing presently. Last thing I want to say, I realize I'm probably exceeding three minutes, but just to say a couple words and then invite the conversation going forward at onepayerstates.org. And that is to really be intentional about building a winning strategy. A winning strategy. We talk strategy all the time, don't we? My reference point is actually a book by Edward Bellamy called Looking Backward. It's a book that came out in 1887, and it's a story of how Boston was converted from a dystopian society to a utopian society. It's a visionary novel. We need to see the success. We need to envision that success to move forward. And in doing that, we need to say to ourselves, what did we do to win? What did we do to win? And that includes, of course, coordinating their communication, meeting people where they are, building broad-based coalitions in the three Ps. That's policy, people, and politics. Coordinating, thinking intersectionally, connecting all of our social justice movements, relationship building, 
and, and connecting our strategies, making sure that we're aware of what the other is doing, and never bad-mouthing each other. Too much of this still happens. There's too much of the circular firing squad stuff that's going on even in this movement. We need to call it out. We need to call it out. <laughs> lastly, <laughs> lastly, the, 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 the Sabuka, I realize, it, 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 it accomplishes all of the above. It gets us moving the ball and, and getting where we need to be in terms of creating national Medicare for all. That's our goal. That's the gold standard. That's the work that we're aspired to. Thanks so much to PDA and our partners and to our upcoming reps. Thank you so much. I want to thank so much again, uh, Monica Malouf from PNHP, Megan Essenhef from People's Action, and Chuck Pinocchio from One Pair of States. And whenever I'm down in the dumps, Chuck magically calls and lifts my spirits up and gets me going forward. You know, we do suffer defeats in our movement. We pick back up when we go. And thank you so much. And we're behind schedule. And I'm going to now introduce our next speaker. So thank you so much. And again, we will continue working in every way, shape, and form. Oh, we should take this out. Every way, shape, or form with uh, People's Action and Positions for National Health Plan and One Pair of States. So yesterday, I was privileged to hear fantastic oratory from two members of the same immediate family. And one was, <laughs> I don't know. I got to see the 1980, I thought you mentioned this, the 1984 um, DNC speech by Reverend Jesse Jackson at Rainbow Push in the presence of Reverend Jackson. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. I saw it as a child. It absolutely lifted my heart and lifted my spirits and made me believe in possibilities. Again, for those who don't know and always honored to say this in front of the Jackson, the Jackson family member, Progressive Democrats of America is an outgrowth of those campaigns. Uh, Steve Cobble, our founding political director, and Tim Carpenter bonded their professional paths at those campaigns. And then earlier in that day, I was uh, uh, listening to Representative Jonathan Jackson, and all I could say is that was unbelievably uplifting. And you could probably, I don't know what he's gonna say, speak about today, but I'll let you let, know if it's off different themes. And even if it is overlapped on the themes, I'm sure on Rainbow Push you can go back and find it, because this was one of the most powerful articulations of all that's wrong with Donald Trump that I have heard, and we've had a lot of those in the last nine years. And also, it, we, we are fantastically proud to have always endorsed uh, Representative Jackson as runs for Congress, and welcoming now to the stage Representative Jonathan Jackson from the great city that we are in today, Chicago, Illinois. Hello, CTU and friends. Once again, thank you so much, Brother Allen. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your dedication and work that you've done for oh so many years. I'd also like to acknowledge my very good friend, dear colleague, a man that's been with me very much from the beginning. When I first told him I wanted to run, he called me over to his office, took me out to lunch. None other than the dean of the Illinois delegation of the Congress for Democrats, Dean Danny K. Davis. Congressman Davis came over to my office when we first moved in, and I was just shocked because of his seniority and all of his obligations that he has in Washington. I don't know which microphone. I don't know which mic. Uh, because of his obligations, I was honored. He came over to my office, a freshman office, the dean of the delegation, by himself to ensure that I was on the committees that I had requested, and that is Foreign Affairs and the Department of Agriculture. For that, I want to thank Congressman Davis for lending his voice, his access, and his influence to make sure that we were going to be well represented on those committees. Why is that important? Let me tell you why. I'm thinking ag, like many of you might have thought about ag, but you've got New York with Wall Street stocks and bonds, but right here in the city of Chicago, the single largest industry is in our financial services, and that's with the Chicago Board of Trade that's in his district, that's with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange that's in his district, that's with the Chicago Board of Options right here. He wanted to make sure we have access. The largest industry in every state, 49 out of 50 states across the United States of America, is the ag industry. Now how can we have food deserts when ag is the biggest industry in every state? When we talk about the progressive agenda, how can we now be facing malnourishment 
when agriculture in the United States of America can feed the world. That's policy. So by getting on ag and where the budget stands now, a budget of $1.5 trillion in the Department of Agriculture, second only in, in size to the Department of Defense, $1.5 trillion with the T. The only thing that holds up the budget being passed, if you will, is the progressive agenda. What they want to do is they want to cut $30 billion out of the Supplemental Nutritional and Assistance Program. That comes down to $2 per meal per person. Why is that a radical idea to talk about making sure that Americans are fed? 42 million Americans now need supplemental nutritional assistance. Let that sit in your head. We're not even talking about a whole meal. We're talking about supplemental nutrition and assistance. Flip that equation upside down. Americans are malnourished. When we look at the South and the West Side, neighborhoods that are hard hit, African American women and our infant mortality cases are three times as likely for an African American woman to die giving childbirth as a Caucasian woman. In parts of the district where Congressman Davis and I overlap, in Inglewood, the largest gap in life expectancy in the United States of America is 30 years between West Inglewood and Streeterville, in the same city, less than seven miles apart. We're not going to let peace and progressive be a radical word. You're looking at the, at the captains of chaos when you look at a Donald J. Trump. Now we have the opportunity to have the prosecutor versus the criminal. <laughs> and if I see this man tell us one more time that Mrs. Harris is unintelligent, someone that can't speak above a second grade level, a man that thinks he's the greatest, the most beautiful, the most honest, that don't get me started. This man is a criminal. And he hangs out with such. And every time you have the opportunity, I don't like to call people names, but unfortunately, we're going to have to apologize as soon as we get the victory won. This man is weird. Let him know it every day. He is one strange guy. And somehow or another, that's getting underneath his skin. And what's weird about him? He picks J.D. Vance. How do you write a book called The Hillbilly Elegy? Say your people have problems. You describe every issue they have. And in conclusion, he offers no solution to address the needs of his own. That's weird. How does a man that's been prosecuted, indicted 34 times, awaiting conviction, thinks he's fit to be the president of the free world? let alone to the commander-in-chief of our armed services. He's a sex offender. These are the remarks from Jonathan L. Jackson, and I wholly endorse them. In conclusion, the big picture. One day, Congressman Davis and I will be off the stage. We're setting a foundation for future generations and the question is, what are we leaving behind? What does it mean when Donald J. Trump had occupied the nation's highest office? That means there's a character deficit. What does it mean when Congressman, when, when Donald J. Trump is awaiting sentencing? What does it mean when Donald J. Trump has sexually assaulted a woman? Well, one thing it's gonna mean, we're gonna have to look at changing public housing laws if a felon that's committed a sexual event has not been a registered sex offender. The White House is public housing. You've got a greater man coming behind me, a man that I appreciate, respect so much, that has taken the time to teach me. He's been in public life my entire adult life. I have so much respect enormous respect for him, for his quiet leadership, his, uh, I'm also envy of his, his voice and eloquence. Uh, none other than my dear friend, should I introduce him or you want to introduce him? Al, let me do this. I take the privilege, 
And uh, it is my, I rise today to acknowledge the Honorable Congressman Danny K. Davis, a man that is instinctively intelligent, persuasively analytical, totally articulate, and the next ranking member of the House Ways and Means Committee. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the city of Chicago. We call it the city of the big shoulders. We generally got a few things to offer everybody when they come. We used to have Wrigley Field, Soldier Field, Marshall Field, and a pretty good sized lake. But we are delighted that this year, Democrats from all over the United States of America and many other places throughout the world are coming and have come to Chicago to chart a new course in the history and development of this nation. These United States of America that have never been exactly what they ought to be, but are always becoming. I want to thank Representative Jonathan Jackson. I knew him when he was a baby. <laughs> Crawling around in diapers and pampers and those kind of things in his parents' home where we have met and met and met and his family has contributed so much to America. Not only Reverend Jesse, but also Jesse Jr., also Santina, who can sing like a bird, his youngest sister, Lil Jackie, used to be chairman of our cultural arts committee that I have. I'm a big committee person. I got a committee for everything under the sun. <laughs> and of course, I want to commend the Chicago Teachers Union for the development of this building. I am a former member and was actually chairman of the Professional Problems Committee at my school when I was 21 years old and teaching in the Chicago Public Schools. I am delighted that all of you are here and with a progressive agenda. What do we call a progressive agenda? Trying to move more people into what is called the middle class. About 10% of the people in our world live in serious poverty. And many of the problems that we talk about every day and we look for causation, why do they exist? It is because of poverty. Some people having much too much, other people not having what they need. And so I've got a feeling that when we leave this convention, all of America will be able to see the difference between what we call Democrats and Republicans. As Jonathan mentioned, yes, I sit on the Ways and Means Committee. I've been around here for a long time. I've seen things that didn't exist, things that people thought would never have. They never thought we would pass my Second Chance Act that has provided more than a billion dollars for people who are offenders and who have been arrested, some illegally, some who've gotten great sentences for doing little bitty things. I must confess that when Wes Moore cut loose 175,000 people who had records in Maryland for a possession of marijuana, I jumped and shouted and said, yeah, that's a guy who at some point ought to be president of the United States too. And I think we've got a good bench. When you talk about a bench, Democrats got a bench. And so you build a dynasty 
would have been. <laughs> and so we need not only to make sure that Kamala will be elected, and she will. She will. There's no doubt in my mind about it. I grew up in rural Arkansas, though I live in Chicago and have come to Chicago. But the South is not going to rise again, not under the auspices of Donald Trump and the Trumpeteers. We have everything in place that we need. So I just urge you to do like I'm going to do. I'm going to leave Chicago, go out to Wisconsin, go to Michigan, go to other places, go to battleground states and make sure that we do the work where the work is needed. Welcome again to Chicago and to the 7th Congressional District. This happens to be the heart of my hood, where I live, work, and walk, and talk every day, so you couldn't be in a better place. And of course, if we could just get the people that own that building we're going to be into all week, if the White Sox could win a game. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> Representative Davis, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Okay, for, the, for those two of you don't know, Representative Davis has introduced a bill which we'll be hearing about shortly called the National Infrastructure Bank Legislation. And with our partners, a Manufacturing Renaissance Act, Renaissance um, in the district that we're in right now. Danny Davis's office is one of the first to support a bill introduced by Jan Schakowsky we'll be hearing about tomorrow. So he also, by the way, wins the award for mic control. That was beautiful. I love that. Yeah, it's very good, yeah. And so with that, back now, coming to introduce our panel on the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. And our first speaker will be my co-author, Harvey J. K. And we'll be having Ro Khanna follow him, but we'll have Mike Lux join the panel and Anthony Flacavento, if you wanna come up and, and sit. Um, I know that Professor K will be talking for a few minutes, and it's gonna be a brilliant overview of where we are historically. Of course, Mike Lux is somebody I work with, uh, and just, if you don't know Mike Lux's work, learn about it fast right now, because there is no greater advocate working the inside game for the American working class than Mike Lux, who just seated here. And Anthony Flacavento has introduced the Rural New Deal that I'm also honored to have co-authored with him as well. Uh, it is endorsed by his organization, the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative, and then Harvey J. K. is another of my co-authors. We published a bunch of essays inspired by his work, but the together we co-authored essays on the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. And Ro Khanna will be joining us shortly. I know he's in the building, and I think the run of show is going to be Hartzell Gray, then Harvey J. K., Ro Khanna, Anthony Flacaveno, and then because I think the person who really synthesizes it here all together is Mike Lux, that will be the run of show. And I'll probably back away and let you go from person to person in the spirit of saving time. Hartzell. Let's go! Come on, Chicago! Come on! How's everybody doing? Hello again. Ooh, I like this mic better. This is a better mic. I do like that one. All right, my friends. Um, I, have, I have the honor, to be honest with you. I, was, I checked the email and I said, um, we have some certain announcements for some speakers that I would like to make sure that I do. And so um, let me make sure I do this right. Button this up. Harvey J. K. He is the Professor Emeritus of Democracy and Justice at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, a member of AFT and an award winning author and editor of 18 books on America's radical and progressive democratic story. I'm going to pause the first part of his intro because he didn't know about this part. I have had the honor of getting a chance to know this man for the past three and a half years. I actually had my first time recognizing this man on see, it was C SPAN 2018. And he had a book that he was talking about Thomas Paine, 
we have it within our power to begin the world over again. I'm like, this man's incredible. This man is amazing. I am someone who is also a very proud, patriotic progressive. No one wants to live in a place where they say that your home sucks, right? You know, we, granted, we got some things we got to fix. You know, the washing machine's broke, and the shower don't work, but like, it's still my home. And there's so many times that progressives, we get labeled as folks who are just anti this or just mad at that. No, we are positively progressive because that is our American story from day one. And I learned that, I honed that from this man, Professor Harvey J.K. Robert H. Jackson, I, I hope you don't have this prepared in your speech because I stole this from you. Robert H. Jackson, in an address to the National Lawyers Guild, it was 1936 or 7, 37, 37. He was uh, one of FDR's poet laureates, and he gave this address. He said that we too are founders. Let's say that part again. We too, like each and every one of you, we too are founders. We too are makers of a nation, called upon to protect, defend, and make live new bills of rights. That is what it means to be a progressive, to make live new bills of rights. Maybe make live those bills of rights for the 21st century, huh, RBK? We have it within our power to begin the world over again. We have it within our power. Professor Harvey J.K., he has also served as political and historical advisor to Norman Lear, Senator Nina Turner, and Marianne Williamson, and most importantly, he is a co-author with Alan Minsky of the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. Most, most, most important, he is my friend, my dear brother, the great Harvey J.K. Make some noise, Chicago! Either you know what, don't we have these rights already? Have a look at those rights that are not yet recognized as rights. A useful job that pays a living wage. By the way, if you want, you can applaud each one. It would be great. A voice in the workplace through a union and collective bargaining. Comprehensive quality health care. Complete, cost-free public education and access to broadband internet. Decent, safe, affordable housing. A clean environment and a healthy planet. A meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. Sound banking and financial services an equitable and economically fair justice system. Recreation, the right to recreation and participation in civic and democratic life. Now, first I have to tell you, I meant to mention this before, Hartzell is the host, as you may have heard of, the Casey Morning Show. And every Tuesday, every Tuesday over the course of more than two years, we worked our way through the great words of American radicals and progressives from Thomas Paine through to A. Philip Randolph, called the Take Back America. We've been on a hiatus this summer. We're going to start it up again in the fall. Watch out for the Casey Morning Show, okay? On the left, that comic image is from a just-posted comic strip at Common Dreams that Matt Strachbein, AKA the letter hack, asked me to do in collaboration with him on the new Economic Bill of Rights. It tells the story that I'll give you a taste of here and it ultimately makes the case for how we can secure them in light of the current surge of labor and the energy in the progressive movement. So, look, we all know we've endured 50 years of, let's call it what it is, class war from above. Conservative, corporate, and neoliberal campaigns against the democratic achievements of the 1930s through the early 1970s. 
These are class and culture war campaigns that have stripped workers, women, and people of color of their hard-won rights, engendered unprecedented concentrations of wealth. Look, we used to talk about this being a second Gilded Age. I think we're actually going to top the, second, the first Gilded Age in the inequalities that prevail. Moreover, it has devastated the lives of millions and American democratic life is in jeopardy. We know the threat, if we do not win in November, is the F word, fascism. But let's be clear about it. This is the irony. The crisis we face is not one of spirit. The great majority of Americans continue to avidly support democracy. But as Franklin Roosevelt warned, Popular support is not enough. In 1938, he said, fascism and communism and old line Tory republicanism are not threats to the continuation of our form of government. But I venture the challenging statement, he said, that if American democracy ceases to move forward as a living force, seeking day and night by peaceful means to better the lot of our citizens, then fascism and communism aided perhaps by old line Tory republicanism, will grow in strength in our land. Those words hit home, don't they? That's where we are, folks. Communism is moribund, fascism is resurgent. So what are we gonna do? We have a fresh Democratic Party ticket. But where we ask is the vision to inspire and propel our energies and actions. Where is the vision to not only win in November, but also to truly rescue democracy. I'm gonna tell you, it's right in front of us. It's in our history and it's in our deepest journeys and it's time to make them manifest. We must start by remembering what Republicans don't want us to remember and what all too many Democrats seem to have forgotten or had joined in obscuring. We should remember how, for all of their faults and failings, a president and a generation saved the United States from the Great Depression and fascism and turned it into the strongest and most prosperous country on earth, not simply by taking up the labors and struggles of the New Deal and the war effort, but at the very same time by making the United States progressively, if not radically freer, more equal and more democratic than ever before. We forget this. We're taught to forget this. In the 30s and the early 40s, America was radicalized from the White House and from the grassroots. FDR himself, two years before he ran in 32 for the presidency said, wrote this to a very dear friend, the foremost figure on questions of social welfare in America. There is no question in my mind that it is time for the country to become fairly radical for at least one generation. What'd they do? In his 1932 New Deal campaign, FDR promised a vast array of progressive policies and initiatives to rebuild the nation and Americans themselves, assure greater economic security and opportunities, and finally bring an end to the persistent Gilded Age power structure that had brought about the worst economic and social catastrophe in American history. But here's the thing, Americans did more than enlist in the labors of the New Deal. They pushed FDR to go even further than he ever planned to go, and together they initiated, let's call it what happened, revolutionary changes. Listen to this. When I read through this, because I've been doing it for so long, I think, well, of course everybody knows this, but think about it. They subjected capital to public account and regulation. They empowered government to address the needs of working people and the poor. They organized labor unions, consumer campaigns, and civil rights organizations to fight for their rights. They established a social security system. They built schools, libraries, post offices, parks and playgrounds. They expanded the nation's public infrastructure with new roads, new bridges, new tunnels, and new dams. They improved the American landscape and environment, and they energetically cultivated the arts and refashioned popular culture. Just think swing music. Yeah, they left a lot undone, especially regarding racial justice and inequality. But in all their diversity, they imbued themselves with fresh democratic convictions, hopes, and aspirations. And when the second crisis struck, they did not stop. 
Inspired by FDR's words about the four freedoms, freedom of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear, they not only went all out to be fucking fascism, they also subjected the economy to even greater public control, continued to expand the labor, consumer, and civil rights movements, further reduced poverty and inequality from the bottom up, and continued to broaden the we and we the people. Moreover, polling showed that in doing so, they became ever more determined to keep moving the country in a social democratic direction at war's end. Consider this. In 1943, the White House commissioned polls. They asked Americans, what do you want after the war? The pollsters out of Princeton University summed it up as saying, Americans want everything. And the best example I can give you is this. Nearly 85% of Americans in 1943 and 1944 made it clear that they wanted guaranteed health care. 95% of Democrats and 75% of Republicans. And I'm going to tell you something which nobody tells you. No time since World War II have fewer than 50% of Americans not wanted national universal health care. Okay, never, not once in those years. Those surging aspirations gave FDR the confidence to declare this in his 1944 State of the Union message. How many of you knew this is the 80th anniversary of that message? Why do you not know? Because the media didn't tell you, and no offense to my colleague up here, the Democrats don't tell you either, okay? Forget the Republicans. We have come to a real, clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence, Roosevelt said. Necessitous men are not free men. We have accepted, so to speak, a second bill of rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. I just want to show you how informed I am. My colleague, Representative Ro Khanna, in his book on technology, does refer to the Economic Bill of Rights. Applaud him. <laughs> FDR then called for creating nothing less than an Economic Bill of Rights to guarantee to all Americans, how's this for starters, a useful job at a living wage, universal health care, education, food security, a decent home, and opportunities for recreation. In the original draft, it said recreation and adventure. And they didn't have Disney World and all that kind of... Almost immediately, now this is the key thing to remember after that, almost immediately, both the AFL and the CIO, which were separate during those years, those federations together, along with the National Farmers Union, civil rights groups who were growing tremendously during the war, and a new National Citizens Political Action Committee with all the big celebrities lined up, launched major campaigns to promote the idea and help FDR secure re-election that year. Roosevelt knew it would not be easy going ahead. And with corporate bosses, this is the interesting thing when I read this, he wasn't even thinking of the, of the real fascists that we think of in America, you know, the Klan and, and those folks. He was thinking about the corporate bosses. He said this as a national state of the union message. He said, we must beware of rightist reaction. And then he predicted this, which we should heed. He, hell, we're in the middle of it. If such reaction should develop, if history were to repeat itself, and we were to return to the so-called normalcy of the 1920s, hell, if the Republicans win, we're going to go back to the normalcy of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Then, he said, it is certain that even though we shall have conquered our enemies on the battlefields abroad, we shall have yielded to the spirit of fascism here at home. You don't know if you should applaud or vomit, right? FDR won re-election, but he passed away that spring. But the idea did not die. It informed the GI Bill of Rights. It propelled the Truman administration to organize, sorry, to try to secure national health care in the late 40s. It led the Democratic Party to organize its 1960 platform. I have yet to meet, 
Again, I've not spoken to Roe about this. I have yet to meet a single Democratic Party member who can tell me how the 60 Democratic Party platform was written. The man who wrote it was Chester Bowles. He headed the, Price, the Office of Price Administration under FDR during World War II. Went around the country, and what did he discover? That everyone really wanted to start moving in favor of an economic bill of rights. They literally built that platform. The only thing they were worried about is would Kennedy accept it? Kennedy was no liberal, by the way. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't even sure she would endorse him. The point was the Democratic Party created a platform in 60 with that. Now, on top of that, the surprise to everyone, at least when I was a teenager, was that Lyndon Johnson launched, in the spirit of those economic Bill of Rights ideas, the Great Society and the War on Poverty, including programs like Medicare and Medicaid. It in, he, and thereafter, it inspired labor and civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph to advance a freedom budget for all Americans, specifically said to achieve freedom from want, a plan endorsed by 150 of the most prominent academic foundation, labor, and religious leaders in America. And it moved the Reverend Martin Luther King, not long before his assassination, to echo FDR and call for an economic bill of rights in early 1968. Now, you can imagine the fear that prevailed in the corporate bosses' minds. Fearing that persistent vision and the possibility of further democratic achievements, the corporate elite declared war on the working class in the 1970s. I can give you the details if you want, but not right now. And the corporate bosses did a hell of a job pursuing it, hell being the operative word. The next time we heard political talk of an economic bill of rights was not until Bernie Sanders' presidential campaigns of 2016 and especially 2020. There was a real gap in time. The idea hadn't gone away. The Democrats went neoliberal on us. True, most Americans do not remember that history. But polling has repeatedly shown that the great majority of us still aspire to secure the makings of an economic bill of rights. Recognizing that, Alan and I, in consultation with our dear friend Nina Turner, climbed up on FDR's shoulders and composed a new 21st century economic bill of rights, which we've seen here. And the response has been promising. I'm not going to detail all the things that have happened, but I can tell you this, because of what we've done, the Democratic parties of red state Massachusetts and, sorry, blue state Massachusetts, forgive me Massachusetts, blue state Massachusetts and red state West Virginia, I'm still in the case reds means left, so it's hard for me to do that. Okay, both Massachusetts and the West Virginia Democrats have officially embraced it, and in the case of West Virginia, they are going to fly it high on their platform. And if you happen to ever run into Troy Miller, he's the guy to thank. He and I worked, worked hard. He more than I in making that happen. Sadly, we do not have, here we are, back to today, we do not have a president who will call for overthrowing the power of the economic royalists, as FDR did, who will seek to empower and engage working people in transforming the prevailing political and economic order. Transforming, not cleaning it up. And who will issue a call for an economic bill of rights. But hey, we have a history to inspire us and the yearnings of our fellow citizens to encourage us. The time has come to do, you know, we all scorn our parents' generation. We all laughed at the idea of the greatest generation. Not I, but so many did. The time has come to do what our parents and grandparents did. Save American democratic life by radically enhancing it. The time has come for our many progressive organizations. This is it. This is it. The time has come for our many progressive organizations and resurgent labor unions. I am a labor unionist. To create a grand coalition a coalition that will seriously press the Democratic Party and fingers crossed the harris waltz administration to redeem FDR's 44 call and join in rallying working people to fight for a 21st century economic bill of rights that will guarantee to all Americans what's right in front of you. Thanks. Yeah.
<laughs> um, you know, it's sort of funny. I've been, I've been so super busy. Um, the state of Arizona has also passed a resolution endorsing the economic, 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. Democrats abroad have, and Roe, I've been so busy that I know it was passed by the resolution committee unanimously in California, and I believe it's been passed through officially by the executive board as well. We were sort of waiting on California, because that's a big one, then we're gonna move it out across the country further. But with California, I believe it's happened. Sorry, I've been really busy. Um, and they kept delaying it because of all sorts of uh, votes on uh, resolutions and stuff, amendments, the, the, the uh, general statewide voting things. They, they opine on that, the Democratic Party. And they delayed it through one session. I lost track of it. But yes, I'm quite confident that's passed. So it really is spreading as an idea. I do think it's a very, and we'll get to Roe in a second, because I was at the Sanders Institute event, and I don't think Roe knew I was in the audience. Of course, I saw him later. And he stood up and gave a speech for 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. So I was absolutely thrilled by that. But we'll get to Rokana in a minute. Uh, Mike Lux is a, obviously a very busy time here. And, and uh, look, Mike Lux works in Washington, D.C. And I got to know Mike's work really well. I knew it from a distance because I had a book that he had written that was about organizing inside the Democratic Party that I sort of viewed as something like a Bible as I took the position at PDA. And, um, and then I'm on twice a week calls with Mike and he also does a lot of polling, and the polling really is insightful about the aspirations of the working class and the ways in which the Democratic Party can still connect with the white working class out across the country, the entire working class, and as I read it, it is progressives who are laying the table for the ways in which that reconnection can be made, and I do think the party is starting to hear this, and Mike Luck's work is just exemplary in that manner. Because don't ever forget, you know, there are not that many progressives who have held out inside the Democratic Party through the long haul of it. And the people who have, who have been progressives, they are informed by the insight that informs this convention. That you, in a two-party system, you can't leave the Democratic Party. It's just ceding the territory of power to our adversaries in our society. And so Mike Lux, it is a pleasure to introduce you. And with Democracy Partners and Mike Lux Communications. Thanks, Alan. Uh, you are very generous and very kind. Thank you. Uh, honored to be here on, on uh, this panel. Um, Anthony has started an incredible new organization, which he's going to tell you about. Ruby, uh, the Rural Urban Bridge Divide, really important new group. Uh, Ro Khanna is like one of my very favorite people in Washington. He, he's from Silicon Valley, uh, but he, uh, he knows that we have to get out and talk to working class people throughout the country, in the middle of the country, in rural areas, and he's been an absolute leader uh, in the Democratic Party. And uh, Harvey, your book on Tom Paine was like one of the great books that I ever read in my life. So, I hope people will read uh, the, the book on Tom Paine. It was so inspirational and so wonderful, and, and I made it one of the cornerstones uh, uh, of a book that I wrote on American history, so uh, uh, giving you full credit, of course. So um, I just want to, I, I want to tell you about an election. I'm not going to tell you what year this was. Uh, I'm going to let you make some guesses as I'm talking. This was an election uh, uh, that was, uh, after the Obama elections, and we actually won urban uh, America, big cities, by uh, more than 500,000 votes more than Obama had won uh, uh, th those cities. Um, in that same election, we won the suburbs of those big cities by more than, f by another 500,000 on top of that, uh, so you would think, uh, what, a, what a year for the Democrats. What a great year for the Democrats. That year was 2016. What happened? Where did all those votes go? We, 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 had, we, had, we had broken Obama's record in both big cities and big city suburbs, uh, and yet we lost the 2016 election. Uh, what happened was... Uh, a, a part of the country that I call the factory towns. Um, me and some colleagues did some research about 
uh, the, the, the places in America, the counties in America that were most hard hit by deindustrialization, that had had the most factory closings, that still had some manufacturing, but their numbers were way down, the places that had been most hit by the opioid crisis. And in those counties, uh, across the, uh, the industrial heartland in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania and even in western New York, because we looked at western New York as, as well. In those counties, um, Barack Obama had actually carried uh, the, the mid-sized counties that I'm describing by about 100,000 votes net uh, in 2012. In 2016, he lost them by more than 700,000 votes. Think about that kind of collapse. And, and then if you go a, a level down and look at the smaller industrial counties, the ones that have factories but, but, uh, but are, but are you know, more rural, in those counties, uh, we did uh, 1.8 million votes worse than Barack Obama had done. 1.8 million. You think about those numbers uh, they completely swamped the gains that we had made in big city America and in, in suburban America. Um, there was something going on in those counties. Those counties felt, uh, and, and some great pollsters, and, and you know, I'm, 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 I've done a lot of uh, polling on this, but people uh, who you've probably, uh, are, are more well known to you, Stan Greenberg, uh, has done polling around this. Celinda Lake has done polling around this. Several other pollsters have done polling around this. These folks felt like we bailed out Wall Street, but we did nothing to help working people across America. Uh, and they felt forgotten. They felt ignored. They felt alienated uh, from the Democratic Party. If you do focus groups in these counties, they're still talking about NAFTA 30 years later. You know, like, like a trade deal that was done 30 years ago, <laughs> they're still talking about it. And, and it's not like focus group moderators are necessarily bringing it up. They're, they're bringing it up. Uh, it's one of the first things folks mention in these conversations about the economy. The good news, though, is that these voters uh, on economic issues are a lot like the people in this room. Um, they are, they're mad about the healthcare system in rural America and want more access uh, to, to healthcare. They don't necessarily call it single payer, but that's basically what they're looking for. They, uh, they love labor unions. Even in rural America, these workers love labor unions. They, they blame corporate CEOs and uh, a phrase that they use in focus groups, the top 1%. They love that phrase. Uh, they talk about how uh, corporate media is, is distorting things and telling the wrong story. These folks are with us on most issues. And if we talk like folks who, who give a damn about them, um, they, they will come back to us. Now, yeah, there's some cultural uh, things we got to work through, but we do that by respecting them, uh, by, by working with them, by talking things through with them, and, and by talking uh, populist economics. If we do that, we can bring these voters uh, back, and we can start winning the kinds of percentages that we've won uh, in past years. We talked about FDR. FDR did extremely well in rural America. Harry Truman kicked ass in rural America. Uh, John Kennedy and LBJ kicked ass in rural America. Um, and Bill Clinton was not, was not our kind of left populist, but Bill Clinton won close to 50% of the vote in rural America. I mean, this is not an impossible thing. We can do this. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and I, think it's, I think it's time for us to present a, a broad populist agenda. In fact, you might, you might even, oh, where was that chart? Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, you might even call it an economic bill of rights. Uh, and uh, people will respond. 
So, uh, so I, come, I come bringing uh, these discouraging numbers about past elections, but I also hope. I, I am convinced that there is great hope for, uh, for reaching out to these kinds of voters and uh, winning a lot of them over. And if we do, think about adding a lot of those voters to the coalition we already have. We're talking about going from 50%, 51% to 55% uh, in all those battleground states. We're talking about starting to win elections again in my home state of Nebraska and places like it. We can do this. Uh, and uh, it, uh, I, I, I hope that uh, PDA will be a part uh, uh, of all of this. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, good. Yeah, Dan Osborne from the Nebraska Senate Kate is not running as a Democrat. He's running as, a, as an independent, but the, he is a good guy, La a labor guy. I love Dan Osborne. And, and indeed, uh, I got I'm getting introduced to Dan Osborne by our, our uh, Western Pennsylvania very labor uh, positive grouping are introducing me to Dan Osborne. We, it would, we of course, were thrilled about having the mic who has to go in and, 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 and to just slip away whenever you need to, to fo follow Anthony, and I think you can see the connectivity. Again, Anthony, the author of the Rural Urban Bridge, uh, Rural Urban uh, Bridge Initiative and the Rural New Deal. But again, we don't want to get too far away from the 21st Century Bill of Rights, so we're going to go 21st Century Bill of Rights, Mike Fox is framing around factory towns, back to Ro Khanna, and then back to Anthony Flacaveno. Ro Khanna. I, I don't quite see the mic yet because I have, I, I'm, I know you're going to be at a few things. No, no. Look, folks, you have to understand, I got to introduce Pramila Jayapal, and you thought I loaded up on the superlatives there. Look, we have an incredible set of politicians right now in Washington who are our allies. We really do. And uh, Ro Khanna, co-chair of the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2020, by the way. But Ro Khanna, I'm an economist kid. This is a complex world. This is a complex world in how we organize a contemporary economy in terms of technology, in terms of transitions that need to be made. And there has not been a politician, and it's fitting that you do come from Silicon Valley and you represent Silicon Valley, but in terms of trade policy, manufacturing policy, a real sense of how the global economy works. We have a champion here with us today, and he is a great progressive, Bro Khanna. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, uh, Progressive Democrats for America. Alan, Alan, thank you. Let me uh, see if, if what I say resonates for all the applause. Uh, I uh, really admire Al Alan's leadership. Uh, we need more ideas, intellectual leadership. You know, I'm all about saying you're for the future, but you can't say you're just for the future and forward without the substance. We need ideas that move people and move the country. And so Alan and PDA uh, are providing that. And let's give him a round of applause for his leadership. And Harvey, I'm, I'm really glad I, I see you on social media, and I've read some of your stuff, but I'm glad I got to sit and listen. Too often, you know, you have one event to the other event, and you don't listen. And I, I didn't know the 1960 uh, convention and uh, Chester Bowles' role. So I, I appreciate the history lesson, because I often say I have no new ideas. My ideas are Hamilton, Lincoln, FDR, King. The, the secrets to America's future are in our history. And if more people read our history, we would have a vision of going forward. I mean, people don't realize that Medicare for all, single-payer health care, used to be part of the Democratic Party platform until 1980. Until 1980, and that was stripped because we were so afraid of Reagan. It was stripped out of the platform. It's why Kennedy ran against Carter to try to get single-payer. In fact, in fact, in fact, Jimmy Carter, back in 76, had to adopt single-payer as part of his platform to get labor support. Labor wasn't going to support him in 76 until he adopted single-payer. So these are not ideas uh, that are divorced from historical precedent. Anthony, I appreciate your work. And Mike Lux, I am, uh, appreciate what he said. Let me, I don't want to go on too long, let me just give a brief sense of where I think things are. I was in 2004 at the 
keynote speech that Barack Obama gave uh, in Boston. And if you remember that speech, he spoke about the Maytag factory plant and the people who were laid off. Dan Sweeney knows because he's from this area. And he was talking about a place, Galesburg, Illinois. And I went to Galesburg, Illinois. I shared this with President Obama. I said, you know, I was down in Galesburg, Illinois about two years ago. I said, Mr. President, they actually remember that you came there without any TV cameras, without any press, and then you sat in a pizza joint and had pizza and beer, and they appreciated that you listened. And uh, he said, oh, that sounds good. I said, well, there's some bad news, too. I said, what's the, he said, what's the bad news? I said, Mr. President, it's 2023, and I talked to him, and nothing has changed in Galesburg. Nothing has changed. There are less jobs. Church attendance is dwindling. People are feeling that the economic dream has left them. Wealth is piling up in districts like mine. Twelve trillion dollars of value in one district. Twelve trillion dollars in huge counties and communities totally deindustrialized. It used to be for many people, black and white, that you could, and Latino, that you could have a job, get a car, have a place to live, raise your kids, take a vacation, maybe not a fancy one, but to a beach or something, and have access to the American dream. And that has left too many. It left the inner cities first, and William Julius Wilson, who was a professor at Chicago and I was there, wrote a book about it called The Truly Disadvantaged, how it had destroyed deindustrialization, had destroyed inner city America, black America, and very few people cared. And then Deaton and Case wrote the same book about what was going on in white America 20 years later. And they used the same language, despair, deaths, disillusionment. It's affected communities, black, white, Latino, with the middle class seeming more and more out of reach. When people say, why are folks upset about the economy? And I don't think it has to do just with the price of uh, goods or inflation. It has to do with the sense that the American dream seems out of reach for too many. While it seems possible in places like Silicon Valley, Seattle, New York, and Chicago. And Trump has come along and married economic nostalgia with racial nostalgia. He said, before Rose family got here in the 1960s, my parents came from India. Grandfather was involved in India's independence movement with Gandhi. My parents came in the 70s, was born in Philadelphia, grew up before Rose family got here. Things used to be better for you. Now they're not so good, and the country has become more diverse. See, if we want to build a multiracial democracy, we have to convince people that the future demographics are going to help them and their kids build economic hope and economic opportunity. I often talk about the economy and caring about communities left out or caring about people left out, but it's not just about a job. It's not just about the economy. It is the only pathway to bringing this country together, to finding some sense of healing, to find, finding some sense of common purpose. Yes, Democrats, we have to win, but we have to be better than just winning. We need to deserve victory. We need to deserve victory. We need to offer a vision that is going to bring this country together. And that's what the Economic Bill of Rights is all about. There were two aspects to Roosevelt's brilliance in the 1930s and 1940s. One was a recognition that we needed an agenda where everyone has a fair start starting spot. That's all that the Economic Bill of Rights is. You know, I meet all these folks in Silicon Valley, self-made, they claim. And that's because they're not Donald Trump. They didn't inherit millions of dollars. And yeah, compared to Donald Trump, they're probably all self-made. A few people get millions of dollars to speculate. But you know what, all they, what they all had? If you look at the backgrounds of these entrepreneurs who made it, they didn't have fabulously wealthy parents, but they all had health care. They all had a great education. They all had a degree which 
okay, some of them dropped out of college, but they knew that they could go and get a job if their startups failed. When all an economic bill of rights is saying is, give everyone in this country the chance that this country gave me. A son of working class, middle class, son of work, middle class parents. I got to go to a good public school. That's what a right education is. You know why America led in the post-World War II era? Because unlike Europe, 80% of Americans went to high school, whereas Europe had it only 20 or 30% because high school was seen as only for the elite in Europe. We said no in our free high school movement. High school is for everyone. A right to education means from the time someone is born to as much education as you're going to get, we should educate the American public. It's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And we've got to stop pitting the working class or those who don't have college degrees with those who do have college degrees. Because I'll tell you something, building a modern factory requires a PhD and it requires an electrician and it requires a plumber, it requires all of us. We need to have an economic vision that says whether you want vocational education, whether you want technical education, whether you want to become a PhD, we're for you. We're for all kinds of education to build America. And we need to be for healthcare, not just because it is a right, but because it is the way we're going to keep our businesses and manufacturing here. Why did they leave? Why did wages stagnate? Instead of giving people raises on wages, our businesses started giving the money to private insurance companies in terms of premiums. If you look at all the money that has gone to private insurance companies, that explains why wages have stagnated for the past 30 years in this country. That money could have been going in the pockets of working class Americans. And it's why our manufacturing or businesses were leaving in part because they were spending two, three times as much as companies in Germany, as companies in Europe, as countries in every other industrialized nation in the world. If we provide health care for everyone, not only do we give them a fair shot starting out, we also make it competitive for our businesses and our economy to succeed. And we need universal child care in this country. $10 a day is what they have in Canada. You know when France had universal child care? A hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. And today, if you're the daughter of someone in France, a janitor in France or a billionaire in France, you all go to the same Ecole system. And when you're six years old, you start at the same place. You know, I've got kids, and that my kid five and seven, they have so many opportunities and vocabulary that they're already privileged compared to kids at five and seven who don't have that chance. What about self-made in this country if you don't even give someone a chance from the time they're toddlers to the time they're in kindergarten? Universal child care is saying we believe every kid in America should start with the same opportunity. Yeah, when they're six, it's going to diverge. You're the kid of a billionaire, you're going to have a better shot. But what about just when you're in kindergarten? How about starting off at the same place? Those are the things that are an economic bill of rights. It's not some abstraction. See, Roosevelt believed in free enterprise. He believed in the dynamism of free enterprise, but he didn't believe in free enterprise for the connected and the privileged. He said true free enterprise was an investment in people. If you give people health care, if you give people education, if you give people an opportunity for a job, if you invest in them, then they will have the opportunity to pursue the American dream. And that's what we need to do. And then to take Roosevelt's production agenda to have the government partner with the private sector to have new industry, new steel, new aluminum, new semiconductors in places that were deindustrialized, in Downriver, Michigan, in Ashtabula County, Ohio, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. You're not going to get there through corporate tax cuts. You're not going to get there through cutting legal immigration. Donald Trump, there's one line. One line in attacking Donald Trump, he had four years. Where are the new factories? That's it. Where are the new jobs? Where, where, are, where is the economic renaissance in Galesburg, in Johnstown, in Downriver, Michigan? You know why he couldn't do it? Because he didn't do what Hamilton, Lincoln, FDR did. 
which was use the federal government to invest with labor unions and companies to put up factories and new industries in places that were left behind. The blueprint is there. The blueprint is there. And how, and let me end with this, how we add to that blueprint. What Roosevelt missed, because no one is perfect, when he interned Japanese Americans and when he did not have the New Deal extend to African Americans. You see, we have an opportunity in our moment in history to take the best of Hamilton, to take the best of Lincoln, to take the best of FDR, to add to this technology revolution with AI, new technology that's going to allow us to lower costs and provide things like healthcare in ways that we couldn't do before, to allow us to have productivity to compete with China and Mexico, but to do something even grander. And that is to live up to the vision that Frederick Douglass had. Douglass, in 1869, 20 years after being enslaved, speaks up not for those who are enslaved, but in his, one of his major speeches, speech, speaks up for the right of Chinese citizens to immigrate to the United States. And people say to Frederick Douglass, why should we let Chinese people come to the United States? They're going to corrupt the culture. They're going to corrupt the, 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 the religion. And Douglass says, no, they won't. In the free year of America, the best ideas and best traditions will thrive. And the ones that aren't the best will fall by the wayside. And we will become a composite nation, a nation of all nations. That was Frederick Douglass in 1869. When I heard J.D. Vance talking about his cemetery plot in eastern Kentucky and talking about how his wife, Usha, who happens to be Hindu-American like me, was going to be buried on the cemetery plot. I didn't just think, does she have a choice in the matter? <laughs> Hindus believe in cremation. But I thought, what, what a impoverished vision of America. See, the vision of America that I believe in, that Lincoln believed in, that FDR believed, that believed in, that Frederick Douglass believed in, was a vision of America where it did not matter whether you could trace your heritage back to the Mayflower or, like me, you were the son of immigrants. What mattered was your commitment to what J.D. Vance dismissed as abstractions. Those abstractions is how Lincoln started his Gettysburg Address, a nation conceived not in generations, but in liberty and dedicated to the proposition of equality. See, in Lincoln's time and Douglass's time, you had to be able to trace your heritage back to the American founding to be American. And Lincoln had a problem. He said, how could we have German Americans and Irish Americans be American if they could not trace their heritage back to the founding? And so Lincoln gave the famous speech where he said, you are flesh of the flesh, blood of the blood of the founders, if you believe in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, that there's an electric cord that, 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 that links you to those founders of liberty. My friends, we are the most diverse place in the history of the world. We are at the most diverse moment in the history of the world. And if we provide economic opportunity to every person, if we provide health care, education, child care, if we have an economic development strategy to build economic opportunity in places like Galesburg, Illinois, that we can do what even FDR couldn't do, which is to build a composite nation, a nation of all nations, where every person's talent is on the field and we build an America that makes history in becoming the first cohesive multiracial democracy. That is the vision of a 21st century Bill of Rights. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Terry Siegel from the great uh, the expanse of Chicago land from brilliant corner of Northwest Indiana. The next speaker is Anthony Flacaveno. Anthony Flacaveno from the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative, the co-author of the Rural New Deal. And I actually think from working directly with uh, Anthony Flacaveno, all I can say is that um, I believe his life's work has made him a more eloquent commentator on American society with words that need to be heard by everyone in our society about where we sit as a nation, how we view each other as a nation, and our possibilities of the nation. Take it away, Anthony Flacaveno. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alan. I'm in a, I live in southwestern Virginia, uh, part of the state most people don't think about when they think of Virginia. It's sandwiched between West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Um, I'm going to start. So the Rural New Deal, there are copies of the Rural New Deal on the table right next to registration. Pick one up. I was very, very proud and pleased to work with Alan as well as with Dave Alba uh, of PDA to produce this, and we now just... Uh, a week ago came out with a user's guide to make it a little bit easier to disseminate, to use, etc. But let me start with a story. I ran for Congress twice in the 9th District of Virginia, which until the early 2000s was very competitive for Democrats at state and federal level. It's now between 75 and 80 percent red. It was a dramatic transition. First time I ran was 2012. I was going to a little town called Lebanon, Virginia. And there was a 40 or 50 people waiting to hear me do my campaign pitch. And I was greeted when I parked my car by an old retired mine worker, a UMWA fella. He'd been to a number of my, my campaign events. This is 2012. And the first words out of his mouth were, what do you think about that bombshell Obama's dropped on us? And I paused. I wasn't sure. I thought maybe he's talking about an environmental regulation because the coal miners were always worried about that. So I just looked at him. He said, you know, gay marriage. I said, and then I remembered, oh yeah, the president had just come out like the week before in favor of same-sex marriage. So I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, the Bible says it's an abomination. And he went from there, talked about scripture, talked about how it wasn't right, wasn't natural, marriage was meant to be between a man and a woman. We're having this conversation as we're walking from my car to this little uh, restaurant where I'm going to give my talk. I let him have his say, and when he was done, I said, well, I hear what you're saying. I know it sounds strange to a lot of folks. I said, but you know, the main thing I get from the Bible is that we're supposed to love each other, but especially, especially people that are different from us, people that it's hard for us to love. That's all I said. And he chews on that for a minute, and then he says, I suppose you're right. And then he says, well, I guess they're just born that way anyway. So here's, here's the point of that story. In the span of about a hundred yard walk, this old retired miner, who I'm sure didn't even have a high school education, went from homosexuality is an abomination before God, that's where he started, to that's just who some people are and we're supposed to love them all the same, for one reason, he trusted me. He trusted me because he knew that I'd been working on Black Lung for minors, which was a disastrous program for a long time, for years. He trusted me because he knew I'd been arrested on the picket lines during the Pittston coal strike, just like many minors. He trusted me because he knew I'd worked on economic and jobs in the coal fields of Virginia. For progressives, those of you left in the room at this part of the day, this is our biggest deficit if we want to win back rural and working people they don't trust us. When Mike, when Mike Lux 
and Celinda Lake and all those folks who do the polls that they do, and it shows how simpatico people are with us on so many of the economic issues, like very high levels, we're with you, rural people, working people, and progressives, until you say the same position and you say it comes from a Democrat and the support plummets. There's a reason for that. They don't trust us. Now, here's the deal, and I'm going to get to the Rural New Deal real quick because I know y'all are dying for a break. The mistrust is partly the, the Limbaugh to Tucker Carlson to Trump continuum. The right has done a masterful job of painting us as out-of-touch elites, as evil, the, the whole bit, right? I mean, so give the right, give Fox News, give all those people the credit due to them. They have poisoned the minds of plenty of people. But what we don't own up to often enough is a lot of the mistrust that we have from working people and rural folks and farmers is self-inflicted, folks. It's self-inflicted. We've had, we've had plenty of policy disasters. NAFTA ain't the only one. Clinton side in the glass, the end of Glass-Steagall, which robbed trillions of dollars of wealth from ordinary people. We had 40 years where antitrust was not enforced, and the biggest corporations got bigger and bigger until Obama and Lena Khan and Jonathan Cantor started to turn that around. So, yes, the right has poisoned people's minds, but we have also failed working people and rural, and, and it's not just the policy which is what the World New deals with. It's also, we've dissed the values and the occupations of so many people. When Mike Bloomberg, who's certainly not a progressive, but he's identified as a liberal, when Mike Bloomberg tells a conference full of tech people that, oh, I could teach, this is what Bloomberg says, oh, I could teach everybody in this room how to farm. You dig a hole, you drop the seed in, you cover it with dirt, you pour water on it, that's farming. That's what Bloomberg said. I'm a farmer. God damn you, Bloomberg, that is not what farming's about. It does take gray matter, okay? So, we've had a combination of dissing people's occupations. We've had a combination of negligent and destructive policy for too long. And now the Rural New Deal comes along. It's not, policy alone is not going to save us. We have to rebuild trust on the ground. This is what the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative works on. We have to have a presence in rural communities. Democratic state parties have pulled out of rural en masse. We have to turn that around like they're doing in, in Wisconsin and North Carolina and Indiana. But ultimately we do, as Congressman Khanna said, we do need a vision. And I encourage you to look at the Rural New Deal because what it is is a very short, it's an easy read. Everybody wants one of them. It's based on 10 pillars ranging from helping farmers and fishermen and, and forest industries right through to rural health care and education. And what distinguishes it from most of the major policy platforms that progressives write is it was written by rural people, mostly, and it's based on ideas that work. It's based on 30 or so years of people working in the field, people like myself and many of my colleagues around the country who have done things to revitalize and transform small town and rural economies and communities, and that's what the Rural New Deal does. It's a bottom-up platform. So I hope you'll have a look at it, and I hope, I hope, I hope that while we're thrilled about Harris and Walls, we cannot let the Democratic Party go back to ignoring working and rural people. We've got to build, we've got to build on what Biden and Harris have started. Thanks. Okay, everybody, first of all, I, I mean what I said about Anthony Flacaveno. Anthony will be back tomorrow on the organizing panel, and I'm going to introduce Susie Shannon up to the stage right now. She is the founder of the Poverty Council, and we're going to go very fast now, and we're going to try to get through a lot of material quickly, and probably one subsection is going to get moved to tomorrow. Uh, Susie, look, the way I'm going through this, you have to understand, with the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights, there is nothing, there is no issue more important to the American people right now than the cost of living in a domicile, whether it's rental or a mortgage, and then the fact of homelessness, there has simply been no champion greater than Susie Shannon fighting on behalf of the people in that regard. And also, please, also come. Cool. 
All right, good afternoon, Chicago. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm very excited because I'm a progressive and I'm a member of PDA. Uh, I also was born in Chicago and I feel like once a Chicagoan, always a Chicagoan. Um, and uh, I'm also the founder, as uh, Alan Minsky said, of the DNC uh, Poverty Council and its current chair. Um, so I just want to give uh, you know, a layout of the picture here. We have over 500,000 people who are homeless in the United States. And in addition, there isn't anywhere that you can live in the United States um, on the salary of a full-time minimum wage job and still afford a two-bedroom apartment. And this is in the richest country of the United States. And who gets hit the hardest? Seniors on a fixed income, our low-income workers, your Starbucks barista, people who work at Target. All of those folks are having trouble making ends meet and paying over 50% of their income on rent. This is absolutely outrageous. The United States is in a homelessness and housing affordability crisis. In addition to this, our corporate landlords have been cheating. They've been using a platform called RealPage to price fix and to price gouge to make sure that our cities and neighborhoods are unaffordable so that they can amass billions of dollars in profits. And then they use that money to go against tenants. And so we need to stop this. I'm gonna tell you the situation has gotten so bad that in January in the president's State of the Union address for the first time in history, he mentioned tenants in the context of landlords who have been overpricing for rentals. That's the first time in the history of the United States and then he called for a 5% rent cap. And then he followed up in July by sending the Justice Department to Atlanta to raid the headquarters of a corporate landlord, Cortland, for price fixing. And now we see that VP Kamala Harris has echoed this, has also called for a rent cap, and this Thursday will be unveiling in her speech um, a new plan to help renters in the context of corporate landlords. There has never ever been a presidential, well, let's say there's never been a vice president or a president who has called out corporate landlords. And this is because of people like you, this is because of activists who have gone and said enough is enough, people cannot afford to live in the United States any longer. I was born here in Chicago, lived here until I was about 11, then we moved to Los Angeles. Los Angeles now is a homeless capital of the United States. We have over 41,000 people in our city who are homeless. We have over um, 75,000 people in our county who are unhoused. So I have seen you know, front and center and on the ground how terrible things are. So I would just want to talk about a few um, solutions, and this will take me 30 seconds, Alan. <laughs> we want a national rent, yeah, we, we need national rent control. Um, thank you. We are in a fight in California to expand rent control, and the corporate landlords have promised to spend $200 million against our campaign so they can continue screwing over renters. We need adaptive reuse. This is taking our empty buildings. In LA, we literally have homeless encampments living in the shadows of completely empty buildings with hundreds of units. We need to use adaptive reuse and convert those buildings to affordable housing. We can't wait to three to five years to build affordable housing. We need to put that in the pipeline, yes, but let's take our existing infrastructure and utilize that. We need to make Section 8 an entitlement program. No one should have to wait five to seven years to get a Section 8 voucher. Anyone who qualifies for that should be able to get that. Um, I also want to thank, I know that Ro Khanna spoke earlier, he actually is the co-chair of our campaign for the Yes on 33 campaign to expand rent control in California. This is really ground zero for what's happening. Um, we work closely here in Chicago with the Hope Center. They're also working um, on lifting the ban on rent control here in Illinois. I don't know if you know this, but there is a complete ban on rent control here. There's a partial ban in California. So I want to um, thank again PDA 
for all of their help on this issue. Alan Minsky has been to like almost every single one of our uh, steering committee meetings to work on these issues. And I want to thank all the PDA members for being there for us. Thank you so much. One more time, the proposition number in California? Yes, um, the proposition number in California is 33. Yes on 33. Thank you. We, we, look, we know right now in this country and in that state that will pass. Big money will be arrayed against it. Let's win this. Let everybody here give solidarity to the people in California in that bill. And now I want to introduce, also on the subject of housing, uh, Dr. Sanjay Riquet Stinson. I heard her yesterday at Rainbow Push, and being in Chicago, I thought we had to at least have a couple minutes from you. Welcome. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Sanjay Riquet Stinson of Chicago and I am the founding CEO of Matthew Health, a supported service center for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. I founded the organization 32 years ago, and we work with individuals who are homeless, who are unsheltered and unhoused. We're located on the south side of Chicago. We're located in one of the richest areas, which is the Bronzeville community. And like my um, partner here, we need rent control because we have 73 units of supportive housing right now, where the rent for individuals who experience homelessness is almost $1,400. And, and the mental illness that we are seeing on our street, the mental illness that is not being addressed, let me tell your story. There's an individual, I'm going to call him Jason. Jason was um, has been homeless for the last seven years, but eight years ago he was a truck driver. Because of mental illness and partial blindness where he can only see 20% of his vision, he's now homeless. He's not only homeless, but every individual shelter has moved them away or kicked them out because of the mental challenges. Jason cannot even go to a hotel without someone trying to put him out. Why am I telling you this? Because homelessness is a crisis in the United States. Homelessness, and I keep saying this, is a crisis in the United States. In Chicago, 68,000 individuals on any given night is experiencing homelessness. And our courts have criminalized homelessness. How do we criminalize someone for sleeping or trying to sleep? We need to get to the solutions to this issue. Rent control is one of the, um, one of the ones that we are fighting. But what we also fight is mental illness, attacking the individuals. Because individuals that experience homelessness, they're not all substance abuse. They're not all um, have used drugs. Many of them have experienced mental illness. How many know that we are all we say one paycheck, but I say a half a paycheck away from experiencing homelessness ourselves. How many of you know someone in your family that is homeless or couch surfing or, or sleeping on someone's couch? That is homelessness. How many know that last year in February, 25,000 children are experiencing homelessness in our city? We need to do something. We need to speak to our legislators. We need to talk up because there's no one that should be without housing. Housing should not be a choice. Housing has to be a right. Section 8 takes 7 to 10 years. We should not have a Section 8 program that's taken 17, 10 years. It takes five years to develop affordable housing, and affordable housing is an $1,800 one-bedroom apartment. Who can afford that when you're on a low income? So I encourage you, I encourage you to speak to your legislature and to speak to all of those as we eradicate homelessness in all of our cities. Thank you. I think you can understand why I heard a voice down at Rainbow Push yesterday that had to be brought onto the national stage when we're in Chicago. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, up next, we're going to see a video right now because the next subject up is free public colleges and universities. Again, every one of those other rich democracies, technological industrial societies has it, folks. By the way, it doesn't, you don't have to be a German citizen to go there, it's free. Just a little tip there, but not here. It's affordable, very much so. We're a rich society, and Higher Education Labor United is the organization we are partnered with at PDA to work with. Take it away.
Hello, Progressive Central. Hello, Progressive Democrats of America. And especially warm solidarity greetings to the members of the mighty, mighty Chicago Teachers Union. My name is Mia MacGyver. I'm joining you from Los Angeles, where I teach at UCLA and I serve as chair of Higher Ed Labor United. Higher Education Labor United, or HELU, is a nationwide coalition of 50 local unions representing more than 110,000 higher education workers at community colleges, at state universities, and at private institutions. HELU members maintain campuses, feed students, teach classes, staff offices, undertake research, care for patients, and do so much more. HELU is building a wall-to-wall -wall and coast-to-coast -coast movement to fight against privatization and reclaim American higher education as a public good. We're fighting for debt-free, tuition-free, fully publicly funded higher ed with thriving wages, secure jobs, fair and equitable labor practices, and academic freedom. I'm so happy that my fellow leader in Hilu, Danielle Aubert, is there with you to talk more about our work, why we need a free public higher education, and Hilu's plans to achieve it. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> hello, Chicago. Um, I'm Danielle Aubert. I'm a professor of graphic design, and I'm the past president of Wayne Academic Union, AAUP AFT 6075 at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Um, Go Detroit. <laughs> um, I'm also currently the secretary treasurer of the AAUP, which is the American Association of University Professors, and I'm here speaking today um, as a member of HELU, Higher Ed Labor United. So I think we know, or we've heard a bit today, that the path to building a prosperous middle class in this country is through our college and university campuses. There are four million higher ed workers from college towns to eds and med cities who form the backbone of communities in every state in this country. The colleges and universities here are known to be among the best in the world, but today we're struggling. I think anybody who's closely associated with the, uh, higher ed knows this. We should be, in higher education, we should be propelling opportunity for the working class, for students, for workers, for our communities. But we can't fulfill that mission when we have less and less funding, public funding, uh, for our institutions, when our tuition and fees keep going up, when it's falling on the backs of the students to keep these institu institutions running. Um, we can't fulfill that mission when the majority of the faculty are contingent faculty who are working from contract to contract. They don't know if they're gonna have an appointment to teach those next semester. We can't fulfill that mission when campus staff jobs are cut, outsourced, or turned into at-will positions with no or low benefits. So both workers and students are experiencing more and more precarity. Students have to withdraw from classes because they can't pay their tuition. The professors are, people are leaving the profession. Staff, there's high staff turnover at a lot of our schools. How can the students learn when they're taking on mountains of debt, when they're working three jobs to try to pay their rent, um, when they're facing housing insecurity, which is a real issue for a lot of students in Detroit and in Chicago, um, in California, everywhere. So this overall kind of precarity has had a chilling effect on our ability to maintain campuses as sites of free inquiry, of free expression, of debate. We have faculty, staff, and students who have been fighting attacks on DEI in their states. We see that especially in Florida, in Texas. Um, we've been, we have been organizing against program closures, setting up emergency funds for our students challenging overreach by uni university boards of trustees and high-paid administrators? How can we teach our students to participate in democracy when they are getting arrested, kicked out, brutalized by campus police for, for speaking out, in, when our core syllabi in some states are being scrutinized by people who are more concerned about corporate donors and about Wall Street lenders than they are about the freedom to learn or what's actually being taught in those classes. So we formed Higher Ed Labor United in 2021 to build a fighting higher ed labor movement. We envision a future where higher education is treated and funded as a social good, a universal right. We envision a US higher education system that works for and is led by workers, by students, by the communities that we serve. We envision a system that secures our nation's democratic future and serves as a vehicle for addressing inequities. And to achieve this, we need federal funding for, higher, for public higher education. 
And we need that funding to be tied to fair labor practices. So that means high levels of full-time, secure, in-source employment for all higher ed workers across. And when we, see, when we say wall-to-wall, -wall, we mean everybody that works in the university, from faculty, maintenance staff, campus workers, everyone. We also need to radically expand access to higher education. We need tuition-free public higher education four year, at four-year institutions. We need to end student debt once and for all. We need to remove barriers for undocumented and international students and workers. We also need federal research funding to support innovation across all disciplines. Um, we need to support minority-serving institutions, HBCUs, HSIs. And we need our colleges and universities to remain spaces for exploration, for debate, for free expression. And we need these to continue to be the engines of social mobility that they have been and that we know that they can be, to continue to provide the backbone for a prosperous middle class and a vibrant democratic future. We know that another university is possible, and with our students, with the communities we serve, and with all of you, we will get there. Thank you. And we just heard from Daniel Aubert. And um, what is your, come, come up for a second more, what is your position uh, in the academic world? Well, I am actually moving to Chicago, so I'll be at University of Chicago teaching graphic design, <laughs> but I'm on um, AAUP, Secretary Treasurer. We just have a new group of people that have been elected, and we're really looking to forge a fighting union through the AAUP, through AFT, so... Thank you so much. And look, um, again, uh, we are honored to be on the steering committee of HELU, uh, Higher Education Labor United, and we fully, as PDA, understand, given the vibrancy of the labor movements, why it's central to support organized labor as the guiding organizations in this effort to get free college that we can have in our society, and it will be a blessing. Thank you so much, Danielle. The next person I'm going to introduce is somebody, and let me give a little bit of framing. After we hear from Teresa Cordova, we're gonna hear from Senator Vincent Ford. Now, we had the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. We had, and we're running behind schedule, and I apologize for this. Housing, such a huge issue, clearly is a subset of that, one of the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. The whole rural new deal, the Southern strategy, and what Teresa is here to talk about, relate to, um, relate to, and we're gonna to have to carry one video over to tomorrow from indigenous communities because we're running late because that can also fit into the environmental portion of what we'll talk about. But PDA is committed to producing these four policy platforms, only one which is fully worked out, the Rural New Deal. But we want to have a southern progressive strategy because of the concentrated poverty. We want to develop with comrades like Teresa Cordova, such a brilliant um, intellectual and researcher and just also you know, an effect organizer, because I also know you from this whole world, uh, over at the Great Cities Institute, the University of Illinois Chicago, to develop a temp 21st template for urban renewal to address the deeply entrenched poverty that exists like the wallpaper in American society my whole life in the urban core. And then, of course, indigenous communities, and we'll talk about them tomorrow. We're behind schedule, so that just gets deferred until tomorrow. And so with that, Teresa Cordova from the Great Cities Institute, welcome. Well, how are all the troopers in the room? Yeah, 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 yeah. Such a great honor to be here. Um, so what I like to do when I speak is lay some context. And so first, and some of the context I'm gonna lay is very much related to what the uh, previous panel was talking about, um, including the representative and some of the other speakers who talked about uh, NAFTA and neoliberalism and so on. So I'm gonna kind of give some context to as to why we have so the poverty that we have right now, why we have some of the structured inequality. And then what I'm gonna, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about two types of, of, of strategies, two sets of strategies. So I'm gonna go through, I have five to seven minutes, I'm probably gonna use the full seven, I'm gonna, uh, but I won't go over. And so I'm gonna go through a number of slides very quickly. Um, and the first one that I'm gonna go through um, is, to, um, is to first of all highlight the New Deal itself, and you've heard the, in that previous panel people talk about that. So one of the things that we saw uh, with this is, the, is this idea of the role of the state really shifted support to its citizens, and it promoted the public good. I mean, I think that's one of the most important things that came out of that New Deal, right? We, we have this sense that the state has a responsibility, promotes the public good. 
We saw a lot of investments in infrastructure and in public works program. Uh, we saw coalition, excuse me, creation of jobs, which was really important, where the state had a role in creating jobs. And we saw a number of really creative uh, financial institutions. Um, things changed once we got out of World War II. There was, there was this period of social benefits and so on. Um, uh, but one of the things that we also started to see, particularly uh, beginning in the mid-1970s, was the beginnings of what we refer to as the global economy. Um, and during this time with, these, with these f the global elite, economic elites, this current regime, we started to see a reduction in the value of labor. Um, social benefits started to be removed and, and privatization of government functions. These all undermined right, the values of the New Deal. But they, they are the kinds of things that begun, began in the mid-1970s, but they really got manifested through Reagan. You've heard several people mention Reagan today, for example, and it continues right, to today, and I still continue to be amazed about these lasting impacts. So there was a reshaping of the global economies. And NAFTA, for example, didn't just impact workers here. It impacted workers in Mexico. So NAFTA really wasn't good for people uh, on, on, on any of the, of the three countries that were involved in it, but it was a, during a period of structural adjustment programs, trade liberalization, market expansion, and deregulation of capital flows. And then uh, lastly, the characteriz characterization that we saw was this movement towards transnational power, away from national governments, away from people, and towards the transnational corporations themselves. Um, so I'm not going to read all of this. You can take a, a glance at it here, but I wanted to highlight some of the characteristics that it, of this of this e global economic restructuring. Uh, we saw increasing profit from the production process. That's part of why you saw international division of labor. It's, it's why we saw the rise of part-time labor, the deunionization de or the breaking of unions and so on. So there were a number of characteristics, the feminization of labor. So we have the, the trying to get more money from the production process. The second thing we saw was a push to withdraw support of the, the withdrawal of the state. So we used, you know, under the New Deal, we had a support by the state of people's social welfare. With this period, we now see the withdrawal of the state, and we start seeing the cutting of right this of this floor. Um, and so that was characterized by a whole number of things, and also including deregulation. So not only did you not have the social, the service, the social goods, right? And so uh, you also had the, the decrease in deregulation. And thirdly, we started to see much more international economic activities. Global capital flowed more, more easily, uh, unlike the flow of, of migration capital. So again, you, you, could, you could read some of that. So the next slide then. Um, oh shoot, I'm sorry those came out so small up there. On my, on my slideshow, they came out bigger. Um, so. I, but on the, uh, on the outcome of the, of the restructuring, um, part of what we, what we saw here is what we've been talking about today. Loss of jobs, right, through this restructuring. Reduced wages, higher chronic, this is what's important, chronic un unemployment. And a lot of the work that we've done with youth joblessness, but one of the things we showed it is concentrated and it's chronic. Again, that erosion of the social contract, the privatization of government functions, and this is something very important, the abandonment of the common good, right? This is something we lost, right? And this is what characterized the New Deal, a sense of the common good. We lost that through, direct, to, through deregulation, through the removal of social safety nets, through cuts in corporate taxes, and so on. And then we saw with this internationalization of activities, we saw the destruction of local economies. So what were some of those uh, impacts? inadequate income, higher costs, debt bondage. You all know, right, what a big issue this is for our communities, right? So many people are facing large-scale debt. The erosion of social fabric of households, right? Is the right of drug and alcohol use, tensions around, around being, a, of being able to have enough uh, funding. I was watching a frontline special, two families that they followed from 1991 to 2024, and what they went through during this whole period of of economic restructuring and, of course, impacts on our neighborhoods. Uh, instability and cuts uh, in, in access to goods, the penetration and destruction of local economies. Uh, next slide. And so in the U.S. and globally, uh, uh, we saw then the, these poles of opulence and misery, destruction of our natural resources, and the state being continually undermined. 
as a means of protecting the collective good, while democracy itself gets undermined. Next slide, please. So what do we have here also? Destabilized neighbors, neighborhoods. Uh, restructured economies resulted in restructured cities and in turn the neighborhoods. Disinvestment, abandonment of capital uh, from neighborhoods, from once thriving neighborhoods. This resulted in job loss, the loss of anchor institutions in our neighborhoods. Neighborhoods became sites of gentrification, displacing lower income residents. Uh, the disproportionate impacts of toxic contamination and so on. So in this next slide, you just take, for example, the city of Chicago, where I think uh, one of the previous speakers in the panel talked about factory cities and the impact, what happened when all those factory jobs left. Look at these two uh, images. On the left, these are jobs in Chicago in 1970, manufacturing jobs. And then look at it in 2015. All right, so those are manufacturing jobs, which has a high multiplier effect. And so that means, think of all the other jobs that we lost. So we went from uh, 688,000 manufacturing jobs in Chicago at its height down to about 63,000 jobs today, right? That's just the manufacturing jobs. That doesn't, that doesn't even include the impact. Um, pretty dramatic. Um, next slide. So this is just a quick flash of a neighborhood. Um, next slide. But one of the things we now see, though, is this apparatus of ideology that creates myths and scapegoats. Who do we first blame? Let's blame the immigrants. Uh, they get attacked. Let's blame uh, government overspending. The problem is the government spending too much. They gotta cut, cut taxes, but whose taxes are they really cutting? It's not ours. Um, and then this idea of this American exceptionalism. Um, next slide, please. So which, but what, so, um, yes, yeah, so what should we be talking about instead? We should be talking about good paying jobs with opportunities for advancement, not just growth and stockholder earnings. Everything seems to be about stockholder earnings. We need to come back to the conversation around the public good, right? Fair taxation policies, not just government bashing. And we need to have more local control of our local economies. So what are some of the policy issues then that we care about? Next slide. So industrial policy is one. Um, Dan Sweeney over here, uh, he's Manufacturing Renaissance, North Branch Works, there's several of us and who are in coalition to promote in the city the idea that we should have an industrial policy. Uh, that's one. Next one is corporate and income tax structure policies that needs to be addressed. The whole issue around the profitability of the prison industrial complex. We need to have regulation of financial markets. We need to reduce carbon emissions. And we need to, this whole free trade agreement stuff is problematic. And then, of course, we need to get back to having more control at our neighborhood level. Okay, again, uh, if you can put the next slide up, both uh, more images. Just take a look at these real quickly. I'm not going to read them all one by one. But these are some of the strategies to address inadequate income, higher costs, debt bondage, erosion of so social fabric of households and neighborhoods. But you see the range of kinds of things that we need to really be doing. These are the kinds of, so we can get very specific in some of the strategies that we need to address. And these are the kinds of things, Ellen, that can also be in that, in the, in the Bill of Rights in terms of you know, strat strategies that we can employ. In the next slide, there's a few more examples. Um, and by the way, my original slideshow doesn't have all this black background, I just didn't transfer, but mine was real pretty. But anyway, um, not the black, actually, not the, anyway. Um, strategies that rebuild communities with increasing opportunities, so workforce training, small-scale manufacturing. Manufacturing is not dead, uh, right, Dan? It's not dead. Uh, advanced manufacturing is something that's very big. Uh, policy reform and then entrepreneurship. So uh, next slide. So I just want to now end by talking about a couple of um, areas of strategies. One is industrial policy. And the second one is community development. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is what an industrial policy should include. And again, there's several of us in coalition around this. It should include the training and vocation. It should include succession strategies for ownership. We're losing a lot of our ma small manufacturing because they don't have succession plans, right? And so we should be help. We more and more of retirees should be moving into into um, being able to have succession plans. Um, and so that's an area we've worked on. The geographic dispersion of, in multiple corridors, we're concentrating too much of 
our industry in certain neighborhoods are bearing the impact. Um, we need clean manufacturing, and then we need cleanup and mitigation of contaminated sites. We're also losing a lot of our industrial land. We have to watch out for that too. So next, next slide, and I'm just gonna let you look at this one uh, real quickly. Um, more opportunities uh, in manufacturing and in industri industrial can't be dirty. We do need a just transition to help those workers who might lose from the dirty uh, kind of uh, industries, help them transition into the cleaner industries. Um, and, this, and then we need to get back to this notion of good corporate citizenship. Right, um, and which is, which was flee fleeing, right? But we had it there for a little bit. Okay, in the next area, and I just have a couple more slides left. In the area of community development, okay, there's a lot of people doing work around this. And uh, if I were just gonna focus on one thing, I might have just focused on this area to give you an idea of all the different things that are going on, uh, it, not only in Chicago, even in the South, um, different parts of the country with respect to the following. So community development corporations do a lot of work at the neighborhood level. Um, and it's very difficult and very tedious work. But there's, so there's community development corporations is something very important strategy. Small business incubators, I'm a huge proponent of that, had a role in developing one. Cooperatives, right? This is something um, that was big during, it's actually been, in a lot of our cultures, it's actually very old, very old, not a new idea. Uh, been around a long time. They were big also even in the 30s, and we need to get back to the idea of cooperatives, community credit unions, community development financial institutions. These are all strategies. So we can go to the next slide. Um, doing community development, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end within, uh, within the next 45 seconds here. So doing community development is very difficult. It takes grit. It takes being able to understand the realities. I've done development. It's very, very detailed. It's very tedious. It's very hard, but, you, but it's necessary. Uh, Old-fashioned coalition building. You know, we need to start stop looking at how we're different or how we're not correct and actually find ways to come together. And we need the new generation of change makers that really understand the complexity of technology, policy, economics. We need multi-generational leaders, and we need to leverage resources. We don't love these resources enough. Next image, one of the best examples of a cooperative is Land O'Lakes. I didn't realize that Land O'Lakes is a cooperative. They've been around for a very long time, very successful. The other image up there, is, which you can't see very well on this slide, is a, one of their factories in Wisconsin. Next slide, small business incubators, uh, credit unions. One of the effective uh, community credit unions is a, a, an organization called inclusive.org. And the thing about credit unions is, is that they're, they're cooperatives. They function as cooperatives. You can get lower, lower loans and, and uh, lower uh, interest rate loans. Um, and then this last, um, um, this, uh, let's see, next one. This one here, I really wanted to highlight this one because the part of what it takes to do development, whether it's housing or whether it's small business enterprise, you know, in other words, what I've been arguing for is community development, rebuilding neighborhoods that have been disinvested. The, sh the community development financial institutions, harnessing capital to make these things possible. And if you want to look up one, a really effective, effective, that has uh, uh, community development financial institution that has leveraged millions of dollars to do uh, mission-driven and community-based financing, uh, look up five points. Um, fantastic, fantastic leadership and fantastic organization. So let me now conclude with my final slide. Um, next, first one, we do need that Economic Bill of Rights. Yeah. We need government responsibility. Back to the primacy of the collective good. Collectivism, not individualism, right? And you know, uh, Baha, I mean, Baha with the individualism, you cannot opt out, opt out of community. We need that collectivism. Um, and so with that, uh, Viva New Deal. And uh, thank you. It's been an honor to speak before you. You see, the thing that Teresa doesn't know about me yet is I love this stuff. I love, we went through every component of rural policy with Anthony Flacaveno. I think I have found my urban Anthony Flacaveno. I look forward to working with you together, and PDA will be promoting 
packages with you together. We'll be, let's have a meal. We're going to have a meal in the next few days and build it. There we go. Thank you. I want this. Okay, so um, I was mentioning how we were filling out the Economic um, Bill of Rights. I didn't say last time that, of course, the higher free public education was part of that. We heard that from Hilu. The 21st Century Urban Bill of Rights, right here. And now Senator Vincent Ford, one of my heroes, truly. One of, again, the great people that I've met since I've had this job. And he is going to talk about our progressive Southern strategy. What makes this development of the Southern strategy all the more critical is with all of the attacks on the working class, middle class over the last 50 years, uh, what some people have called a hollowing out of the middle class, uh, uh, it's been even more so in the South. The South is poorer, uh, and uh, with the attacks on the middle class, it's become uh, even poorer in the sense that in this, there are numbers that have been released in the last few weeks which show that uh, income inequality in the South has gotten worse here in Georgia, here in Atlanta. So uh, any uh, uh, Southern strategy will have to take into consideration at the development of an economic agenda. It has to be at the center of, any, uh, of, a, of a progressive strategy in this country, and even more so here in the South. Uh, you know, this is a time where 50% of families uh, cannot sustain even a $400 emergency in a month, or survive a health crisis would be catastrophic for uh, the overwhelming number of families. So a Southern strategy has to have its core an economic agenda um, that appeals both to the black and white working class. Um, you know, families, as we speak, can cannot fathom because of the economic inequalities and the poverty that they'll ever be able to buy a house. Send your children to college for an education. Buy a car, buy a new car, or even afford a used car. Child care is uh, an onerous burden uh, for so many families throughout the country, but even more so in the South because of its history of uh, more intense and devastating poverty. Um, there has to be an economic agenda which uh, called for uh, the improvement of the Affordable Care Act, approaching on all the way up to and including uh, Medicare for All, universal health care, as we are the United States is the only outlier uh, in the industrialized world that doesn't have uh, universal health care. And as a matter of fact, I will, it's important for me to say that here in Georgia, uh, the governor had, along with many other southern governors, have fought to prevent uh, not only the expansion of uh, the Affordable Care Act, but also uh, have stopped summer feeding programs for children. Uh, so that's the state of affairs here in the South. But we have to expand the Affordable Care Act. Uh, uh, the minimum wage, we've got to achieve the minimum wage, that has to be a serious and I think foremost uh, position for progressives in the South in particular, the uh, creation of a minimum wage uh, and uh, even a living wage, and that may have to come from Washington, but it has to be a fight on the battlefield here in uh, here in the South. Um, uh, the issue of child care is obvious. Uh, you know, uh, uh, transportation, one of the things that we have here, particularly in the rural areas of the South, here in Georgia, is isolated communities where people who want jobs can't get to the jobs that are available. Uh, so we have a great deal of work to do but 
the summons strategy has to include at its core an economic strategy. You could have all the other things. You could have great candidate quality. You could have a great digitized contact campaign. But if you don't have these issues at the core of what we're doing as progressives in the South, we will, I fear, still be in a retrograde situation. So that is at the core of what I'm thinking as far as the Southern strategy is concerned. And I look forward to working with PDA and others to develop that. It's absolutely necessary that in this next cycle we develop a Southern strategy in order to get on the battlefield in the South. I'm just thrilled to see North Carolina's in the mix. Even Florida is going to be maybe a challenging spot. But to have North Carolina back in the mix, Georgia back in the mix, it tells us that a Southern strategy is something that is a credible and important struggle that we have to be involved in. One important thing that has to be a part of the Southern strategy is the growth of union power. If there's going to be a progressive movement in the South, there has to be a strengthened union movement that is progressive. And the goal, the primary goal, I think, along with raising the minimum wage, has to be doing away with the right to work. The right to work would be a good right not to work. But that has to be a goal that we implement in Congress, that we fight for in Congress, is to make sure that right to work is defeated and taken from us. I have been a long-time advocate for collective bargaining here in Georgia. And I think it's about time we start working on that issue in a robust and strong way. Senator Vincent Ford. And now I welcome Erica Andiola. And Erica Andiola is a longtime ally of progressive Democrats of America. And she's with us right now. And she is going to tell us about progressive immigration policy. And Erica is coming up momentarily. And Chuy Garcia, if he can come to the stage, that would be great. Represent Chuy Garcia. Maybe Representative Garcia, if you want to go first, in case you have to get out of here. And then Erica can comment on you. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry we're behind schedule. No problem. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to join Progressive Democrats of America following a great blockbuster panel on the Economic Bill of Rights and why we need a contemporary Bill of Rights to uplift working people and marginalize people and unite working class folks all over our country. And yes, take back majority in Congress and of course, keep the White House. I am uh, very proud to say uh, welcome to Chicago and for folks uh, listening wherever they may be. Uh, part of the reason that I extend a hearty welcome to everyone is that Chicago is the country's oldest sanctuary city and running strong, welcoming and recognizing the contributions of immigrants who have come here, who are coming here, and certainly appreciating how immigrants help power this country and make it what it is, and of course take it to that uh, next level. I represent the 4th Congressional District here in Chicagoland and proud to say that it has the highest concentration of immigrants in the Midwest, uh, underscoring all of the contributions that people make 
And of course, I am proud because I too am an immigrant, having arrived in Chicago in 1965, three years before the Democratic National Convention in 1968, which took place right near where I was living at that time. Uh, the topic we're discussing today, of course, is uh, immigration. Uh, it's a subject near and dear and personal uh, to me and the people that I represent in uh, Congress and people who need relief from Congress all over the country in whatever state you <clears throat> may have uh, come from. Uh, uh, this, my story is not uh, unique, uh, as a matter of fact, and the constituents that I represent are deeply affected by here. Just want to make a few opening remarks and, of course, look forward to the participation of my uh, colleague, friend, and ally uh, from the Southwest, uh, Erica, who will also uh, chime in. But I just want to underscore where things are at right now uh, in terms of immigrants and the topic and issue and controversy around immigration. Uh, how we got here, uh, Trump has weaponized uh, immigration, uh, turning it into a tool of fear and uh, division. Uh, Democrats, I think, have an important responsibility of standing up uh, for our values and traditions in this country, things like compassion and fairness and inclusion, while, of course, addressing the challenges that our communities face. Uh, Chicago, in that regard, is certainly leading the way. Uh, while we have a proud uh, history, uh, I am very concerned that I as we approach the November election, that uh, we have fallen into a messaging challenge and potentially a trap, and that is by highlighting and underscoring that our solution to the complex immigration challenge that we're facing, that is unprecedented migrations from countries that only five years ago did not, uh, we did not think w would be uh, seeing the exodus of people from their uh, lands and winding up uh, at the border. Uh, but certainly saying that uh, the bill that stalled in the Senate that calls for further militarization of the border uh, continuing to dismantle our coveted uh, asylum system and by simply adding more border guards at the border that that will solve our problem. We shouldn't kid ourselves. The drivers of migration uh, include uh, the COVID pandemic and the ravaging impacts on countries that have seen people come to our uh, southern border and to other countries in the hemisphere and other countries overseas as well, like Spain and other European uh, countries. Uh, it isn't likely to end until we work with those countries and progressive legislators. I just returned uh, two weeks ago from the founding of the Pan-American uh, Congress, a group of progressive legislators from eight countries, including Canada and the U.S. and Mexico and other countries, the type of multilateral collaboration that we need to get to the real root of the problem and what causes, what forces people to come to our borders and to other countries, of course. So we have an important uh, uh, challenge there and I think a responsibility to hold the line. Uh, it is very important that leaders be held accountable and ensure that policies reflect our uh, humanitarian and progressive values. And this means not shying away from tough conversations, especially within our party. Uh, I hear from my neighbors and family members who are frustrated at the lack of progress by Congress to enact meaningful immigration reform. Uh, and to that point, just want you to know that when we had the majority in Congress, we enacted two pieces of legislation out of the House. They stalled 
in the Senate, potentially providing over three million people the ability to legalize their status and have a pathway to citizenship. They included uh, the Dream and Promise Act, where three classes of folks that have been waiting in line for a long, long time, some for as many as 30 or more uh, years, uh, the DACA class of young people, uh, or so-called dreamers that many people uh, refer to, and folks with DED status. So uh, I wanted to lay that out because those are the challenges that we're facing. My greatest concern in this moment is that if we continue to message that the Senate bill is a solution, when we win a majority in the House and if we keep the Senate and we have a Democratic uh, president in the White House by the name of Kamala Harris, how we return to having an honest, real conversation about why the country will continue to need immigrants, why the country has a debt both a moral and an economic imperative and responsibility to enact fair immigration reform that is inclusive of at least 11 million people in our country and what the future will look like as we reestablish a system of asylum that has been one of the things that separates our country from countries in the rest of the world. So that is uh, what, in terms of the immigration uh, topic, uh, is on my mind as we approach this convention, as we move toward November, and then, of course, after November, when we'll have a majority in the House and we seek to move legislation to do the right thing by all of our immigrant heritage in our country. Thank you. In case Erica says something, Erica Andiola, the convention is yours. We are lacking the humanity of the immigrant community. We are so focused on the politics. 
We are to focus on the narrative that the media has for us and that politicians have continued to, to carry on, that we are not really thinking about people like my mom. My mom, uh, many years ago, but more than 10 years ago, um, was also part of a raid. Um, immigration came to our house and they took her and they took my brother in front of me, in front of my 17 year old uh, brother. They took her hands and they put handcuffs on her and the immigration agents basically told her that she didn't have a right to be in this country after living here for over 10 years. And to me, that moment uh, was a really a moment where I knew that I had a community that could come together to fight against her deportation, which we did, and uh, thanks to thousands of people who signed petitions and who did so much to keep her here, she's still here at home with us. She didn't get deported. But what's going on right now is that we have people in the Democratic, or I'm sorry, the Republican Convention, right, holding signs, basically saying that they do believe that there should be a mass deportation um, policy in this country. And that if Trump is elected, there would be mass deportations across the US. What does that mean? That means that there would be thousands, maybe millions of people in this country who would have the exact same experience that my mother had, that I had, traumatic experiences, right? And we don't really think about that as, as progressives. Sometimes, you know, we, we push um, as Democrats, people, you know, uh, Democrats push without necessarily um, giving everybody in this country a sense of the actual human toll and the trauma that it will cause to the poor millions of people. So I just share this, and I know I don't have a ton of time, I just wanted to share this because we have an urgency, an urgency to ensure that Trump does not get elected into office because trust me, if he gets elected, the first people that are going to be deported are going to be people like my mother who are already in the system. That's why I'm here, that's why I'm fighting for you and with you. And I ask you to fight also for people like my mom, um, like the millions of dreamers who are still fearful of losing their DACA, and like many asylum seekers who are still looking for refuge in this country in a way that is humane and that allows us to live a, a dignity, a life with dignity um, and um, thank you. Thank you all for inviting me. Let's be pushing Democrats to, to really make this about community, about people, about accountable citizenship, and that um, they get the courage to push out against Trump's lies, against Trump's um, bullying against immigrants. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you. Appreciate PDA so much. Bye. Bye. Just a final word, Chewy. Uh, thank you, uh, Erica, for uh, chiming in. Uh, there are other reasons why uh, immigration and immigration reform and action by Congress and the White House will be really, really uh, essential. It will be a part of leaving the Trump era in our rearview mirror. I hope that it ushers in a new era in our country where people will be able to have civility, to have hard conversations, leave all of the terrible influences that we've seen over the past two election cycles behind us, uh, all of the disinformation the attacks from the right, and return people to discuss their realities and the role that government should have. On the immigration subject, I also look forward to addressing immigration reform so that the divisiveness of the topic, because of all of these factors that I just alluded to, can be removed from our discourse. Immigration and the messaging from the right wing seeks to divide people. In Chicago, it is seeking to pit immigrant communities against black communities. 
It is causing division within the immigrant community itself. Those who have been here 30 years, 20 years are saying, where is our permit to work? Where is our peace of mind? We're playing by the rules. We're contributing. We are abiding by the law. We pay over $330 billion in federal and local taxes each year. We contribute to programs like Social Security and other programs that we are not eligible for. Where is the fairness? There is this dynamic at play as well. Extreme right forces are seeking to capitalize on it. They see this as a way of dividing the working class in our country, creating divisions and pitting people against each other. And this is what people and legislators from Brazil, for example, at our Pan American conference were sharing uh, with us that the right wing and folks that supported Bolsonaro are doing the same thing. They had their January 6th event as well, and all the threats to democracy remain in play. If we are able to have a civil discussion, talk about the economics, talk about the future needs of the present and future needs of the economy, that will get us back to reality, I think. Americans can recognize that we need people to work in our agriculture sector. We need people to care for our elderly, and I count myself as a part of that class now. We need people to care for our children. We need immigrants like never before, and that's why immigration reform should be a no-brainer. I just want to say on behalf of Progressive Democrats of America, when we win the trifecta, we will be in touch with you right away to work on exactly these issues. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And now to Ran Rania Batris, who is one of my new heroes. And we are going to return first. We are now, and very effectively, Chuy Garcia brought in a large, essential foreign policy component to this element. And now we segue over to foreign policy and to Israel and Gaza. And with that, I introduce a great organizer and activist, Rania Batris. Hello, everybody. You're going to hear more from me in just a minute, but somebody that we're all, I know, very excited to hear from and has a very tight deadline. We're swapping things around a little bit. So I'm just going to introduce the man that needs no introduction, Congressman Ro Khanna. Well, thank, thank you, Rania. Thank you uh, for your leadership on this issue. Rania was uh, very early on contacting uh, Chue, myself, many people in the Progressive Caucus to speak out uh, for uh, justice in the Middle East and in Gaza. Uh, and Alan asked me, I had my speech earlier on the economy, but it was kind enough to say, can you share a few thoughts about the situation in Gaza? There were 37 of us, uh, Chewy and myself included, Pramila, who you heard from, who, who voted uh, against giving Netanyahu a blank check with offensive weapons. And, and that was, and I think Chewy will, agree with it, that was one of the hardest votes to cast in Congress because uh, it was a vote of conscience, it was a vote of principle, but we believe that you can't just give uh, a blank check uh, to, to Netanyahu who has uh, systematically not shown any interest in uh, an end to, to the war and release of the hostages and has frankly defied both uh, the president and uh, Blinken at, uh, at, at, at every step towards that. But in my couple minutes, I just want to talk about the, the way forward beyond uh, the end of this conflict. The, the original sin, in my view, was if you go back to 1917 in the Balfour Declaration, and the British, who of course, uh, given my grandfather, I'm not the Dylan Carter around then, was uh, pushing for uh, decolonization in India and spent four years in jail against the British. The British had basically colonized post-World War I uh, the, the, the Middle East. I mean, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and then uh, the British basically engaged in uh, a, a colonial project in 
uh, in Palestine. I mean, that's just factual history. They had colonization in Ireland, colonization in India, and they had the, uh, the, the colony of, of Palestine. The Balfour Declaration's fundamental flaw was while they recognized Jewish self-determination, they said that the people in Palestine had civil rights and religious rights, but no political rights. No political rights in 1917. And that set the uh, stage for the total de-enfranchisement of the Palestinian people. And until we recognize that there has to be, just like there is the right for Jewish self-determination and the right for Israel, there has to be Palestine, Palestinian self-determination for the right to Palestine, we're never going to have peace in the Middle East. And that's why I believe that we need to, as the United States, recognize the state of Palestine, like 143 other countries have, and have a, the, the Harris administration, or Vice President Harris, take a position that the United States should be the 144th country to recognize Palestine. Now, just so you know the laws in Congress that have to be changed, we passed a law in 1990 that if the United States recognize, if the United Nations recognizes Palestine, the United States cannot fund the United Nations. That is the law in the books currently. So at the very least, we should be calling for the repeal of that atrocious law that says that the United Nations can't recognize the state of Palestine. But when you look at the history and then you look at 1936 to 1939, and the reason I'm going over some of this is because I think until you understand, uh, as, as, until we educate the American public of the history, we're not going to get past uh, the problem. 36 to 39, when the Palestinian movement tried to have self-determination for the Palestinian people, like you had in Egypt, like you had in Jordan, all, by the way, were British colonies. I mean, you had Britain uh, colonized basically Egypt, Jordan, all of the Middle East. Uh, the British violently suppressed that. It was one of the most violent movements against the Palestinian people in the 1930s. And so, we, we, frankly, Britain should be one of the first countries, given the guilt they should have of their role in the Middle East, to be recognizing uh, a Palestinian state. But I think it is going to be American leadership. And what I am pushing for uh, with the administration and with progressives is for the administration, the future next administration, to be very clear to stop any of the offensive weapons to Netanyahu until we have a ceasefire and release of the hostages, to have a recognition of a Palestinian state, and for then the United States to work towards, as an honest broker, to have two states and a just foreign policy. But I admire all of you for what you're doing, at Rania and others, for helping move us in the right direction. The hopeful sign is that you know, there were, there were 37 of us in Congress. That movement is growing. The younger generation gets it. And we will work towards getting peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to make up some time here because y'all may have noticed we're running a little behind. So my name is Rania Batrice. I'm first generation Palestinian. I had a whole different plan for today. Um, but I think what I actually want to talk about is collective liberation. And the reason it's really weighing heavy on my heart, we we're actually back in the green room talking a bit about this. The, I'm not sorry, but I'm just going to say it. The cornerstone of white supremacy is division. The intent behind a colonial mentality is division. I am a Palestinian American that has worked for over 24 years now at the intersection really of politics and policy and advocacy and coalition building. It, as y'all might imagine, it's not, uh, it's a kind of can be a lonely place to be a Palestinian woman working in American politics. They don't like me very much. Generally speaking, I've got way more friends now. Like, you know, Roe was being very kind about it. We had some really heated conversations. And this is one of the things I love the most about this man is he will listen and process it and really move forward with humanity and empathy that sometimes we don't always see from the White House or members of Congress or others. But regardless, 
I talk about the, 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 that cornerstone of, of white supremacy being division because the reality is if we all came together truly, there is nothing, literally nothing that we could not do. There's more of us, y'all. There are more of us. So part of that division, part of that otherizing us, and, and, and creating an, an atmosphere where we sometimes otherize each other, I'm not here for it, but it happens, we've seen it, is to ensure that we are fighting amongst ourselves so that we feel like we're on an island, so that we feel like it's radical to believe that healthcare should be a human right in this country. It's radical to believe that we should be spending money addressing climate change, not bombing children. It's not radical. It is not radical for us in this audience and out in the world watching and even beyond to believe in the humanity of every single person. And that is from the hostages being held in Gaza to the Palestinian hostages being held by the Israeli government. I often talk about the, uh, I call it trauma Olympics, which maybe is a little bit too cute of a term, but it's this idea that like my pain is worse than your pain and I'm suffering more than your suffering. That too, y'all, that also is part of the division. We're made to believe in this scarcity mentality, that there's only so much, and my God, if you get liberated, then I won't be. So then we're fighting. We're fighting, and y'all, I'm part of the Reparations Coalition. You'll learn very quickly, I have my hands in way too many things, proudly, but also exhaustingly. And, and it's another one of those things. Our government has said we can't afford reparations. What? We can, we found $20 billion to just send more bombs and shit. Pardon my French, sorry. Thank you. Appreciate that this is not, you know, too proper of an audience. Shame on all of you. I'm just kidding. I kid, I kid. But that's the reality. We get told we can't afford, we can't do, we can't do justice and equity in this country. We can't afford it. We can't do collective liberation because we can't afford it. But my God, we can find so many billions of dollars for weapons. That military industrial complex is doing just fine. So I am, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but I just wanna ask that all of us, probably not in this room, but I bet y'all know people who say things like, what's happening there doesn't affect me. Why are you talking about it? I got into a huge fight with a climate justice advocate who was like, why are they, the climate justice advocates and, and organizers, talking about Palestine? Because it's a climate issue. It's a disability rights issue. It is a girls and women issue. It is an issue of humanity and justice and sovereignty that also touches so many other communities. So that's all, I just wanna leave y'all with that. As you're going out, when people say those kinds of things, will you please help them connect the dots? And I'm gonna be real honest, I'm gonna tell them myself, I have a hard time sometimes just being like, you're an idiot. Not helpful, not helpful. I, again, I'm guilty sometimes. But the reality is sometimes, if we could take a beat and meet people where they are and connect those dots for them, all of a sudden, it might make a little more sense. I'm not, there's certain people that we're, we can't, we just can't, I get that. But there are some people where we can. So that's all I'm gonna leave you with before I kick it over to our dear sister Rashida. Can we all commit to within our own families, friend groups, communities, colleagues, etc. can we commit to trying to help to connect those dots between domestic and foreign policy? Awesome, one more time, can we? Yes, I love it. Okay. <laughs> I love this group. Love this room. I am going to kick it over to our dear sister, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Hey, everyone. It's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I am so sorry I can't physically be there. Mom duties uh, 
have called me uh, elsewhere. So I just want to express my deep appreciation to all of you as you continue. Uh, PDA continues within the Democratic Party, moving us uh, towards Medicare for all, towards the right to breathe clean air, towards the right to access clean water, towards the right to make sure that our families are not struggling in the richest country in the world. All of you are speaking truth to power within the institution that sometimes wasn't really ready for voices like ours to moving us again in the direction I think the majority of Americans, I really Really know the majority of Americans believe we shouldn't be struggling as much as we are today. Um, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for continuing to speak truth to power. Thank you um, for always understanding that we need to be able to be rooted in community, rooted in the struggle and the pain of many Americans across the country right now, hearing their stories over and over again. Um, if anything should move us with urgency, should make sure that again we prioritize. And of course, as you know, as the only Palestinian American serving in Congress, uh, it has been hard to humanize Palestinian people. The cause, uh, the dehumanization is real. Uh, and I continue to say Palestinians deserve to live like anyone else. Um, but as you all continue to speak that truth to power, continue to do it even if your voices shake. I promise at the end, uh, you will be able to move, even if it's inches today, uh, maybe it'll be feet tomorrow. All I know is that we can't con stop um, pushing from within. Uh, it is a must. It's the only way we can see transformative change in our country. So again, thank you so much. It is always an honor to share space with all of you, even if it's virtual. Thank you all so much. Love you. There he is. Hello, Dr. Zogby. So you saw the message from Rashida and would love for you to just share your thoughts with us about, about what she had to say. Well, let me, let me thank you, first of all, to um, you, Rania, but also to Alan and PDA. Um, I, was, I grew up in the same school that Alan did, and we, uh, we've, we've gone in somewhat different but very similar directions. Yeah, he's focused on one thing, I focused on another, but we grew out of the progressive school of politics that actually got launched in many ways by Jesse Jackson. But that's where I am right now, and I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person because I got double booked. I'm doing a rainbow uh, event here, and then at six o'clock, I'm doing a, an event with Reverend Jackson commemorating the 40th anniversary of his uh, presidential run. I was a deputy campaign manager, and I uh, gave a nominating speech for him. And then in 88, <clears throat> I, uh, and the first ever platform debate uh, from the floor of the convention, from the podium of the convention, on, on Palestinian statehood. And I want to make, I, 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 my office found the, the clip, uh, the speech that I gave in, in 88 from the podium, and, uh, and I thought, where did we go? Why were we able to get pro-Palestinian resolutions passed in, in 10 states, have a floor demonstration of 1,500 delegates, have enough votes to have a minority plank on Palestinian rights, um, and then it all fell apart. And in part, it, it, it did so because it was candidate-led. It was Jesse. Um, if Jackson had a run, we weren't going to be doing it. Uh, Bernie ran in, in 2016, had a strong position on Palestine, but did not want to make a minority plank out of it, and so it didn't happen. The difference today um, is that there is a movement that is empowered in a very significant way <clears throat> that got 707,000 thousand votes in the name of uncommitted, didn't need a candidate, um, and elected delegates. And it is at the convention making uh, an impact. I know because I've been in negotiations uh, with them, not negotiating with them, but negotiating as a part of them with the, the, the campaign and party leadership on giving a voice Palestinian rights didn't need a candidate to do it. We had the people do it. And why is that the case? And it has to do with what Rashida was talking about, what you run here have been talking about, and that is there's an interconnection of issues, intersectionality um, of issues that has come to the forefront in a way we've never seen before. When I was doing Palestinian rights, I started the Palestinian human rights campaign back in the in the 70s. We'd have 50 people in front of the White House going, Carter, Carter, you should know we support the BLO. It was all immigrants. It was a large, a small group of us. That is not the case anymore. 
But think about since 2016 with the Women's March, with the March for Our Lives, with the, the, the effort to stop um, the, the, you know, the, the Muslim ban, with the effort to um, Black Lives Matter. And it's actually the same people who've come to the forefront because they see the connection of all these issues. Um, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not a candidate who does it. It's coming from the bottom up. It's young kids in their teens who are saying, I get Palestine, I get the climate, I get women's rights, I get. and they get it all, and they put it all together, and they'll turn out for each and every one of these mobilizations, and 700 plus thousand voted uncommitted, and 300 plus cities voted for ceasefire, and states have passed resolutions. Same thing we did, <clears throat> And we had a candidate leading the fight. This is a people power movement from the bottom up. And so I think we're in a good place. I think it's growing. What's the difference? The difference actually is young people. And as I look at the polling that we do, you know, it, it's, it's significant, the non-white versus white voter. The biggest differences are young voters versus older voters. And why is that the case? My brother wrote a book back in 2008 called uh, The Way Will Be. And it was based on polling that he had done over the the past, it was 2008, he's done over the past six, seven years, and he found that young people, uh, who he called the first globals, <clears throat> had more passports per capita than any other age cohort. They had been to more countries than any other age cohort. They actually knew the world. They could identify countries in the world where they were on the map more than any other age cohort. And why is that the case? It's because consciousness has expanded among young people largely due to the internet and social media. People see the world, they cry about Darfur, they weep over the Uyghurs, they think about what's happening to the Rohingya, and they feel strongly about Palestine. They know the world in a way that older generations didn't. And they see the climate crisis for real. My grandson, we go to the beach and he says, you know, this isn't gonna be here in a few years. They feel it deeply in a way that older folks don't. And so I have a lot of confidence. Look, I've been doing this for 50 years now. Um, and one would think, oh, you got, you got to give up, man. You got nowhere. But I don't because I see the seeds that have been planted are now being harvested in a way that I never expected by a generation of young people who not only get it, but are acting on it. And so I thank you. Thank you to Alan. Thank you to Rania. Thank you to Ro um, and, and all of you for the the continued role you play in creating the, the possibility for young people to come to the forefront and take the lead from us and do the job that needs to be done. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I'm gonna make this final thought quick because making up time, right? Jim said something that really brought something to, to the forefront and I actually talk about it quite a bit. I mentioned how our progressive, we want to label things, progressive perspectives are deemed radical. The thing that Jim said that I wanted to just center for all of us is, I tell, I tell this joke, it's not funny, I think I'm funny, I'm really not, but I tell this joke that rarely does a politician ever wake up in the morning thinking they're going to do the right thing. We have to push them. And as Jim was talking about the different movement spaces, um, one in particular I want to name. The gun violence prevention space is also somewhere I do a lot of work. And the vast majority of the country, anywhere between 90 and 97 percent of this country, believe that we should have universal background checks. I'm not here to talk about that, obviously, but I'm naming it in this moment right now, one to remind us, again, our positions are not radical, and to put a finer point on it, the majority of this country agrees with us. The majority of the world agrees with us. And quite frankly, at this point, ceasefire is a baseline. We need it, absolutely, we needed it 10 months ago. But the extension of that is, is what happens next. Like, we can't go back to normal. 
we can't go back to normal. And I am just, all I'm asking for personally, and I respect the hell out of every single movement in this space and all they're doing, for me, what I'm asking for is for this country to follow our own damn laws. For this country to follow international humanitarian law. That's it. That's all I'm asking for. I don't think that's radical. I don't think it's too much. So I'll just leave y'all with that. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'll see you at the Jackson. Look, there's a Jesse Jackson event this evening. I hope to see you there. I'll be there. I'm going to fly there. Medea Benjamin. Medea Benjamin, everybody. <laughs> um, we have Phyllis Bennis on the line, and we have Jack Werner with us from the Quincy Institute. That Actually, we may actually have a little bit of time. We're going to get out of here at 5.30. And when we, that clock hits 5.30, we're all going to exit real fast. And hopefully, you're all going to go down to the Jesse Jackson celebration down at Rainbow Push. Medea Benjamin. Um, Oh, Rainbow Push, it's Rainbow Push, in every, please, like, in Rainbow Push headquarters, it's uh, in Hyde Park. Medea Benjamin, please, please come up, because, um, you know, I, I have committed PDA to something for a while now, but firmly, that we will have a conference of groups like Code Pink, Roots Action, PDA, and then everybody who's a progressive on the left. One of the, Bernie Sanders is, has been our light, our beacon, PDA was so instrumental in drafting him to run for president. Bernie had an incredible campaign, incredible history as a politician focusing on foreign policy, was not a major focus of the two campaigns. And what that's left us with is we have domestic politics with still clarity in the wake of those two campaigns, not so much clarity on foreign policy. A left foreign policy vision, what's your thoughts on that, Medea Benjamin? I think the left foreign policy vision is actually very clear. We don't want to be in so many goddamn wars. We want to live in peace. Uh, <laughs> and if you start from that, and I'm not here to critique the Republicans because their foreign policy is horrific. I'm here to cri critique the Democrats because that's where we want to push. And let's start pushing in the area where there is not one Democrat in Congress that I think is taking the right position, and that is on Ukraine, even Bernie Sanders. That is the area where we are closest to getting into a nuclear war. Some people are cheering that now the Ukrainians have uh, made an incursion inside of Russia. You know what that did? That meant that negotiations that were supposed to be starting in this month to at least start saying that both sides would not attack the energy infrastructure of the other side so that the Ukrainians would not be living in the freezing cold this winter and that the Russian gas prices would not continue to go up and affect the entire world, the Russians said, no, that's off the table. There is over $150 billion that we, the taxpayers, have spent so far in the last two years on this war, and there is not one Democrat who voted there is not one Democrat who voted to say, we shouldn't keep fueling the war, we should instead be pushing for negotiations because that's the way this war is gonna end. If it doesn't end in a nuclear war, that's the way it's gonna end. And we need to, as progressives, say our job is to end wars, not fuel them. Then the issue of China, because I see the Republicans very much on the war path with China, but so are so many of the Democrats calling China our enemy, saying from the time of Obama that we had to pivot to Asia, saying that the U.S. is being challenged around the world by the Chinese power. Well, guess what? The world has changed. The U.S. can't try to be the hegemonic power around the world. It is a multipolar world, and that is good for the world. Those of us, I'm sure, in this room and listening care very much about an existential threat to the entire planet, and that is the climate. You know what we need to do if we're going to deal with the climate? We need to talk to China. We need to cooperate with China. So we need to say loud and clear what people in Congress, for some reason, are afraid to say, China is not our enemy. Let's cooperate with China. 
Somebody here keeps saying that I'm being funded by Putin and then by China. It sounds like Nancy Pelosi who said we should go back to our headquarters in China because we say we don't want to go to war with China. Um, the other thing we talked about immigration here today, uh, one thing I think that didn't come up is this issue of sanctions. Now, when you talk about sanctions on China, that's hurting U.S. businesses. But when you're talking about sanctions on poor, smaller countries, it is hurting the people. And we have to understand that our sanctions that we're putting on countries like on Cuba, on Venezuela, are killing people every single day. That is not an alternative to war. That is another kind of war. It is economic warfare. And it pains me so much to see the US policy, what it's done to the Cuban economy. On my way here, I saw a woman sitting out in the street holding a sign saying, I'm from Venezuela. Please help me. My family is going hungry. You know why? Because of the sanctions that the US has put on that government and the sanctions that the US has put on countries around the world. We have to stop using the power of sanctions to hurt the lives of poor people, ordinary people all around the world. And then I want to come to the Middle East. There is something that Biden could have done the day one when he came into office to try to calm the conflict in the Middle East, and that is to follow the path of Obama in his most significant foreign policy accomplishment that was overturned by Trump, and that was to go back into the Iran nuclear deal. Biden refused to do it. That has increased the tensions that has made the region almost on the point of exploding right now. We have to say the same thing. Iran is not our enemy. We need to go back into a nuclear deal with Iran. We need to talk to Iran. And then let's talk about the major thing that we have to deal with, which is the US policy towards Israel. I don't care if you're gonna vote for Kamala Harris, if you're, if you're wondering if whether you're gonna vote for her, depending on what she does. The only way that we are going to push her on the policy on Israel is if we demand that she take a position to stop sending weapons to Israel. So this is the sign that I'm going to be carrying around with me every single day for the next couple of days. If you can't see it, it says, Kamala, no more weapons to Israel. And that has to be our mantra in these days. Kamala, no more weapons to Israel. It's the only moral policy to have. It's the only winning policy to have. And why, when the uh, DNC was just about to take place, did the Biden administration think it was the right time to say, oh, by the way, we're going to authorize another $20 billion in weapons to Israel? That is despicable. That is unacceptable. That is something that we cannot agree to. And so we have to be very clear that when it comes to this election season, when it comes to doing the right thing, when it comes to changing the US policy towards Israel, we have to say, we want you as Democrats to say yes to a permanent, immediate ceasefire, but it also has to be part of a larger picture of saying we're not going to keep sending weapons to this genocidal regime. We say no to that. Not another penny, not another dime. No more money for Israel's crimes. And they have to hear us loud and clear on that. And so in closing, I want to say that just like Jim Zogby said, when he sees a change in the way young people are thinking, in the way the narrative is going right now, I see a change as well. I've been walking the halls of Congress for the last 10 months, every single day going into that Congress. And I have seen, not enough, but I have seen 
that many of the Democrats now are embarrassed if they don't call for a ceasefire. And they're starting to feel embarrassed about taking APAC money. And that's where we have to go of saying APAC money is dirty money. If you're taking that money, you are not an honest politician. So let's move in that direction. And while we're at it, let's have a campaign to say APAC must register as a foreign agent because that is exactly what it is. And in late closing, I say the hope in this country is on the streets. The hope in this country is going to be on the streets in these days. The hope on the country is in the campuses and what we're going to see when the students get back. The hope is now with the dissenters, with the protesters, the, the people who say no to supporting Israel's genocide. The hope is to those of us in this country and around the world who are very clear. We want to live in peace. No more war. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a follow-up? Or I know you got to go. Um, um, how much is your thinking? Um, oh, well, you got to go, right, Medea? Okay, good. Okay, Medea Benjamin. There we go. Look, everybody, we lost Phyllis Bennis. Um, I'll be trying to bring her back on. I knew she had another event she had to go to. We were running late. Um, and so we'll try to bring that on. So we probably might be playing Brant's video in a few minutes because we'll have time to do that. Uh, we'll, we'll try to carry over the videos we don't play. So let's now turn to China policy. First of all, I'd love to know more about the Quincy Institute because I haven't had that much contact with them. I don't know if you've been around the conference, but you probably can tell I'm, I'm quite engaged in a whole different set of levels of, of policy. One can't be involved in everything. And I've been fascinated by the Quincy Institute. So first, let everybody know about the Quincy Institute, what it does, what its uh, organizing principles are, and then about the study that you put forward for a progressive policy on China. And I'm sorry we've gotten our foreign policy, and po policy fragmented. And a third, a set, maybe a second question. China third, Quincy Institute, what would the Quincy Institute think about, again, trying to convene an effort to try to talk through what a left progressive politics is? And by the way, I think I think there's going to be, have to be compromise, at least for unity to be formed there. Of course, dissent will always be welcome. So those questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, great to be here. This is the, the, these are the diehards here, the, the true believers. All right, OK, OK. Um, yeah, my name is Jake Werner. Um, I am uh, acting director of East Asia at the Quincy Institute. Quincy Institute is a DC-based think tank uh, that uh, believes in restrained foreign policy. So we are not, uh, we, we are ideologically diverse. There are, there are people across the political spectrum working at the Quincy Institute, but I will reveal here that I am a diehard progressive. I have been for 30 some years. And I also uh, have been living in Chicago for almost 30 years. Uh, most of the time I've been in Chicago, I've, I've been doing anti-war activism, uh, anti-globalization activism, uh, and, as well as grassroots community organizing, working on local elections. Um, so the, the interest that I bring to the question of, what, of our relationship with China is not, is not just uh, sort of abstract international relations questions. It's also how does China fit into uh, progressive thinking. How does how can we have a progressive, a specifically progressive strategy on China? Because if we don't get China right, then the entire progressive program is in danger. Uh, this is not something that I think that most progressives have uh, had their eyes on lately. But the U.S. and China are the two most powerful countries in the world. We're in the midst of a, a once every 40 or 50 year transformation of the global order, uh, and the how that comes out will fundamentally be about what the U.S.-China relationship looks like. If the U.S. and China are working together in ways that are compatible with a progressive agenda, that will create enormous space for us to succeed, not just in international affairs, but in our, in our domestic work as well. If the U.S.-China relationship is fundamentally about international conflict and hostility, then the kind of world that we're heading towards, uh, it's not just going to be Gaza that looks like this. We will be going back to the kind of world that we saw during the Cold War, where there were massive proxy conflicts that involved the massacre of millions upon millions of people. Um, and not just that, 
not just the, the fallout internationally, there is a real possibility that the US and China could go to war themselves, uh, which we need to sit with, what that would look like, how that would transform international society and what that would do to American society. Even if we manage to avoid that, we can expect that if US foreign policy is defined by its conflict with the other major power in the world, that's going to reshape politics in the United States as well in ways that systematically marginalize progressive concerns and progressive politics. And we saw this in the Cold War. Uh, because of the Cold War, the civil rights movement was put off by some 20 years. We could have had a reckoning in the late 40s with the racism in American society, and instead, instead we had to wait 20 years because anyone who talked about injustice in America was tarred as a, a communist agent, someone who was helping the enemy, because you're calling attention to the flaws within American society, so you're working for the other side. We're already headed in this direction on China policy. I know that this has not been uh, on the radar for many progressives because there have been more urgent issues. But as someone who is immersed in these debates in DC and sees the kinds of uh, neo-McCarthyite rhetoric that surrounds them, anyone who's calling for a constructive or peaceful relationship with China uh, immediately is tarred as someone who is working for the Chinese Communist Party. Now this has uh, been strongest amongst the Republican Party, but we see hints of this on the Democratic side as well. Uh, progressives are the people, the, the, the sort of core progressive group in Congress are the people who are most receptive to a different vision for what US-China relationship could look like. Uh, but much of the Democratic Party has just gone along with uh, kind of knee-jerk, uh, we have to confront China, we have to make sure that the United States stays number one, there's no way to work with China, there's nothing, we share no interest with China, anything that China wants must be against democracy and freedom because that's what America is for, and if America is not number one, then democracy and freedom will die. That has been the tenor of the conversation around China in DC uh, for the last five years, and that has been true under both Trump and Biden. So if we do not have a fundamental re redirection of the nature of the US-China relationship uh, under the next president, whether that's uh, uh, should, it be, uh, should it be President Trump, there needs to be reckoning within the Democratic Party about China policy. Should it be President Harris, there needs to be really powerful efforts to shape a different course than that taken by the Biden administration, which has been fundamentally uh, uh, confrontational, has not been able to project the possibility of the US and China living together in the world, but sees only zero-sum possibilities. And this, I think, is sort of the core of the problem that we're facing with China is that uh, whether, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, we're not seeing anything but zero-sum conflict with China. We're not seeing the ways in which the US and China could work together to change the zero-sum pressures that are facing us. And those, those pressures are real. It's true that growth in the global economy is lower now, and it seems like only one country or the other can succeed. It's true that with the growth of the climate crisis and with the growth of Chinese power, uh, challenging the, the, uh, the, the sort of unipolar domination that the United States has enjoyed over the world over the last 40 years, uh, that everything seems like it's one or the other. One or the other is going to succeed. But the, the answer to this is not to pick one or the other side. Because honestly, neither side is progressive. The Chinese government is not a progressive government. The United States government is not a progressive government either. Both are established ruling classes that have interests in maintaining existing injustices in their countries. So we as progressives need to recognize solidarity with the Chinese people. The progressive, principle, the progressive principle is to recognize the humanity in other people, not set them up as uh, the, the people of some kind of like symbol of, of a sinister foreign enemy, but also not to, to, to apologize for uh, the uh, foreign governments that are animated by many of the same principles as the US government. Uh, China, like the United States, suffers from devastating inequality the, the Chinese government is engaged in misogynistic and uh, uh, repressive ethnic policies. Uh, the, the, the labor landscape in China is, is atrocious. Uh, that, yet there are progressive possibilities in China, just like there are progressive possibilities in the United States. We, we suffer the same injustices as people in China. We recognize the progressive possibilities in our country if progressive po politics can win. We need to also recognize those possibilities in China. And we need to create a relationship between the US and China that opens up space for aggressive politics rather than closing it down. So the, the core principles, the core principles here are the core principles of progressive uh, 
uh, progressive politics, progressive values, is solidarity across boundaries, across all boundaries, across boundaries of gender, ethnicity, nation, and race. We stand for a shared humanity. We will rise together or we'll fall together. That's the kind of relationship that we need to, to create with China that focuses on those shared challenges, such as the climate crisis, such as the devastating inequality uh, in the global system and the devastating inequality in our own societies and inequalities of race, class, and religion alike. Um, so the, the, I, I have been doing quite a bit of writing on this. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. I, I am just out with a, with a new uh, piece called a, a Program for Progressive China Policy. If you wanna dig into the details, uh, I, I recommend that. Uh, but I think the, the, the basic solution for me here is we take progressive principles and we apply them at a global level in a way that we have we've been missing the ambition to apply them at, at a global level. Yes, we stand up against injustices, particularly the injustices that our own government commits. That is right and proper. But I think we need to step beyond that. We need to aspire to something further than that. We need to increase our ambitions and say, what would a global system look like that was animated by progressive policy? What would a global economy look like? What kind of global economy are we demanding? We don't want a nationalist global economy that says American workers can only succeed if workers in other countries fail. The kind of global economy that we need, and we need to be thinking about this at a structural level and a policy level, the kind of global economy we need is the one where all workers will rise together, where the dramatic imbalance between the power of labor and capital is corrected in all countries. And we gain global prosperity because of that. If people have higher wages, they will buy more stuff. They will live better lives. They will, they will also be less prone to the kind of nationalist, racist, and communal passions that, that demagogue politicians mobilize because they say, if you want to succeed, then you have to join me against your enemies, these people of this, of this religion, this race, this nation. It's those zero-sum pressures that make people fall prey to the, to the reactionary politics of people like Trump and people like the other nationalist demagogues that we see all over the world rising up. So we need to bring progressive values to solve that, that basic structural problem of zero-sum inequalities that have been crippling the entire world uh, over, these, over the last 40 years uh, and have been intensifying dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, and I think that actually if we get the U.S.-China relationship right, it can be a pivot around which we push this reform agenda to change the, the possibilities for everyday people in the United States, in China, and around the world, and we do it in ways that open space for a progressive agenda uh, at the same time. Thank you. Beautiful presentation and very, very, we could do an hour easily in a broad conference. Everybody don't go yet. I'm gonna try to do two things quickly. I wanna ask a follow-up question. Now, and I do appreciate then, we'll be drawing, where we'd be drawing off individual people from Quincy Institute, probably not institutional support for the project I described earlier. Right. Um, so um, any politicians in the United States elected at the federal level or people who are in and around the State Department who are at all drawn to what you just outlined? And quickly, too. Yes, um, there, there is hope. Um, the, the, the debate in Washington has been, uh, has been very one-sided, but, the, but the, it, it's precisely the congressional offices that you would expect that we have been talking to who understand the, how dangerous it is to get into a relationship of permanent hostility with China and what the other possibilities would be, that we, we actually could, the U.S. and China could work together to reform the global system in ways that, that were broadly progressive and that open up further space for progressive policy. Um, one of the persons, big surprise, who gets this most immediately was Bernie Sanders. Um, and then, of course, the, the core people that you will recognize as members of the squad in, uh, in the House have, have also been the people that we have talked to uh, most productively. Okay. So I'm going to say goodbye for the night. Hold on a second, too. I want to follow up. Uh, we're going to go to Mark Harrison's video from um, on uh, the necessity of including a focus on Africa and the Caribbean in our foreign policy, something left progressives fail to do. We will see you back here tomorrow. Let everybody know we are closing down at 5.30. We'll go out with Mark Harrison. However, this is an important presentation as well. Thank you so much. As we as progressives talk about a, uh, the need for a progressive foreign policy, uh, I reflect when I, I reflect over my years of doing more work on foreign policy advocacy, justice policy for more than 20 plus years. 
And these are some of the things that I think we need to look at. One is what are our values? And these are some of the things I've learned over the years. Our top values are love, solidarity, justice, and peace. Also, there's a new uh, thought called abolition. What is it that we're trying to abolish? And what is it that we're trying to replace? We're trying to build a what, what I would call a multipolar world. All right, and not just dominate by one big superpower that has all the money and all the military. We also have to challenge uh, imperialism, the multinational corporations and the big financial institutions. And as we do this work, we need to address the concerns of, of class, race, sexism, homophobia, sex, uh, Islamic phobia and anti-Semitism, as well as militarism. And I want to say something about uh, race. Anti-blackness is global. It is not just here in the United States. Uh, and I think as we move forward on this, uh, work on this area, we need the importance of Africa needs to be getting given more attention as well as the Caribbean. I we think that uh, there are two, which I identify as two existential threats to humankind. That is climate change and nuclear weapons. I know someone has already talked about nuclear weapons. Then my experience has been that religion can divide us, but religion can also uh, unify us. Uh, it's also okay to, to disagree. All of us don't have to be on the same page. We're human beings. That's okay. That's fine. And I end with the uh, idea of a progressive foreign policy network, which uh, PDA can play a key role in. It would function as bringing together various groups, individuals, and we could have like calls ever so often discussing certain issues, discussing certain campaigns and certain ways to move us forward on action and activity. So that's what I think a progressive foreign uh, network should look like and what we as progressives should be doing. Thank you.